I love antique stores. In fact, I probably shop at antique and thrift stores more often than I shop anywhere else. To me, new things just never held the same charm as something old, once loved, and nearly forgotten. Something you get to rescue from a rubble pile and treasure anew. The feeling of new plastic and polished metal conjures images of near clinical assembly lines and robotic production, but relics of the past hold a warmth and an almost tangible sense of memory that, at least for my dollar, can't be replicated by the mass-produced trinkets of today. My house, as you might imagine, is full of thrift store finds and antiques, and I've never had a problem with any of my purchases. Except for one. About three years ago, I was in an antique store in a rural town on the east coast of the United States. It was gorgeous inside, and the shelves boasted treasures like antique mirrors, combs, ornamental plants, figurines, and even some cobwebs here and there. I found it all very quaint. I happened upon a glass container that looked like an old wine bottle, but without the cork. It was so beautiful and charming, I just had to have it. So, I took it up to the register. I had it in my mind to use it as a vase. The shop owner had an ancient appearance, but kind, bright eyes that didn't match her age. She looked at the bottle in my hand after greeting me and winced. Are you sure you want that one? I nodded. Yes, ma'am. Unless you didn't mean to put it up for sale, I wouldn't want to take it from you. The woman shook her head. No, that's not why I asked. I paused, waiting for her to continue. She glanced from side to side like she didn't want anyone to hear her. This will be the sixth time I've sold this bottle. It keeps finding its way back to me. Most of the time with stories of strange occurrences that began happening as soon as the customer took it home. I smiled. Well, maybe six times a charm, right? It's a multiple of three anyway. The old woman laughed. Well, all right then, if you insist. But do me a favor. If it causes you any trouble, please don't bring it back. I nodded. Sure thing. I checked out, took the bottle home, and set it on the mantle. I made a mental note to get some flowers for it the next day at the farmer's market. For the first few weeks, nothing out of the ordinary happened. I was beginning to think that the woman's clientele was made up of overly imaginative folks looking to spin tall tales about haunted objects in lieu of productivity. Until one night at about 3 a.m. I awoke with a start but I couldn't immediately figure out what had woken me. I laid still, willing my night vision to kick in, listening intently. Then I heard it, a knocking from downstairs. I tried to stay as quiet as possible. Then I realized the knocking was coming from the banister, as though somebody was knocking on it with metal. And just as I realized that, the footsteps started. Thud, thud, thud. I listened in horror, trying to slow my breathing so that I could hear, straining my eyes to see into the hallway, but nothing was there. The footsteps came down the hallway, and then my bedroom door opened slowly with a creaking sound. I thought I was going to have a heart attack or pass out from sheer terror. I still couldn't see anyone but I had a touch lamp. So I figured as soon as this intruder was near my bed, I'd flip it on and blind him, grab my pepper spray from the nightstand and blast him. The footsteps stopped at the end of my bed and it was silent for a moment. Then I heard a loud tapping noise on the footboard. It reverberated through the bed, like someone tapping a cane or a ring. I counted down from three in my head then flipped on the light and grabbed my pepper spray. But nobody was there. I thought maybe it had been a dream, even though I knew I'd been awake the entire time. My heart was pounding out of my chest, and I just stared at the place where a person should have been, 
trying to make sense of it. And then, without warning, a man's voice screamed in my ear. The bottle is mine. I screamed and tried to run, but right as I got to the stairs, I was pushed. I didn't trip. I didn't stumble. I was shoved. I felt the two hands on my back and something hard and round digging into my rib. It felt like someone had used closed fists to shove me. I tumbled down the stairs and landed on the tile floor at the bottom. I have no idea how I wasn't seriously injured. I was pretty bruised up, but I was still walking and I hadn't broken anything. I decided that it was time to end this haunted bottle nonsense once and for all. I took the flowers out of the bottle, emptied the water into the sink, and then watched as the water turned a blood red color. I screamed, walked outside, smashed the bottle into pieces on the ground, swept up the pieces and put them in the trash can. The trash guys were coming the next day, so that would be the end of the bottle. Nobody else could be haunted by whatever entity was attached to it. At least that was the theory. Unfortunately, my theory was wrong. I came back into my house and shut the door, feeling like I'd done something productive to end this. I had just about gotten to the base of the stairs when the same fists that had shoved me down the stairs pushed me backwards from my chest. I fell to the ground and screamed, scrambling to get up. You destroyed it. I will destroy you. The voice was angry and filled the whole house. I ran for the front door and something grabbed my hair and pulled me down. I tried to get up, but I was dragged across my kitchen floor and thrown into the wall. I was being viciously physically attacked by something I couldn't see. And for a brief moment, the thought crossed my mind that I might not get out of this alive. I got up once more and ran for the front door. Again, I was shoved down. This obviously wasn't going to work. It crossed my mind that I had security cameras inside near the front door and in the kitchen and the living room, since they're all at the front of the house. None of the security alerts had been tripped. I should have known it wasn't a physical person from the outset. Stupid me. But I thought, if I can keep this fight in view of the cameras, maybe I'll have proof of what's going on if I live. I ran back into the living room and was shoved down again thrown against the wall and punched on the side of my face. And that's when I decided to pull out the mental prayer book, the one that had been drilled into me as a child. I started saying the Our Father. And almost immediately, I heard a scream. The entire atmosphere changed. I laid upon the floor, bruised and aching, for probably a good five minutes before I had the guts to get up. The security footage records in the garage, so I figured I would go check it out immediately. It took me a while to get there, given my state, but I made it. To my horror, but also relief, every single bit of footage was captured. I was being thrown around the room, and indeed my home, by unseen hands. I took the footage, copied it, grabbed some jeans and a shirt out of the dryer, and took off to the only place I could think of, the local church. It was just down the street, so I didn't bother driving. I walked in, limping from my injuries. A priest met me and asked me if I needed medical help. I said, probably, but that first I needed him to watch something. I showed him the footage, and his eyes widened. I'm actually not much of a religious person, but I do know that if you can terrify a priest with your paranormal footage, you're in pretty bad shape. He called in another priest and asked him to drive me to the hospital. He told me that he would go straight over and perform a blessing, so I left him my key. While I was sitting in the hospital, all I could think about was how insane this night had become. What in the hell was going on? The nurse looked at me with a critical eye. You really need to leave him, you know, if he treats you like this. I looked at her, confused. Leave who? I live alone. She laughed. Oh, sure, I've heard that one before. 
Now I was getting irritated. Listen, I don't know what you think you know about me, but I live alone and I've been single for over a year, so there's nobody in my life to leave. I'm pretty sure your job is to fix me, not judge me, right? She raised an eyebrow. Fine, but most single women don't end up with initials punched into their ribs. My blood ran cold. What? I said. She took a picture with my phone and then showed me. J.G. was literally bruised into my back. The ring, the tapping on the banister and the footboard, the sharp object I felt when the entity pushed me. Whoever it was must have been wearing a ring and he had the initials J.G. I don't know a J.G., okay? I said irritably. Can I go? She nodded yes. I walked outside and the priest who had taken me there stood up. I just got a call from Father Jacobson, he said. We're meeting him at your house. My eyes widened. It's okay, he said. It's safe now. Long story short, the priest informed me that while he had anticipated a demonic entity, what he encountered was really just a pissed off old man. The bottle had been a wedding gift when he and his wife had been married, and he had promised to keep it safe and in the family. But when he died, his son had sold it. Ever since then, this man, Jeremiah Granger, had been causing holy hell for everyone who had purchased or owned the bottle. When I smashed it, apparently it not only angered him to no end, but literally destroyed his home. He was almost like a genie in a bottle. The priest explained to the man that he wasn't alive anymore and convinced him that material objects were nothing to linger here for. Jeremiah crossed over, I healed up, and nothing strange has happened to me since. I still live in the same house, and for the most part, I feel comfortable. But every once in a while, I wake up to a tapping noise, and sometimes I wonder if Jeremiah is truly gone. If he's not, he hasn't caused me any more harm, so he can stay as long as that remains the case. My husband Josh and I had just gotten married, and we decided to take our honeymoon in a rural area of the East Coast. It was going to be the perfect getaway for us. Though we were ecstatic to be married, some of the circumstances surrounding the wedding had been stressful. Between family drama, financial concerns, and the unexpected birth of my niece, who came several weeks prematurely, it had been chaotic to say the least. We had talked about the standard honeymoon locations like Hawaii, but we both decided that we would prefer something a little less commercial and a lot more secluded. So when we found an ad for a honeymoon suite cabin overlooking the sea in a town with fewer than 600 people and nothing more than a gas station, a tavern, and a post office, we were sold. We found the cabin and unpacked. Everything was rustic, but beautiful exactly what we had hoped it would be. The French doors in the living room opened to a balcony that offered guests a breathtaking view of the ocean. Josh came up and put his arms around me, and I closed my eyes, enjoying the moment. Yeah, I think this will be just fine, I said. He laughed. We were starving, so we decided to head to the tavern since it was virtually the only restaurant in town. We'd had a driver drop us off from the airport, so we didn't have our own vehicle, and we certainly weren't about to walk the four miles to the nearest restaurant, at least the nearest restaurant restaurant, so the tavern it was. I was putting on my coat and heading out the door when Josh called to me from the den. Hey, honey, come look at this. I went into where he was, and I saw a skull and crossbones with two sword-like objects behind it, sitting on the mantle, like an X. What a strange decoration to put in a honeymoon suite, I said. Josh replied by covering one eye and saying, Arr, you're right about that. 
I gave him a playful slap on the arm and rolled my eyes. We took off for the tavern and thought nothing more of the bizarre mantle ornament. We were halfway through some of the best burgers and fries I'd ever tasted when a sullen old man with sunken eyes plopped down on the stool next to where we were sitting. It was a little weird, given that the tavern was nearly completely empty and he had his pick of places to sit. Josh and I exchanged a look. Can I help you? Josh asked the man. No, but I'm about to help you, the man said. Ain't nobody around this place gonna tell you the truth about that cabin you're in. The bartender walked up and trolled his eyes. Doug, get the hell out of here. These folks are on their honeymoon. They don't need your nonsense. Doug shouted back that he wasn't crazy. They argued for a bit, and finally, Doug stormed off. On his way out, he told the bartender that he'd pay if he didn't tell us the truth. The door slammed shut, and the tavern went eerily quiet. Sorry about that, said the bartender. No, that's okay, I said. What, uh, what is he talking about, though? The bartender rolled his eyes. Don't worry about him. He's just drunk and crazy. Josh and I both laughed, but I think we both wanted to know. Well, drunk and crazy stories can make for a good honeymoon story, I said. I wouldn't mind hearing it. The bartender sighed, but reluctantly summarized what Crazy Doug was going to tell us. Story round here goes that the cabin y'all are in was a pirate's cabin a long, long time ago. The pirate went by the name The Whale. Why the name? I asked. Well, legend has it that he used to kill whales with his bare hands, rip out their teeth, and use them to make swords, cutlasses, things like that. And he had a real love for that cabin. Uh, apparently some folks hunted him down and found out where he was living. They burned the cabin to the ground with him inside of it. And they say he cursed the place. I laughed. Well, <laughs> that explains the decor. The bartender furrowed his brow. The skull and crossbones with the swords on the mantle. He got a really funny look on his face and then gave us a forced laugh. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Sick sense of humor, huh? Something didn't sit right with me about his response, but I figured he was just exhausted and overthinking things. We finished our food and drink, thanked the bartender, and walked back to the cabin. We were about halfway there when a somewhat familiar voice shouted to us from the side of the trail up to the cabin. He didn't tell you the half of it. Crazy Doug 2.0. I laughed and said, Oh yeah? What did he leave out? Doug took a swig from his beer bottle. He didn't tell you what the curse was. Fair point. Go on, I said. Come on, honey, let's just go, said Josh. No, no, I gotta hear this, I said. Please, tell me. Doug took another drink and paused before continuing on. A whale screamed out as he was burning to death that he would cause misery for anyone stupid enough to rebuild, and anyone stupid enough to inhabit his cabin if it was rebuilt. He said that anyone who stayed there would meet the same fate as he. I nodded. Well, thanks for the warning, but unless you're planning to light us on fire, I think we'll be okay. We started off when Doug called out again. The skull's on your mantle, in it. My blood ran cold. I turned and looked at him. What did you say? I said the skull is on your mantle, in it. I didn't know what to say. That's how he warns you, Doug said. So if you've seen him, you're already dead. I'd get out of this cursed town if I were you. At this point, Josh and I were pretty sure Doug was behind all of these things some drunk guy trying to make his name by stirring up a local legend. We called the sheriff who said that he would take Doug in for the night, just to make sure we were safe. That ended up being a mistake. A couple of hours after we got back, we were sitting out on the balcony, having a glass of wine and looking out over the ocean. 
So, do you think we're going to be lit on fire by a pirate ghost tonight? I said, laughing. Pfft, said Josh. The bed might be on fire, but it won't be because of a pirate, he said, raising his eyebrows up and down. I slapped his arm and rolled my eyes. You're disgusting. He held up his hands. Ah, guilty as charged. Later that night, we had just fallen asleep. It was late, probably about two o'clock in the morning. We had some hiking and other activities planned for the next day, but we decided that we could sleep in, so we stayed up later than we intended to. I mean, it was a vacation after all, and a honeymoon at that. I had only been asleep for about a half hour when I descended into a horrifying nightmare. An old pirate was chasing me down the coast, shouting that I was trespassing. He pinned me to the ground and started choking me. It felt so real. I woke up choking all right, but it had nothing to do with the dream. Our bedroom was full of smoke. I had to scream to wake Josh up, and once he figured out what was going on, we grabbed everything we could from the bedroom. Lucky for us, all of our belongings were in there with us, and we had barely unpacked. We tried to run through the main room to get to the front door and outside, but as soon as we touched the bedroom door, we knew it wasn't safe. It was way too hot. The room continued to fill up with smoke, and we frantically looked around for something to break the bedroom window with. There, I shouted. There was a hefty oak hall tree in the corner. We lifted it and ran for the window, like knights trying to storm a castle. It took more effort than we thought it would, but eventually we got it broken. We had to break away part of the wooden framing around the window, too, in order to get out. And by the time we had accomplished all of that, the room wasn't just full of smoke. Flames had started up the walls and had all but burned down the door. We threw our suitcases out. Josh cleared the glass and jumped through, and then he helped me out. We ran into the street until we thought we were a safe distance away. I couldn't believe the sight. The entire cabin was absolutely engulfed in flames. We were running to the tavern when the sheriff's car pulled up. He'd seen the flames and came to help. He drove us back, and the fire crew showed up just a few moments after that, and they put the blaze out. I was a mess, Josh was just in shock, and the sheriff told us he'd call an inn about a half hour away, and the owner had agreed to take us in free of charge. We got in the car, and as the sheriff started to pull away, I looked back. Standing in the smoke of the now subdued fire was the man from my dream, the pirate who had chased me down the coast, the whale. He was real. Just then, Josh said, what happened to your neck? I didn't know what he was talking about. I pulled out my hand mirror from my luggage and looked. I had handprints around my neck. I burst into tears. I didn't have words to tell him what had happened at the time, but I knew in my heart that Captain Whale was real, that he had chased me from my dreams into reality, and that he had tried to kill us both, and that Crazy Doug wasn't so crazy after all. The rest of our honeymoon was actually quite nice, all things considered. We're still happily married seven years later, and we have a daughter, Jane. Every time I look at her, I think about the fact that had I not woken up when I did, and had we not been able to get out of that room, she wouldn't be here. I know sometimes the local legends of small towns can sound crazy, but standard advice for travelers is to listen to the warnings of the locals. And if you ask me whether they're telling you to avoid a certain street or to not stay in a haunted cabin, I suggest you listen. For most of my life, I lived in a small town in Canada. It was pretty rural, but it was also beautiful since it was surrounded by forested areas. We always had wildlife strolling across our property, and I loved it. When I was 14, 
a new girl moved to town. She was extremely thin, her eyes always looked sunken, and she had the appearance of someone who had a chronic illness. She was miserable at sports, and she couldn't even run or she would pass out. It comes as no surprise that she was an instant target for bullies. They relentlessly attacked her, verbally and sometimes even physically. But I befriended her. Her name was Marla, and we got along really well. While her outward appearance was gaunt and intimidating in its vacancy, her personality was fun and lighthearted. Once you got to know her, she was pretty cool. She'd been at my high school for about a year when things started to take a turn for the worst. The kids who had bullied her for so long leveled up the violence, landing them a suspension for a month. Unfortunately, that didn't stop them. Marla and I were in the woods near her house one day, and when we got back, there was red paint across her door that said, you'll burn for this. I was horrified, but she merely shrugged. They do it all the time, she said. Can't you tell the police or something? I asked. I could, but I have a better idea. Come with me into the woods tomorrow at 8 p.m. I need to show you something. I protested that I couldn't get out of the house that late, but she really got desperate about the whole thing, so I told her I would sneak out, and I did. I met her at the outskirts of the woods near our houses. She led me down our usual path, but instead of stopping in the clearing where we usually chatted and hung out, she kept going. Where are we going? I asked. She shushed me. Be quiet, it's not far. We walked a little farther, and in a small clearing, there was a pile of stones in a circle. Here, she said. We sat down inside the circle, and she pulled some items out of her bag. Some stones, a few satchels, and some other items I really don't know how to describe. It was weird, but everything was kind of interesting to me, until she took out a knife. I got up to run, and she pulled me back down, telling me emphatically that I couldn't leave the circle until it was done. She promised not to hurt me, so I sat back down. She made a fire with some matches she had brought along with her and built it inside another stone circle that was in the middle of the circle we were sitting in, kind of like a wagon wheel hub. Then she took out scissors. She cut a small lock of her hair and threw it into the fire, along with some of the items she had brought with her, including the satchels. Before I knew what was happening, she grabbed the end of my hair and snipped off a chunk, throwing it in too. What the hell are you doing? I screamed. I'm protecting you, she said, almost in a whisper. She said some incantations and threw oil, incense, and dirt into the fire too. And then she picked up the knife. She cut her hand and dripped some of the blood under the fire. Before I could ask her what she was doing that for, she grabbed my hand, slid it, and was squeezing the wound over the open flame. She let go when a drop of my blood hit the rock she'd built the fire on. What are you doing? I screamed again. She looked me dead in the eyes and quit the muttering she'd been doing since we got there. Things are going to start happening around here. Bad things to all the people who hurt me. But this, she said, gesturing to the circle and the fire, this protects you because you were never mean to me. You never called me weak or made fun of me. A strange smile crept over her face. Soon they will all know that I am not weak at all. We walked home after this in relative silence. I snuck back into my house after she went into hers, and I was just trying to take it all in and forget it all at the same time. Somehow, I fell asleep that night and I had filed the whole thing away in my mind as strange but benign by the following morning. Sure, my hand hurt, but it wasn't too deep of a cut, and who knows, maybe she really had protected me. In any case, she thought she had, so I decided not to tell anybody about it. 
I had almost forgotten the creepy stuff she said about bad things starting to happen until I got to my homeroom class. Billy Grady wasn't there, and when the teacher walked in with a somber face and told us that he'd been killed in a car accident the night before, my blood ran cold. Billy Grady was the person who had bullied Marla more than anyone else, and if she'd given the universe some kind of hit list, or even if she'd left it up to the universe's discretion, I guess, Billy would have been the first one to go. Coincidence, I thought, had to be. Until Max Thompson showed up missing, and his body was later found in the woods. Things like this kept happening. One after another, the people who had been so cruel to Marla started dying off. If they didn't die, then they suddenly moved, or their parents were transferred for their jobs and they were suddenly in a new school district. Until one day, there wasn't anybody left. All the kids who had bullied Marla so heavily were gone. On the other hand, whatever Marla did with my blood and hair had way more than a protective effect. I got straight A's, I made the track team, I won awards and accolades. It was like I couldn't fail if I had tried to. Things I'd been good at were now so effortless it was like breathing, and things I'd struggled with I was suddenly good at. Marla and I stayed friends throughout the rest of high school, until I moved away for college. Things are still going really well for me, and sometimes I wonder how much of it has to do with Marla. I still don't know what to make of Marla's ritual in the woods that night, but what I do know is that strength takes on many forms, and underestimating a person's strength can put you at the wrong end of it. I spent my childhood next to a forest. For the most part, it was pure bliss. I have fond memories of running barefoot into the woods, finding a clearing, and reading for hours. We lived in a fairly rural area, so, as you can imagine, I didn't have a great deal of friends who lived nearby. But every once in a while, my friend Amy would come over and spend a weekend with us. Somewhere around my seventh grade year, Amy's parents had to leave the country for a month or so because of a family emergency. Her grandfather, who lived in England, had become ill, so my parents agreed to let her live with us for that month. It was amazing. I felt like I had a sister, and for an only child, that was pretty much heaven. But that month would change both of our lives forever. Amy loved the forest just about as much as I did, so we spent that month during the summer running into the woods, exploring, and generally having a good time. I knew how far I was allowed to go, and I didn't venture any farther than that. Neither did Amy. Our obedience, however, didn't protect us from the horrors of the woods. One day, we happened upon something strange, a portion of the ground that was swollen, in a way. It was almost as though a small light bulb was growing out of the ground. At least, that was the general shape of it. Amy and I made a mental note to keep checking on the thing, because it hadn't been there just the day before, so it was something new and exciting. Amy was a bit of a biology nerd, and her theory was that it was some really cool plant. A few days later, we went back to the spot to check on it. It had tripled in size. We got down close to it and listened. There was a strange churning noise coming from within it, kind of like how noodles sound when they're boiling. What do you think it is? She asked me. I shrugged. I don't know, but let's go. Amy agreed and we continued playing. We almost forgot about the swollen lump of earth for about a week until we were in the forest and heard the same churning sound, but louder, much louder. Is that that weird lump in the ground making that sound? I asked. Amy shook her head. I don't know, 
But if it is, that thing must be huge for us to be able to hear it without being close up. We stopped for a moment, just listening. All the birds and forest sounds had gone silent. I should have known then that something bad was about to happen. But as children are prone to do, instead of heeding my instincts, I looked at Amy and said, should we check it out? She nodded and gave me a mischievous smile. For sure. We took off toward the spot, but we didn't have to get nearly as close as we had before. The little swollen lump of earth in the clearing now took up most of the clearing itself. It towered above us like a building. What the? Amy trailed off. What is that thing? I said. I stood, transfixed, staring at this giant earthy orb in the clearing, wondering what it was and why it existed. Amy screamed and I about jumped out of my skin. What? I shouted. Spiders, she said. I had been so transfixed by this giant growth that I hadn't bothered to look at my surroundings. When I did, I was horrified. There were giant spiders everywhere, and one had gotten on Amy. She batted it to the ground and stepped on it. Fortunately for her, she was wearing shoes. And when she did, the now pulsating growth in the ground shrieked. I mean, it screamed like thousands of humans and demons together. And that's when we saw it. The entire forest was covered with spiders all the way around and up to this growth, and they covered it too. And then, just as we were about to go, the giant pulsating orb split open with a slimy ripping sound mingled with a sort of cracking. And just when my primal urge to run had nearly overridden my curiosity, I saw it. A giant spider leg as tall as a tree reaching out of the orb Millions upon millions of spiders poured out of the tear in the mound. Another leg, and then another leg, and then a giant furry face with eight eyes crowning it. Eyes the size of semi-truck tires. Run! I shouted. Amy and I ran like we had never run in our lives, batting away spiders as we did. They were in our hair, on our clothes, dropping on us from trees, running up our legs as we ran over them. Hairy, crawling beasts chased us through those woods, so many in number that it sounded like a herd of cattle was chasing us. As soon as we got out of the woods and up to the house, I grabbed the hose and sprayed Amy down. She took off her clothes so she just had her swimsuit on, and I did the same so she could spray me off. When we were done, about 30 spiders laid at our feet all of them bigger than I had ever seen, even in the forest. And behind us, collateral damage from the hose, about 10 spiders larger than dinner plates. I'm talking even the Australians would be freaked out sized spiders. Beyond that, we could see the forest floor moving. My heart was beating so fast and hard, I could feel it within me like a drum. Survival mode kicked in as blood coursed through my veins pounding through my ears. I grabbed Amy by the hand and pulled her inside the house, slamming the door behind us. We ran inside and breathlessly tried to explain what had happened to my parents. They didn't believe us. But when I took them outside to show them the dead man-eating spiders on the ground, my mom screamed and looked like she was about to pass out. My dad called the forest service and we were given strict orders not to leave the house until they came to handle what my folks thought was just an infestation. That night, they came. I'm not sure when it's ever been necessary for three Hummers and a tank to respond to a spider infestation, but that's what showed up. Up in my bedroom, Amy and I watched through the window, arms around each other, terrified of what we would see. In hindsight, they had to have known what was out there. Why else would they have come so prepared? Behind the Hummers came another pallet-type truck. 
It looked like something that you would haul a house on. Amy and I watched the convoy follow the tanks and hummers, a few other vehicles trailing behind with lights on. We waited near my bedroom window, and as what looked to be at least 40 men, all in tactical gear, disappeared into the thick darkness of the forest, everything went silent. For a few agonizing moments, we waited. And then, the sound came. It broke the night like somebody ripped the fabric of reality itself, as though all hell had just been released. The sound was like a groan and a scream, mixed together into a single utterance. But it was more than that. Like thousands of people were screaming and groaning all at the same time. Some shrieking, some lowly grumbling. The cacophony made Amy and I put our hands over our ears. That passage in the Bible about wailing and gnashing of teeth came to mind. We could still hear the yelling, though, and the gunfire. After that, the forest went silent once more. I don't think either of us breathed while we waited for the vehicles to exit the woods. And when they did, one of them was dragging that pallet truck behind it and a giant mound was draped in canvas on top of it. I'll never forget that night, huddled in my room, watching a caravan of giant military vehicles as they transported the giant canvas-covered heap through the forest and away, who knows where. The canvas cover didn't work though, not completely, because as our porch light hit the pallet, something dark was showing beneath the covering, right near the ground. A long, impossibly large leg, covered in hair, bearing a talon at the end. I don't know what they did with it, or what they did with all those spiders in the forest. I don't know if any of them will grow to be as large as that one was. But I'm not going into the woods to find out anytime soon. I was 15 years old when my parents divorced. It was a dark time for more reasons than just that, but we all got through it. My mom, two sisters, brother, and I all moved into this gorgeous Victorian home. I was ecstatic. I always loved the old and eccentric side of life, so this straight out of Amityville Goliath of a home was right up my alley. One of my sisters was just as excited as I was. My other sister, Janice, and my brother Dave, not so much. They were fond of using Adam's family references, although I never understood why that would be an insult. Either way, most of us were happy and all of us tried to make the best of it. We have a dog, Max, who was just a puppy when we moved in. He loved the place, but was always skittish of the staircase that leads to the attic. We figured that he was just nervous about the stairs, but later on, I would come to question that. Fortunately, our move was close enough to the house we used to live in that my siblings and I were still able to attend the same schools. I got to keep my same friends, and every single one of them was just dying for a chance to come see the creepy old house we bought. My mom had to work late one night, for a meeting, and I asked her if I could invite some friends over. She said yes. I didn't really want to be alone in the house, and my other siblings were at some overnight thing for school, some kind of wilderness lesson or something. Anyway, my friends Jenny, Sharon, and Carly all came over and I started giving them the grand tour of the house, you know? Showing it off. They loved it. We walked around for a while, and it took a while. The house was huge. If we hadn't got it for such a good deal, we never would have been able to afford it. But we did have the house, and my friends and I were ready to enjoy it to its fullest. That night, we did the typical stuff you would expect a few 15-year-old girls to do. 
We ate too much popcorn, watched too many movies, and talked about the drama at school. We made collages of our favorite celebrities and decided which of us was allowed to marry each celebrity. But eventually we got bored. And we were so jacked up on sugar and freedom that we weren't about to go to bed voluntarily, especially not on a Friday night. I think it was Carly who asked me if we had a basement. I told her that we did, but that it was boring. And she said, what about an attic? At that, I remembered the pull-down staircase that led to the attic, and how weird my dog had acted around it. Max, I said, come here, boy. He came, and I led the girls and him to the staircase, pulled it down, and watched as Max growled and backed up. The girls, as I had anticipated, were super interested and thought that it was a sure sign that something creepy lived up there. The decision was made. We climbed the staircase. I'd actually never been in the attic before. We'd only been in the house for a little while, and I had never had a reason to be there. I was just as interested as they were to see what was waiting beyond those stairs. At first, it was the typical stuff you would expect to find in an attic, all left behind by the previous owner, who had informed the real estate agent that we could keep whatever was there or toss it out if we wanted to. It seemed odd, but we'd figured that it was just junk that they had inherited from the owners before them and thought nothing more of it. There were a few creepy things, broken doll parts, mannequin heads, but most of it was just old clothing and discarded equipment, like vacuums and stuff like that. We were about to wrap it up and find something else to do. When Jenny goes, hey, what's this? We went over to see what she was pointing at. Bingo. It was an old Ouija board that looked about as ancient as the house did. We were pumped. We all brought the board downstairs got some candles for ambiance, and we all sat around it excited to play with our newfound toy. Stupid in hindsight, but we didn't know any better. At least, not yet. Jenny looked up the instructions, the rules. Never ask a spirit how they died. Never ask when you are going to die. Never taunt the boar. And never, under any circumstances, Leave a session without saying goodbye. There are some other rules too, but I'll spare you the list. You can look them up if you want to. Anyway, we asked stupid questions at first. Does so-and-so like me? Who will I marry? That kind of thing. It didn't move, and we were about to give it up when Jenny said she wanted to try to contact her grandma. Her grandma had just died, and I felt really bad for her. So I said, sure. We could trap. At first, nothing happened. But then, the planchette moved. It moved to hello. We freaked out, accused each other of moving it. All of us denied having done so. And eventually, we calmed down and returned to the board. We asked if anybody was there. It said yes. We asked if it was Jenny's grandma and it said no. So we asked who it was. The board spelled out Z-O-Z-O. -Z -O. We laughed at the name and each of us thought that another person was doing it. So we just went with it. At first, this entity appeared to be friendly, almost like an older sibling might be. We asked it a myriad of questions. And finally we asked, where do you live? And that's when things got really weird. The board spelled H-E-L-L. -L. That's when I freaked out. I told them whoever was doing this had to fess up right away, but nobody did. We were all just as scared and looked as freaked out about what had happened. And that's when we realized this wasn't a game. Unfortunately, that's when we also broke the cardinal rule of the board. We ran away from it without saying goodbye. I put the board back up in the attic, shut the stairwell, and the rest of us resumed our movie watching.
we didn't really think about it again. I think that we all wanted to pretend it had never happened. And by the time my mom got back, I nearly had forgotten about it. That wouldn't last for long. The next night, I was falling asleep, staring at the ceiling, thinking the wandering thoughts that come into your head right before you slip into dream world. And then, I heard it. A thump from the attic. I shared a room with one of my sisters at the time, and she angrily told me to stop making noise. I told her it wasn't me. Pretty soon, we were both sitting upright in bed, staring at the ceiling, listening to a steady thump, thump, thump. Before long, the whole family was standing in my room, staring up at the ceiling, listening to this methodical thumping. What is it? I asked. My mom shrugged and said she didn't know. She told me to stay put while she went up to investigate. We heard the stairs come down, some shuffling, and then a scream. My mom's frantic footsteps flew down the stairs and back into my room. She rushed us out to the car and called the cops. Later, she told me she had seen what she described as a tall, muscular man walking back and forth past the attic window. All she saw was the shadow. It passed and became silhouetted in the moonlight. But that was all she needed to see. We had an intruder, and we needed the police. So we were very dismayed when the police came out of the attic, irritated looks on their faces, and told us we had wasted their time and that it wasn't nice to play pranks. We were totally confused. My mom got a little indignant with them, telling them that she saw a man in the attic and she didn't appreciate their accusatory tone. What the cop said next chilled me to the bone. Is that right, ma'am? And while this intruder was up there, did he also have the time to write Z-O-Z-O -Z -O in the condensation on the window? He shook his head. Keep your games at home and don't call us for your entertainment again, he told my siblings and I. And then turning to my mom said, make sure your kids haven't played a prank on you before you call the cops, okay ma'am? Have a nice night. She called after them that she didn't understand how her children, who were all in one room, could have made the figure of a man walk across the window. But he waved her off, got in the car, and the other officers who had come with him did the same. We were on our own. My mom said that we weren't staying there that night. She told us we would go to her sister's house nearby. After running into the house for a few items and coming back out, we got in the car. As we were pulling away, I looked up at our house and gasped. My mom jerked the car and about ran off the road and yelled at me for being reckless and startling her. But then she saw it too. In the top window, the attic window, stood the figure of a man, but he had horns, like ram horns. We all screamed and drove off. Explaining this ordeal to my aunt was a little difficult, but that was my mom's job. My siblings and I, and the dog, don't worry, we brought Max too, ran off to the spare bedroom and collapsed in a gasping pile of what the hell was that on the giant bed. I opened the laptop that my aunt left in that room for us and searched up the name spelled Z-O-Z-O. -Z -O. And that's when it all came together. You can do the search if you want to find out more, but it's a real demon. He's brutal, and he's a big fan of messing with people who carelessly use the Ouija board. I had called this thing in, my friends and I. It was my fault, and I had to fess up. I sat my mom down and told her all about it. She is a devout Catholic who had no trouble believing in demons or the dangers of the Ouija board. She reprimanded me for being so careless and thanked me for my honesty, and then said something that made me panic. You did say goodbye to the board though, at least, right? No, we hadn't. Long story short, we called in a priest, found the board, said goodbye, and had the house blessed. It stayed pretty calm for a while, but after a year or so, the activity started up again. 
After a while, my mom got a transfer from her job in our town to Seattle, and we could not have been happier. I don't know what happened with that house, but I'm quite sure that the demon still calls it home from time to time. So if you happen to buy a giant old Victorian house in rural Massachusetts, beware the thumping in the attic. And whatever you do, don't use a Ouija board. Every year, my friends and I go on a backpacking trip through the Angeles National Forest in California. We usually take about two weeks and tour the area, sometimes retracing old routes and sometimes blazing new trails, just to keep it interesting. Most of the time, we're camping in tents. Sometimes we car camp. But unless an injury or some other unforeseen event occurs, we pride ourselves on never staying in a hotel or a cabin. It's mostly roughing it all the way, and we love it. A few years ago, we experienced something that none of us can explain to this day. We had set out on our trip, and we were maybe two days in. We had set up on the second night and cleared our permit with a ranger on site. The ranger left, and we went about making a campfire, having some food and chatting. Eventually, we all decided to turn in for the night. We woke up the next morning at about 5.30, as usual. It was still dark, so we didn't notice anything out of the ordinary, at first. But then the sun peeked over the hill, and we saw it for the first time. The area all around us had been completely scorched. I mean, dead. Leaves stripped off of trees, burnt sticks in the ground for a forest type of scorched. We took pictures and wondered how the hell we could have slept through such a devastating wildfire. We tried putting a call into the ranger station to report the burnout, but none of us had service, so we just took more photos and kept on. On our hike to the next campsite, we passed a gorgeous lake. My friend Jillian pointed out a little mouse, who was just sitting and staring across the lake to the other side like he was on vacation. We laughed and kept moving. But then, I stopped. The trees across the lake were weird. A couple had full foliage, and the rest were burnt. Smoke was coming through from the right. I turned to warn Jillian and the others, but then I glanced back and everything was normal. Something wrong? Asked Jillian. I shook my head, trying to figure out if I was just seeing things or if the forest was spontaneously recovered from a severe burn and put its own fire out in the process. No, I said, let's just go. About six miles before we got to our next camp, we saw a pretty beaten up hiker pack in the middle of the trail. Now, it's not uncommon to leave your pack to the side of the trail as an indication that you're a ways off doing your business. It's pretty standard protocol for through hikers and backpackers and things like that. But to just drop it in the very center of the trail is really bizarre. In fact, in all my years of hiking, I don't recall ever seeing such a thing. The backpack looked really out of date too. So at first we were concerned that an elderly person had gotten caught up along the trail and had some kind of medical emergency. We searched and called out for about 20 minutes, trying to see if anybody was there, but nobody answered and we found no signs of life. So we picked up the pack and tried to find identification. We didn't find an ID, but amidst the standard items you would expect in a hiker pack, we did find a permit, but it was dated for six months into the future. What the? I said. We didn't want to take someone's pack, so we set it up by the side of the road and put the permit back in it. I think we were all in a state of denial. We didn't want to admit that something strange was happening, so it was easier to just put it back 
and forget about it. We walked the next six miles in relative silence. It was a quiet night at camp. We all turned in pretty early, and we expected to wake up the next day refreshed. A new start, a great way to finish the first leg of our trip. We were breaking the morning of day five because our mutual friend was getting married. So we promised to fly out, go to the wedding, and then come back to finish the trip. Just one more day and a night to go. But the next morning brought us little relief. We awoke to another burnout, another one that we didn't see or hear that somehow missed us entirely. That's virtually impossible. It covered both sides of our camp and it even burned out a structure nearby. Yet our stuff was completely untouched. Again, we just took photos and tried to settle our nerves and keep moving. Nothing out of the ordinary happened that day until we were setting up camp for the final night. When we arrived at camp, we found it burned out. While a few of us took photos, the rest of us combed the grounds for any evidence that people had been there. And that's when we found a little girl's pink bow with Ariel in the center from The Little Mermaid. Someone else in our group found an adult's shirt, probably a woman's, that was bright blue and had green sequins along the neckline. Y'all want a night hike and get the hell out of here? The question came from Nerf. That's his trail name, not his real name. And we couldn't agree more. I think he was just saying what we were all thinking. None of us wanted to spend another night in that forest asleep. Night hiking was creepy. Throughout the night, we kept hearing screams and crackling noises, like the sound of fire, but it was completely dark. At one point, I was the leader of the pack, and I was walking through a dense area when a man screaming and in flames ran at me. He grabbed me, begging for help. And then, in the next instant, he was gone. The weird thing was, I never felt any fire or heat. I wasn't burned. It was so odd. I will never forget that face, though. The others asked me what happened because I was kind of freaking out and I told them. They all believed me. None of us were closed minded to the possibilities at this point. We reached our pickup destination where one of the groomsmen was going to give us a lift to the hotel where all the wedding guests were supposed to be. I had a friend bringing my nice clothes for me and the rest of us had made similar arrangements. We all sat in stunned silence on the way to the event it was hard to care very much about the activities at the wedding, and after it was over, we mutually decided that we had had enough of the forest for that season. But we did travel back to the ranger station to show them the photos and report the fire. The thing is, we were told there had been no reports of fire in the area. There wasn't even a fire warning in place. But that's not possible, I said. Look. We got our cameras to show them the damage, and every single photo showed a perfectly healthy, beautiful forest. I think the ranger could tell that we weren't messing around. We didn't tell him about the voices or the signed backpacking pass that had been signed for six months in the future. He seemed like he wanted to help us, like he knew we'd experienced something. But what was he supposed to do? We all kept in touch, but none of us ever talked about that day again, until six months later. My phone rang. It was Jillian. Melody, turn on the news, she said. She sounded terrified. What channel? I asked. Literally any of them. I did as she said, and literally screamed. A freak fire had taken out large portions of the Angeles National Forest. The same forest we had been in, at the same spots, all along our path. Among the missing was a family, with a little daughter. The news showed the last photo that the family had posted from the trail. The mom was wearing a blue shirt, with green sequins around the neck, and the daughter had a little mermaid bow in her hair. I still don't know what happened to us, whether we all had a five-day-long mutual psychic episode 
or found ourselves in some kind of glitch in the matrix, some kind of time slip. I don't know. All I know is that the wilderness is a strange and beautiful place, and if you're not careful, you can lose yourself in it. For most of my life, I would have considered myself to be a logical person, scientific even. I always leaned toward the most rational explanation and laughed at people who believed in ghosts or anything remotely paranormal. I won't say I'm a total believer now, because even to this day, I don't know what happened. So I don't know what I'd be a believer in. But I do believe that there are events that occur in this life, the likes of which we will never be able to explain. I was 24 years old when I met Isabel. She and I ran into each other at the bookstore, literally. I rounded a corner with my coffee and magazine, she rounded the same corner with her stack of books, and we ran into each other. For a split second, we were more than a little upset with each other, but as soon as she saw the Rolling Stones magazine in my hand, and I saw the history of classic rock book on top of her stack, we abandoned our irritation and dove into a conversation about our shared passion, music. Isabel should have been born in the 50s, although she's way too rebellious to have made it very far as the Leave it to Beaver housewife. Either way, she drove a classic car, wore poodle skirts, and owned at least a dozen pair of winged sunglasses. I was a little more contemporary than that, but it didn't matter. We were fast friends, and pretty soon, we were spending a ton of time together. We both lived in the Midwestern United States at the time. She was studying to be a history teacher, and I was living life for music, freedom, and earning whatever money I could doing the things that I loved. Things went well for a few years, but then Isabel started to change. At first, it was little things, a quick temper one day, dark rings under her eyes another, things that were easy enough to pass off as a bad day or a rough night's sleep. But soon it became a constant thing. She'd show up to hang out and she'd be gaunt, almost like she was really sick. She started losing weight and she wasn't heavy to begin with. The joy she'd once had for life and music just seemed to be sucked out of her by some invisible syringe and I willed the universe to give it back to her. But nothing changed. I asked her about it. So many times I asked her what was wrong. All I wanted to do was help, and all she ever did was assure me that I couldn't, that nobody could help her. A few months later, she started talking about how they were coming to get her, how she had to come up with a plan to make them think she was gone. I pressed her about what she meant, but she would just blink her eyes, like she just realized I was there, and changed the subject. On Christmas Eve, just four years after we met, Isabel asked me to meet her by the lake. I did. She hugged me, and thanked me for being her friend. She assured me that while the last few months had been hard, everything was better now, and she was okay. Told me that she appreciated how I'd stood by her through all the tough times. And she gave me a keychain. She said it was a token of her thanks and our friendship. My keychain had a matchbook on it. Not a real one, of course, but a 3D replica in a silver tone of a matchbook that was open with one match sticking up, like somebody had readied it, like they were just about to pull it out and use it. On the back, the words, light up the world, were engraved. I thought it was really sweet, and I hugged her. We went to our separate houses, and I was really grateful that everything was okay now. Isabel was going to leave the next day on a train trip to see her family, she had said. She was going to drive down, park her classic car at the train station, take the train to see her folks, and come back in a few days. For 24 hours, I couldn't get a hold of her. I called, I texted, I did everything I could think of to figure out where she was. It wasn't like her to just disappear. 
I called the train station just to make sure she'd made it. Figured maybe her phone was out of service. But they said that she had never boarded that train. I grabbed my keys, new key ring attached, and took off down the only road that led to the train station. And that's when I saw it. Her car, next to a tree that we used to have picnics by after she got out of classes. But it wasn't just parked there. It was burned. And not just burned. That car was roasted, as though somebody had put it over an open fire and given it a thorough cooking. I pulled the car over, ran over to hers, and looked in the window. Nobody. I searched the nearby woods. Nobody. As I stood in the clearing next to her car, my hand found the matchbook key ring. Was it some kind of message? Was it just a coincidence that she'd given me this matchbook key ring, and then her car was burned out on the side of the road? I didn't understand what was going on. I went to her house, but she wasn't home. We had keys to each other's places, so I went inside and searched. Nothing. I called the cops when I was absolutely positive that I wouldn't be finding Isabel on my own. They searched the scene, the area, the car, even the trunk. Nothing. No Isabel. They told me to go home, that there was nothing else I could do, and that they would let me know if they heard anything. It was well past three in the morning on Christmas Day when I finally fell asleep. But sleep didn't last for long. I woke up at 3.45 in the morning to the sound of singing in my kitchen. I live alone, so there shouldn't have been anyone there. But in my groggy state, I thought it was Isabel, since she was almost always singing. I almost forgot about the car and her disappearance and the strange keychain gift. I was halfway down the staircase when reality came flooding back, and my blood ran cold. The singing continued. I heard the sound of glass cups clanging together, like somebody was making coffee. When I got to the bottom of the staircase, I looked into the kitchen. Sure enough, there was Isabel. Her back was to me, but I knew it was her nonetheless. I ran over to her, arms opened wide, ready to give her the biggest hug ever. But I stopped dead in my tracks. There were bloody footprints all over the kitchen floor and Isabel had a glass in her hand, like she was about to pour something to drink. And she turned around and immediately I knew that something was very, very wrong. Isabel, I said. What's wrong? What happened to you? She smiled a weird, dreamy smile, like she hadn't registered the scene before her, like she wasn't aware she had bloody feet and had dragged blood all over the kitchen floor. She walked over to me, slowly. I need a favor, she said, in a weird sing-songy voice. Sh sure, I mean, wh whatever you need. She grabbed my arm, flipped it over palm up, and then pulled it toward her mouth. Before I could process what was happening, she had bitten me and was gulping. Holy crap, I thought. She's drinking my blood. Stop it! I screamed at her. She looked up, surprised, my blood running down her lips. You said you'd do me a favor. She said it so matter-of-factly, like she'd asked to borrow the phone. I yanked my arm back. What the hell are you doing? I asked. For the first time, she looked like herself, just for a moment and a look of sadness crossed her eyes. I had to, Amy. Don't you get it? They were sucking me dry. I was so tired. So tired and exhausted. They fed on me day and night. The only way I could stop it was to become them. Them? Who are they? Who are you talking about? In response, she just pointed slowly out my kitchen window, the moonlight glistening off her blood-covered hands. And for the first time, I saw them. About a half a dozen people in my front yard, staring at me with vacant expressions and hollow eyes. I screamed at her. I told her she had to get out, that she needed to turn herself in. 
I screamed at her for bringing these people here, and after I got done yelling, without getting any reaction from her at all, I asked her the question that I'd been putting off. Where did all this blood come from, Isabel? She lowered her eyes to her feet, and then back at me. Oh, that. From dinner. It's a lot less messy when people volunteer, like you did. So thank you for that. I told her I was going to call the cops, and I was reaching for the phone when she grabbed me with a strength I have never witnessed from a human being before. She pinned me to the wall and told me that if I picked up the phone, she wouldn't leave a drop of blood in my veins. The rest of the story is a little bit muddy. I don't remember a lot of the conversation that we had, but when it was all said and done, we had made a deal. I wouldn't call the cops, ever, and in return I would keep my life, but she could never contact me again. Our friendship was effectively over. She walked slowly toward the door, like somebody in a trance, and right before she left, she turned to me and said, I always knew that you weren't cut out for the darkness. You're a light, you know. Let them think that I'm dead, and I'll make sure you live. Okay, Amy? I nodded, and that was that. She drifted out the door, closing it behind her, and joined the people who were waiting for her on my lawn. She said something to them. They all looked at me and nodded, and then they all slipped silently into the night. I don't know what happened to Isabel after that, or where her cohort is, or even what she is. All I know is that the roasted, burnt-out car was the last the cops ever found of her. So far, she's kept true to her word, and so have I. She hasn't killed me, and I haven't turned her in. That was over four years ago. Christmas has been strange ever since. I haven't seen Isabel since that night, but every year on Christmas Eve, I find a matchbook in my mailbox, and I know that she's been here, reminding me of my oath to silence, breaking hers not to contact me in the process, I suppose, but reminding me that she can get to me, but also reminding me to light up the world, like the keychain said. The thing about that is, I don't know if we live in a world capable of embracing the light. If the darkness can get to Isabel, it can get to any one of us. Even you. I had just settled into my comfy sofa, the long day's tension still clinging to my muscles. My hand found the remote, eager for some mind-numbing television. I pressed the power button and the screen flickered to life. What I saw made my heart drop into my stomach. There, on the screen, was me, or someone who looked exactly like me. Same hair, same eyes, same nervous habit of tucking a strand of hair behind an ear. She was in a well-furnished kitchen, laughing with children who looked a lot like how I'd imagined my own kids to look. Confused, I jabbed the channel up button. The scene shifted. There I was again, this time in a business suit, shaking hands with another woman in what appeared to be a swanky office. Channel after channel, the story was the same. My mimics living out countless lives, each more divergent from my own. I watched myself as a firefighter, a surgeon, a painter, a prisoner, all coexisting within the confines of the glowing screen. My mind reeled. This couldn't be real. Was my TV hacked? Was it some kind of prank? A marketing stunt for a new reality show? But as I looked closer, I realized that each version of me was subtly different. Distinct expressions, unique body language, varying tones of voice. These weren't cheap manipulations or deep fakes. They were living, breathing iterations of myself, unaware that they were being broadcast to an audience of one. 
The original? The outlier? The fake? I didn't know what to call myself anymore. Frantic, I grabbed my phone, snapping pictures of each channel as if collecting evidence of a crime I couldn't yet comprehend. I sent a few to my sister Jenna, waiting anxiously for her response. Are you playing some weird game with me? She texted back. No, I replied, my fingers trembling over the screen. This is happening right now. I'm freaking out. Her reply took longer this time. All I see are regular channels, Nora. News, sitcoms, documentaries. Are you sure you're okay? I wasn't sure. Not anymore. As days passed, I couldn't bring myself to turn off the TV. I was drawn to it, compelled to witness these alternate lives unfold. They were hauntingly fascinating, but also deeply disturbing. What did they mean? Were they alternate realities, glimpses into parallel universes where other versions of myself existed? And why was I the only one seeing them? My life began to unravel. Sleep became a distant memory, meals forgotten, social commitments ignored. The TV was a puzzle I couldn't solve, its enigmatic channels a labyrinth I couldn't escape. And then one evening, something changed. I flicked through the channels again, my eyes red, my attention wandering despite myself. And I stopped. There I was, or she was, rather, sitting on a similar sofa in a similar room. Her eyes met mine, a flash of recognition, or was it confusion, passing through them. For a brief moment, our lives converged. We were the same person, separated only by the glass of the television screen and whatever inexplicable force had entangled our realities. Then she did something I didn't expect. She picked up a remote and pressed a button. My screen went black. I sat there, stunned. My fingers trembled as they aimed the remote at the dark screen. Hesitant, I pressed the power button. Regular channels greeted me. News, sitcoms, documentaries. It was over but the implications were not lost on me. That version of myself, that other Nora, had somehow ended the broadcast. She had the power to switch off her TV, and in doing so, switch off mine, to disconnect our entangled lives. I still don't know how or why it happened, and each time I turn on my television, I do so with a mixture of dread and anticipation, wondering if the fractured broadcast will return and what it would mean if it does. I've gone back to my normal life, but the questions remain. Was I a spectator, or was I part of the spectacle? Did I witness a glitch in reality, or was I the glitch? Sometimes, late at night, when the world is quiet and still, I swear I can feel the eyes of the other Noras out there, all of us connected yet isolated, each pondering the same unsettling thought. When we looked through that screen, were we staring into a distorted mirror or peering through a window to somewhere else? And if we were, what would happen if one day that window were to suddenly shatter? I can only wonder and keep wondering as I aim the remote at the TV and press the power button, my finger hesitating for just a moment longer each time. It had been a long day at work, one of those days where every tick of the clock feels like a jab to the ribs. All I wanted was to slide into the subway seat, zone out, and make it home. The doors whooshed open, and I stepped onto the train without even glancing up from my phone. But when I did look up, the world seemed to freeze around me. Every face on the train was mine. They were all sitting there, each version of me occupying the seats, gripping the poles, even leaning against the doors. Some wore the same expression of weary fatigue that I felt. Others were engrossed in books or staring at their phones, but they were all unmistakably me. My breath hitched. Was this some elaborate prank? Virtual reality? 
my mind scrambled for an explanation, but came up empty. The train jolted into motion, forcing me to grab a pole for balance. My eyes darted from one face to another, each pair of eyes, my eyes, locking onto me with varying degrees of shock or curiosity. Next stop, 23rd Street, the intercom announced, but the voice was my own. The other me's began to whisper amongst themselves, each conversation like an echo chamber of my own thoughts. Words like glitch and reality floated in the air, merging into an indecipherable murmur. One version of me, seated near the door, patted the empty seat next to her. Hesitant, I walked over and sat down. Up close, I could see the tiny details that made us identical. The same mole on the chin, the same chipped nail polish. Any idea what's going on? She asked. Her voice was as familiar as my own thoughts. I was hoping you would know, I said. A heavy silence followed, punctuated only by the screech of the subway against the rails. 23rd Street, exit for Chelsea and Madison Square, my voice announced through the intercom as the train pulled into the station. The doors opened, but no one moved. Who would? Stepping off this train felt like stepping off the edge of reality. The doors closed, and the train moved on. As the minutes ticked by, the atmosphere grew tense. Some of my clones began to pace the car. Others were in heated discussions, gesturing wildly. A few even seemed to be in tears. We were a microcosm of emotions, each one amplified by its reflection in the others. Next stop, into the line, the intercom said. That wasn't right. There should have been at least three more stops before the terminus. A collective sense of dread filled the car. The train pulled into an unlit station, the walls of which were pure black as if they were made from darkness itself. The doors opened. On the platform stood another version of me, her eyes filled with a calm, almost serene authority. She spoke without boarding the train. This is where you get off, all of you. This is the end of the line. The other me's began to exit the train. I followed suit, stepping onto the dark platform. It was cold here, as if the very air was devoid of life. Is this... What is this place? I asked the version of me on the platform. She looked at me, her eyes like bottomless wells. It's a nowhere place between the cracks of reality, she said. And now that you're here, there's something you all need to do. And what's that? I asked. Choose. Choose what? Who gets to go back? A hushed silence descended on the platform. Go back? Go back to what? To being the only one? The only me? Only one can return, she continued. The rest will stay here, in the nowhere place. Arguments erupted around me. How do you fight for your own life against yourself? How do you prove you're the real one when everyone is a perfect copy? Then it hit me. The coat I was wearing, a new purchase just this morning, a coat none of the others wore. It was a small detail, but in a situation where everything was an echo, it made me the original. I stepped forward. I'm the one who should go back. I'm wearing a coat none of you have. It proves I'm the original. The authoritative me looked at me, her eyes softening. Very well she said, and with a wave of her hand, the world around me started to dissolve in a swirl of colors. When I came to, I was back on the train, pulling into my regular stop. This time, the faces around me were their usual mix of strangers. Trembling, I exited the train and climbed up the stairs to the street level. As I reached the top, my phone buzzed. A message from an unknown number flashed on the screen. It read, Nice coat. It suits you well. I looked around, my eyes scanning the crowd. Then I saw her, a few yards away, disappearing into the throng of people. Me, wearing the exact same coat, her eyes meeting mine one last time before she was swallowed by the city.
I stared at my reflection. Sweat gathered on my brow. The reflection was grinning, fang-like teeth showing, but my own lips were pressed tight, a flat line of apprehension. It's just a mirror, just a glass and a bit of silver paint, I told myself, but I couldn't shake off the chill snaking up my spine. Glancing away, I tried to focus on the small, unimportant details around me. The chipped paint on the bathroom door, the slowly dripping faucet, anything to get that sinister smile out of my head. Yet I felt its eyes, my eyes, still locked onto me. The room seemed to close in, walls breathing like they had lungs, squeezing the air out. I forced myself to look again. The grin was wider, and my reflection's eyes squinted as if it were laughing at some secret joke. I needed to break the loop, and so I raised a trembling hand, expecting my reflection to mimic me. It didn't. That was it. I hurled my fist at the glass. The mirror shattered, pieces of my distorted image scattering onto the tile floor. For a moment, there was just silence, just my own labored breathing. Relief washed over me. Then I heard it, a whispering giggle echoing from the shards littering the ground. My eyes darted to each broken piece, and I saw that my reflection still wore the same haunting smile. Every single piece grinned back at me. I bolted out of the bathroom, tripping over the edge of a rug as I entered the hallway. My bare feet pounded on the hardwood floor as I sped toward the living room, heart racing like a drum roll. The house felt alien, each creak of wood and distant rustle of leaves outside taking on a menacing tone. I grabbed my phone from the coffee table. No way I was staying another second here. I dialed Connor's number, my closest neighbor, and a friend who lived down the road. But the voice that answered wasn't his. Having fun yet? It was my voice, tinged with that same mischievous tone. I threw the phone across the room, it smacked against the wall and dropped onto the couch. Enough was enough. I headed for the front door, grabbing my coat in a swift motion. The door creaked open, and I stepped into the night. My feet had barely touched the gravel of the driveway when I froze. Every window in my house glowed with an unnatural light, and in each one I could see my reflection, grinning, laughing, watching me. I turned my back to it all, refusing to give those warped images another second of my attention. I walked down the empty road, moonlight casting long shadows on the pavement. In the distance, I heard a wolf howl, a lonely sound swallowed by the sprawling woods flanking either side of the road. When I finally reached Connor's house, I didn't bother knocking. I let myself in, locking the door behind me. He found me there, sitting on his living room floor, shaking. I told him everything. He listened, his face a canvas of concern and disbelief. Then he went silent, his eyes widening. He pointed behind me, his finger trembling. Jake, is that your coat hanging on the door? I turned. It was. My coat, the one I had grabbed on my way out. Except, I was wearing my coat, wasn't I? A cold wave of realization swept over me. Don't turn around, Connor said, his voice barely a whisper. But I did. I did turn. And there I was, grinning from the doorway, wearing the same coat, and fading into the dark hall behind me, as if pulled by unseen strings. I was sitting on the balcony, a cup of coffee in hand, watching the sun sink behind the city skyline. The buildings cast long shadows, their outlines turning to silhouettes against the fading light. It was a moment of stillness, one I had learned to treasure in a life otherwise filled with noise and haste. 
that's when it happened. Without warning, the sky began to deform. Towers bent at impossible angles, and skyscrapers folded over like they were made of paper. The city compressed in on itself, the whole panorama turning into a surreal, collapsing accordion. My coffee cup slipped from my hand, crashing onto the floor, but I hardly noticed. I was too fixated on the impossible sight before me. It was as if reality itself was being manipulated, the natural laws governing time and space summarily dismissed. Buildings that should have been miles apart were suddenly adjacent, then overlapping, then melding into a singular twisted mass. Roads, bridges, entire neighborhoods swallowed up, leaving behind an unrecognizable jumble of architecture and negative space. My heart raced, my mind struggling to process what my eyes were seeing. I gripped the railing, knuckles white, half expecting the balcony to fold into the nightmare landscape. But then, as quickly as it had started, the city snapped back to its original form. Skyscrapers untangled themselves, roads stretched back to their proper lengths, and everything returned to its normal state, as if nothing had happened. Except it had. I had seen it. The twisted shapes, the melding of structures, the complete disregard for the laws of physics. They were imprinted on my memory, a scar on my understanding of the world. I retreated inside, locking the sliding door behind me. My eyes darted around the room, half expecting the walls to start folding. But nothing happened. Everything was as it should be, or at least appeared to be. I grabbed my phone, texting friends, posting on social media, desperate to find someone else who had seen what I had. But no one responded with anything other than confusion or concern for my well-being. Days passed. I found myself unable to step back onto the balcony, fearful of what I might witness. I buried myself in work, in social commitments, in anything that could distract me from that unexplainable moment. But the city had other plans. It started with little things, street signs displaying gibberish, buildings appearing shorter or taller than they should be, the city map occasionally glitching out on my phone. Each occurrence was brief, easy to dismiss as a fluke or a trick of the light. Yet they kept happening, each anomaly chipping away at my sense of reality, reminding me that something was fundamentally wrong. And so I find myself here, writing this down both as a record and a warning. I don't know what caused the city to fold, or why I was the only one to witness it. I don't know if it was a glitch in the fabric of reality, or something more sinister. But I do know this. The skyline is not what it seems. It's a facade, a mask hiding something we're not meant to see. And now that I've glimpsed what's behind it, I can't shake the feeling that it's only a matter of time before the mask falls away completely. What happens then, I don't know. But as I sit here, staring out at the city that was once my home, I can't escape the terrifying thought that one day the skyline will fold again, and this time, it won't unfold. So I watch and wait, my eyes never straying too far from those towering silhouettes, wondering when they'll make their next move, and what that move will mean for all of us who live in the shadow of their hidden instability. Until then, the skyline remains, a distorted reflection of a reality I no longer trust, but have no choice but to inhabit. In the labyrinth of cubicles, the clatter of keyboards and the murmur of voices had always been comforting white noise. But when I stepped into the office that Monday morning, the sounds twisted into something unintelligible, alien. People were talking, laughing, engaging in what seemed like ordinary conversations. But the words were wrong. The language wasn't one I recognized, each syllable an alien vibration that set my nerves on edge. I tried to brush it off, to chalk it up to some elaborate prank or perhaps a transient glitch in my auditory perception. But the feeling of dislocation grew with each interaction. 
Morning, Marco, my coworker Carol greeted, but her words emerged as an indecipherable string of sounds. Her face was friendly, her tone congenial, but her language was foreign, a melodic yet incomprehensible sequence of notes. I nodded, muttered a generic greeting in response, and hurried to my desk. Maybe if I immersed myself in the routine, emails, spreadsheets, reports, the strangeness would dissipate, replaced by the comfortable monotony of office life. But the anomalies persisted. Emails read like cryptic puzzles, their characters a jumble of unfamiliar symbols. Even software interfaces had morphed, their commands inscrutable. My little island of a cubicle felt like an outpost in an alien landscape. Desperation set in. I picked up my phone and dialed my wife, seeking the anchor of a familiar voice. But when she answered, her words were as foreign as everyone else's, a garbled melody devoid of meaning. Panic surged, a tidal wave that threatened to pull me under. I bolted from my chair and made my way to the office exit, but outside the city had transformed into an even more disorienting tableau. Billboards, street signs, even the text scrolling across the side of passing news vans, everything was in that incomprehensible language. It was as if the very fabric of my reality had been reprogrammed, leaving me an outsider in my own world. Days turned into weeks. Linguists were baffled. Neurologists found no abnormalities. Even as I yearned for answers, I grew to dread them. What if this was irreversible? What if I was stuck in this incomprehensible reality, cut off from everyone I loved, from everything I understood? I started to carry a notebook jotting down snippets of conversations, fragments of written text. I pored over them every night, a lone cryptographer trying to decode a cosmic enigma. Each word was a clue, each sentence a piece of an intricate puzzle that, when solved, might grant me passage back to my old life. And as I sifted through the fragments, a pattern emerged, echoes of my own language hidden within the chaos. Like a distorted reflection, the alien tongue seemed to mimic the structures, the rhythms, the underlying logic of my own, as if it were an imperfect translation of my world into another, a reality almost identical, but fundamentally skewed. It was an epiphany, a sliver of understanding that suggested an unsettling possibility. Had my reality been replaced? Or had it simply been altered? And if so, by what? By whom? As I delved deeper into this dissonant reality, the boundaries began to blur. I found myself understanding snippets of conversations, grasping the meaning behind the written symbols. It was as if I were tuning in to previously inaccessible frequency, my senses adapting to this altered world. But adaptation came at a cost. With each new word I deciphered, a corresponding piece of my old language seemed to fade away as if I were trading one reality for another, unable to retain both. As the days turned into months, I was left to wonder, what happens when the last remnants of my old reality are gone, when I have fully adapted to this new world? Will I even remember what I've lost, or will I simply become a native of this foreign reality, ignorant of the man I used to be? I don't have the answers. All I have are questions and a growing sense that I'm caught in a tide of transformation that's far from over. And as the alien syllables become increasingly familiar, as the foreign text begins to read like my native tongue, I'm left to ponder the nature of my new reality and to fear what it might become. Routine is a life raft in the sea of existence, they say. For me, that life raft was flicking the living room light switch to on as I walked into my apartment each evening after work, until the day my raft capsized, leaving me floating in an ocean of uncertainty. I had just turned the key, pushed the door open, and flicked the light switch up. The ceiling light bloomed to life but something else happened. 
As if choreographed to my movement, the view through the window morphed from a golden evening sky to pitch black. Instantly, it was night. I froze, my hand still hovering near the light switch. I blinked hard, expecting daylight to reassert itself, but it remained night outside. My eyes darted around the room, looking for some sort of rational explanation. Maybe a sudden eclipse? No, that was absurd. Heart pounding, I turned the light switch off. The room plunged into darkness, and I looked out the window. Daylight burst back into view, casting its warm glow across the cityscape. This wasn't a joke. This wasn't a trick of the light or a hallucination. My hand on that switch was flipping the world between day and night, like some sort of deity with an identity crisis. I felt both a surge of exhilaration and a gut punch of dread. I ran out onto my balcony, craving the tangible evidence of my senses. I flicked the switch off, then on again, standing there as the world outside obeyed my command. Day, night, day, night. There were no half measures, no dusks or dawns, just an abrupt transition. Cars on the street below came to screeching halts, drivers undoubtedly questioning their sanity. I could hear distant shouts, sirens beginning to wail. The world was noticing, and it was freaking out. I retreated inside, suddenly aware of the gravity of what I'd done. I was a bug that had wandered into the gears of the universe and jammed them up. I needed to tell someone, but who? Who would believe that I could toggle the sun and moon with a flick of my finger? Then I thought of Chelsea, an old college friend who was now a physicist. She was the closest thing to a genius I knew, someone who might at least entertain the reality of a glitch in the fabric of existence. My fingers trembled as I dialed her number. When she picked up, I stumbled through an explanation. Ryan, that's... Wait, I can see it. The data. Something is oscillating at an unnatural frequency, like reality is skipping a beat. I thought it was an error, but if you're telling the truth... I swear, Chelsea, come over. I'll show you. She arrived within the hour, her eyes wide with a mix of skepticism and curiosity. I led her into the living room, gestured toward the window and the light switch. Watch. I flicked it off, then on. Day, night. Her eyes widened to saucers. Do it again, she whispered. Off, on, day, night. Chelsea's face went pale. You need to stop. We don't know what kind of stress this is placing on the laws of physics on reality itself. You think I want this? I have no idea how to stop it. We sat in tense silence, trying to process the implications. Chelsea finally spoke. I have to report this. I'll keep your identity confidential, but this needs to be studied. Understood. Fixed. Okay, I said, the weight of it all sinking in. Okay, let's fix it. As she left to make the necessary calls, I sat alone, contemplating the enormity of what had just occurred. How do you live knowing you've broken the basic rules of existence? How do you move forward when every flick of a light switch could shatter the world? That's when I noticed the photograph on the mantelpiece. It was a picture of me taken on a hiking trip last year. Except I was wearing a shirt I didn't own, standing next to a woman I'd never met. A picture of a moment that never happened, in a world I didn't recognize. I looked back out the window at the night sky, and for the first time, I noticed one star shining brighter than the rest, brighter than it should. And then it flickered, like a faulty bulb on the verge of burning out. Thank you. 
Real estate websites are a guilty pleasure of mine. There's something intriguing about scrolling through properties, imagining different lives in different places. But when I stumbled upon my childhood home listed for sale, nostalgia washed over me like a tidal wave. It was the same two-story suburban house on Maple Lane, its walls once a pale blue that mirrored the sky on a sunny day. The same place where my mom had planted roses in the garden and where my dad taught me how to fix a bike. I clicked the link, eager to explore the familiar spaces through virtual pictures. But what I found shattered my expectations. Every photo showed a burned out husk, a ruin charred black by fire, windows blown out, the remnants of a life reduced to ashes. It was my house, unmistakable in its structure, but annihilated in some cataclysmic event. Confusion gripped me. How could this be? My family had moved out years ago, but we had sold the house intact, in good condition. There was no fire, no disaster that I knew of. So why did it look like this? I frantically checked the date on the listing, thinking maybe something recent had occurred. But the date only deepened the mystery. It was from years ago, before we even lived there. My heart pounded in my chest as I explored other resources. Historical photos, property records, news archives. The story was always the same. No matter how far back I went, every image showed the house as a burned ruin. It was as if history had been rewritten, erasing the peaceful years my family had spent there, leaving only ashes and questions. But the anomalies didn't stop there. I found an old neighborhood forum, conversations dating back to the time we lived there. People mentioned the burned house on Maple Lane, recounted legends and rumors about it being haunted, cursed. They talked about seeing strange figures in the windows, hearing whispers at night. Some claimed it had been a site of ritualistic activities, a gateway to something darker. Except I had lived there. It was my home, my sanctuary, and none of those things had ever happened. No fire, no haunting, no dark rituals. Just an ordinary house on an ordinary street. Or so I'd thought. Something compelled me to dig deeper. I contacted the current listing agent, pretending to be an interested buyer. I asked for more details, mentioned the state of the property in the pictures. The agent was perplexed. He assured me the house was in excellent condition, that there had been no fire, no damage. I pressed him to send me current photos, my pulse racing as I waited for his reply. When the photos arrived, they showed the house as I remembered it. Intact, inviting, a place you could call home. Nothing like the burned ruin that seemed to exist everywhere else. Relief and horror fought for control as I grappled with this conflicting reality. Was the house on Maple Lane a burned ruin? A haunted place steeped in dark legends? Or was it the home where I grew up, where my parents laughed, and where I played with childhood friends? And what did it mean that two such disparate versions could coexist, each real in its own way, each backed by evidence that couldn't be ignored? I never bought the house. I couldn't. But I couldn't let it go, either. And so, every so often, I find myself going back to that listing, looking at those haunting pictures of a home that both was and wasn't mine. I listen for whispers in the stillness of the night, half expecting to hear the echoes of a past that might have been, a past that might yet be. I think about visiting, about standing in front of the house to see it with my own eyes, but I hesitate, afraid of what I might find, of which version will manifest before me. And the question haunts me, a riddle with no answer. Which house is real? And what will it become when its reality finally catches up with mine? The mystery remains, and the only thing I know for certain is that I'm caught in its web, suspended between two histories, two truths, two lives. And I'm left to wonder, 
what happens when those diverging realities finally collide. I've lived next door to Hattie Wilmore for over 10 years. Hattie is one of those women you might describe as eccentric. She tended to live on the fringes of society, but her brand of eccentricity meant that she rarely left the house and as such, never bothered anybody. So as uncomfortable as some people were with her strange ways, the neighborhood more or less left her alone. I lived on the south side of Hattie's house which is where she kept her rose garden. Hattie had a fascination with roses. Her backyard was full of them. So while other people rarely spoke to her, we spoke fairly regularly, given that our gardens faced each other and the fence separating our yards was low enough to speak over. She told me about her pets and her flowers, told me a little bit about being raised in Germany, which I found fascinating. But it wasn't until we'd been living next door to each other for nearly a decade that she finally told me about her daughter, Rose. Suddenly, the roses made sense. I thought it was sweet that her entire backyard was basically a living homage to her child. But learning that she had a child filled me with a bit of concern, as, well, I'd never seen her. I figured maybe she had an adult child who had moved out and Hattie just looked really good for her age. But me being me, I had to pry a little. Oh, how old is Rose, Miss Hattie? I asked. Oh, she said, dragging the O out the way someone does when they're thinking of an old memory. She's about six now. Two red flags immediately popped up. For one, in the last decade that I had spent living next to Hattie and seeing her in the garden, I had never seen a single indication that she was pregnant. But adoption is a thing, and maybe she's just one of those women who doesn't show. That flag I was happy to set aside for the time being. The second was that she said, about six. If you've ever asked a parent how old their child is, you can usually get an immediate answer specific down to hours and minutes if you really want to. But semantics, right? Everyone communicates differently. Who was I to judge? Hattie set her trowel down, sat back on her heels, and looked me in the eye. The doubt I felt in my heart must have made it to my face, because she smiled, took another moment, went back to her gardening, and began to elaborate. I know you must be wondering about Rose, then. I didn't respond. Rose is the love of my life, but unfortunately... Her life is more than a little sad. How's that? I asked, not daring to look up from the ground as I continued to move dirt that didn't really need it, just wanting to stay busy and hear whatever she wanted to tell me. My daughter has a rare medical condition that I still have trouble pronouncing and that you wouldn't remember the name of even if I told you. She chuckled. <laughs> Makes her almost completely incapable of being in the sun, I'm afraid. She's resigned to that room of hers basically for the rest of her life, and to make matters worse, her bones are so fragile you can nearly break them just by touching her too hard. A few moments passed as my mind worked frantically to come up with a suitable response. I, I, uh, I'm so sorry, Miss Hattie, was all I could come up with. That's all right, I suppose. I've done my best for her, you know, given her unique situation, I made a bed for her that functions like a crib. It's padded and rocks, and I suppose that's as comfortable as she's allowed to be. I do my best, though. That's all you can do, I replied. I hesitated before asking, Uh, Miss Hattie, forgive me if this is too bold, but I've had the privilege of gardening next to you for the last decade, and try as I might, I can't recall you ever being pregnant. I swear by all things holy, the air got heavier and colder. I looked up from the plant I was over pruning and froze. Hattie stared at me with a dead expression and ice cold eyes 
sitting back on her heels, her hand gripping her shears so tightly that all of her knuckles were bone white. I, I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I stammered. I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to offend you. I was just commenting on an observation, really. None of my business, though, really. I, I didn't mean to come off the wrong way. A moment that felt more like an hour passed, and as quickly as it came, the malice left her face. She broke into a smile that was too wide to be genuine, and laughed a deep, low laugh that didn't suit her typically soft voice. <laughs> no trouble at all, she said. She continued in a very measured tone. I'm sure in the last ten years, you've also noticed that I live alone other than having my daughter here. Yes, yes, I, I have, I answered. That's because there's no man in my life and hasn't been for a long time, but I wanted a daughter, so I used a surrogate. And being as I didn't want people to pry, I had the baby dropped off at night when I was sure nobody would be awake to see it. Ah, I see, I smiled desperate to come up with a change of subject. But before I could find one, Hattie continued. Do you know something, dear? She took off her gardening gloves and gathered her tools. Well, what, Miss Hattie? I asked. It's been ever so long since I've been able to leave the house and go anywhere. Why, it would be such a blessing to me if I could only find somebody to babysit for me, just for one evening while I run to town. I smiled and started packing up my own tools, trying to avoid what I knew was coming. Since you and I have gotten so close, she paused after this phrase, leaning on the word close and eyeing me like she was adjudicating my worthiness for a job, I was thinking, would you be ever so kind as to spend a few hours tomorrow evening with Rose? I swallowed hard. Jeez, Miss Hattie, I i mean, I'd love to help you, but I, I really don't think I have the skill set to care for... S it would be no trouble, she said, interrupting me. I'll feed her before I go. Just go in the room once or twice during the night and rock the crib gently, but do not touch her. I paused. That's it? I asked. Yes. Oh, and don't turn on the lights or open the blinds. She's extremely sensitive to light. I nodded. It'll just be four hours. I've got an errand to run a few towns over. I took a breath. Please, she said. You're the only one I trust. I sighed and nodded. All right, just this once, I said. Oh. Thank you so much. She picked up her bucket of weeds and her tools, and then she said something that would eventually haunt me for the rest of my life. Children are precious. Don't you agree? She asked. Oh, yes. Yes, they are, I said. Don't you think a parent should do absolutely anything, anything, to help their children thrive, no matter how unique their condition might be? I do, Miss Hattie. Good, she nodded. I'm so glad we're in agreement. I'll see you tomorrow at six, then. She smiled, turned slowly, and walked back to her house. The day arrived. I walked next door at about 5.45, using the back entrance, as Hattie had requested. And at about 6 p.m., Hattie left the house. I heard the key turn in the lock and took notice of how eerily quiet the place was. Hattie didn't look much older than 40, but the stuff in her house must have belonged to Mary Winchester herself. It was creepy and cool at the same time. Hattie didn't own a TV, so I brought my laptop over to work on, something Hattie had agreed to. A plate of half-eaten pasta was out on the table. I guessed that it was from Rose and figured I would just leave it there. After all, I wasn't being paid to clean. About a half hour after Hattie left, I heard a knocking at the front door. That was weird, because nobody ever visited Hattie. 
I ignored it at first, but then it came again, more persistently. I sighed. I went to the door and opened it. Nobody there. Just the steadily pouring rain that had begun a few minutes prior. I stood there for a minute, wondering if I had heard things. When I figured it was one of the neighborhood kids picking on the babysitter, I shut the door, locked it, and rolled my eyes. I had just settled back at the counter in front of my computer when my eye caught the plate of food. Where just moments earlier it had been half full, there was now nothing on the plate. I blinked. A chill ran down my spine. If I had been babysitting your standard six-year-old girl, I would have naturally assumed that Rose had eaten it. But she was bedridden, so what gives? I decided that I was done with the counter and I moved to the living room. It was situated at the bottom of the stairs, just to the right of the front door. I'd been working away on the computer for another half hour or so when I heard a thump at the top of the stairs. Rose? I called. No response. Rose? Are you okay? Nothing. Hattie had told me to check in on her at least twice, so I figured now was as good a time as any. I climbed the old creaking staircase to the room right at the top, Rose's room. As instructed, I knocked twice, waited, and then opened the door. Rose, are you okay? I asked. No response. I took a step inside and called again. I'm fine, thank you, came a small voice. It didn't sound like it was coming from the crib, the silhouette of which I could just barely make out from the door, but maybe I was just tired. Okay, sweetie, I said, and closed the door. When I got back downstairs, I was trying to figure out why her voice had sounded so odd. I was trying to settle the uncomfortable feeling that had washed over me. It had to just be my mind playing tricks on me, right? But why all the rules? Why did I have to knock twice and wait? Was she really sensitive to the light? Or did Hattie have her chained in there, hidden in a closet or something? I started to worry that maybe... Hattie wasn't a heartbroken mother. Maybe she was an abuser. I started to think the latter was more plausible. I mean, it had to have been Rose that snuck down and ate the pasta while I was at the door, right? And if she'd done that, then she wasn't nearly as sick as Hattie had let on. I had made up my mind. The next time I went to check on her, I wasn't going to give the warning knock. I wasn't going to go rock this crib in the dark like I had been asked to do. Screw that. I was going to flood that room with light and burst right in and save this little girl from whatever her mother was putting her through. I had been specifically asked to check in on her at 9.30 p.m., right before Hattie was to get home. So, at 9.20, I climbed the stairs as quietly as I could took a silent breath outside her door. And in one fell swoop, I flung the door open and flicked on the lights and screamed. A girl of at least 17 years old stood in the middle of the room, covered in blood. Her face was covered in blood and at her feet was the partially consumed corpse of something, some one. You broke the rules. Mommy said I could have you next, but you broke the rules. She was screaming. I screamed again, and then I ran. I flew down the stairs and heard her footsteps behind me. I grabbed my phone from the couch and flew out the front door, running down the street, calling the police. Fortunately, the girl didn't leave the house. I don't think she's allergic to the sun, but no doubt her mother had impressed upon her from as soon as this condition presented itself that she was to never leave the home. Regardless, finding the words to express to the poor 911 operator that a cannibalistic 17-year-old who I thought was a six-year-old had just tried to kill me at my babysitting gig wasn't exactly the easiest thing that I've ever done in my life. 
But I got the point across, and within two minutes, the cops were there. Long story short, the police showed up and arrested 17-year-old Rose. I sat in the living room of Hattie's house with the police, explaining the whole story. That's when Hattie ran inside screaming. You bitch, she screamed. You promised you would follow my instructions. You ruined everything. The cops drug her out the door, and as she went, she was clawing, trying to get at me. As they pulled her out the door, she just kept screaming over and over. Children are precious. Don't you get it? Children are precious. You do what you have to do. The officer I was talking to just shook her head as Hattie continued to scream wildly all the way to the patrol car. Just then, another officer came downstairs. Ma'am, did you say you were instructed to enter the room in the dark and go rock the crib? I nodded, tears still streaming down my face. She sighed. I think you deserve to see this. I exchanged a curious glance with the officer I'd been speaking to, and we climbed the stairs together. The second officer led me over to the crib, which had a doll inside. Take a step back, she said. So I did. She rocked the crib forward, and a trap door opened, and below it was nothing but bodies and a wretched smell. That explained why the room itself hadn't stung when she was eating a body when I walked in. What the hell is going on here? I asked. A third officer approached and handed a report of some kind to the officer I was talking to. She perused it for a moment and then said, holy shit, under her breath. The report said that Hattie was not Hattie. She was Deirdre Farmland and her daughter was Rosa Farmland. In Germany, they had been suspected of cannibalism. Rosa was only a small child at the time so they naturally assumed that it was Deirdre who was consuming the bodies. Apparently, Deirdre was supposed to do time, but because she was the sole caretaker of her child, they gave her a period of 30 days to find caregiving services for Rosa. Deirdre reportedly told the police that she had consumed the bodies, but that she had served them to her daughter, who suffered from vampirism a form that required her to survive on human blood and, apparently, tissue. Of course, this was noted as evidence that Deirdre needed serious mental health support, and an overseer was appointed to go out and make sure nothing crazy happened until Deirdre could find childcare for Rosa. This was about ten years ago, of course, when Rosa was just seven. And as it turns out, Deirdre and Rosa had fled in the night, even before the case manager was supposed to arrive. I can only imagine how Deirdre and Rosa made their way here, and how they stayed under the radar for so many years. Although that does explain the intense secrecy with which Deirdre lived her life. In Germany, they had lured farmhands to their deaths. In my town, apparently it was babysitters. The next week or so went by like a weird dream. It was so surreal. I had come so close to finding myself in a pit of bodies a storehouse for this crazy girl's meals. Over time, we would find out that missing people from a total of 27 counties over the last 10 years were all found in the basement of, or suspected to have been killed and consumed by, Deirdre and Rosa. I sat in my bedroom chair, feeling hollow, staring over at the rose garden that Hattie, or Deirdre, had spent so much time in. It's funny, I always used to wonder what made her roses grow so big. I always asked her what was in her soil. She used to laugh and say it was a secret recipe. Somehow, I don't think it's a secret anymore. I grew up in a farmhouse with my brother, mother, father, and grandfather. 
My grandmother had passed away before I was born, so I never knew her. But when she was alive, she had lived there too. Having three generations in one household definitely posed its challenges, but overall it was an idyllic childhood, at least within the walls of the house. Daylight brought with it the security of community, and when the sunlight hit the cornfields, it lit the world up. It seemed like nothing could go wrong. But when night fell, it was a very different story. I was about six years old the first time something strange happened. My brother, Devin, is two years older than I am. And when we compared notes later on, I learned that he had been experiencing strange things on the farm since about the age of six as well. But he had never told me about them. So when I started seeing strange things in the cornfield at night, I thought that I was alone. Now, my father was kind enough, but he had absolutely zero tolerance for nonsense. A strictly religious man, any talk of the paranormal was forbidden. Heresy, even. So, when I saw the scarecrow move for the first time, I knew better than to tell anybody about it. I remember the night so clearly. I looked out the window, not for anything in particular, just enjoying the view. I had a nice little window seat on which I liked to curl up and watch the animals and the wildlife wander around on the edge of the woods. I had trouble sleeping, so I often found myself on that window seat in the middle of the night, just taking in the view. That scarecrow had been there since I could remember. My dad had told me that it guarded the crops, kept the bad things away, fooled the birds and critters into thinking there was a monster out there or something, so they would leave our corn alone. I always thought it was metaphorical. But that night, <laughs> that night, I saw the scarecrow do something new. I saw it walk. I'm not talking about like if a breeze blew it and it tilted in the wind. That thing got down off its stake, crawling, and walked around in the cornfields. I couldn't take my eyes off of it. It made a tour of the entire field, like a soldier, weird jerky movements adding to the eeriness of it all. At about three o'clock in the morning, it climbed back up to its post, stretched out its arms, and went limp. I must have sat there for another 30 minutes before I got in bed again but you better believe I didn't sleep. I wanted to find out more about the scarecrow, but I knew asking too many questions to my father would land me in trouble. So I went to the local library and asked the librarian. She was a nice old lady who, in hindsight, I think was a little eccentric. She always had crystals on her desk and was really fond of telling me what phase the moon was in. It was kind of cool. She was weird, and I liked that. Of course, my dad couldn't stand her, but he didn't mind me going to the library. He said that education was a good thing, one of his more redeeming qualities. I walked in, and I went up to Miss Elaine. Well, hello, Miss Nadia, she said. Harvest Moon is about to come, you know? I smiled and nodded. Yes, ma'am. What can I help you with today? I paused. Please don't tell my father I asked, ma'am. She peered at me over her horn-rimmed reading glasses. Tell your father you asked me what? Best as I can recall, we never spoke today. She winked, and I giggled. Well, do you know anything about the scarecrow on our farm? I asked. Her expression changed entirely. I had never seen Miss Elaine look so pale. Come, child, she said, and led me to a corner of the library that wasn't occupied. Now you listen here, she said in a whisper, rushing through her words. I'm going to tell you this once and once only, and you can't go asking about that scarecrow again after I do, okay? I nodded feverishly. I could tell this was important. 
All right now. That scarecrow on your property is not like any other. People talk, you know, small town. Rumor has it that some eccentric people lived in that house and on that land long before your family came into possession of it. They had a big problem with their crops getting stolen in the middle of the night. Normal scarecrow wasn't working, apparently. So they figured that it wasn't any critter that had been stealing their crops. Had to have been people. She looked around to make sure that nobody was listening. Anyway, they practiced a kind of black magic. They enchanted that scarecrow. Instead of just being a stationary guard, well, now it was a real guard with sentience. With what? I asked. Intelligence, like you and me. It sees, it hears, it knows, it thinks, and by God, it remembers. My heartbeat pounded within my chest. So what does that mean for me then? Is it dangerous? Miss Elaine nodded vigorously. Oh yes, child. You're not even supposed to speak of it, but I want you to be safe, and that means more to me than anything. So I'm telling you this, okay? That scarecrow can never know that you saw it. If it ever sees you watching it when it's not up on that stake, you have to take it a sacrifice, a lock of your hair. Only then will it forget that you saw its living state, but you can never witness it again after that. Do you hear me? I nodded. All right. Now you go on home, and we'll both forget we ever talked about this, okay? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Ma'am, I said. That night, I thought about what Miss Elaine had told me. I wanted to go to the window, but I was too scared. That was until I heard something banging on the window. It was like gravel being kicked up against a windshield. I sat up in bed and looked toward the window. Tap. Tap. Against my better judgment, I went toward the window. Another tap. And this time I saw what was making it. A small rock had been thrown at the window. I was furious. I thought I'd better see who was throwing it so I could go wake up my dad and have him teach the guy a thing or two. But. When I got to the window and looked down, I knew that that was out of the question, because it wasn't a person throwing the rocks. It was the scarecrow. I looked down at it, and it looked up at me, and waved, not in a friendly way either, more in a I-know-you-saw-me kind of way. I gasped and staggered backwards. When I dared to look again, it was walking back to the field. But I knew what it was doing. It was telling me that it knew, that it saw me watching it the previous night. A lock of hair. That's what Miss Elaine had said. I couldn't bear to look out that window again that night, but I knew what I had to do. The following evening, after everybody was asleep, I snuck down the stairs and out the door. I had taken my mother's sewing scissors and cut off a very small lock of hair. I had to give it the offering or face its wrath. I made my way out to the scarecrow's stake, shaking as I did. I looked up. The scarecrow was gone. Somehow, it was more terrifying knowing that this thing was walking around in the very field in which I stood than it would have been to look upon its face. But I was here to make my offering, so I'd be okay. Right? I bent down and laid my lock of hair at the base of its stake. I turned to go back home and felt a hand grab my hair and tug it. Hard. I fell to the ground and when I looked up, I saw the pumpkin face of our scarecrow grinning down at me, its eyes and mouth glowing like a jack-o'-lantern on Halloween night. I screamed and ran back home faster than I've ever run in my life. I went into the house and up the stairs as quietly as I could and face-planted in my bed. What happened? My brother asked from across the room. Nothing, I gasped. Bad dream. 
there was a pause. All right, then, he said. I got very little sleep that night, and the next morning I was groggy when I stumbled down to breakfast. But I was alive, so I thought maybe the thing had accepted my offering. My mom and dad looked at me with a drawn expression, and I figured they'd seen me out in the field, and I knew I was fixing to get in trouble. But what they said was even worse than being in trouble. Honey, sit down, my mom said. She and my dad exchanged a look. My brother sat down next to me. My father gave us the news. Children, I'm very sorry to have to tell you this, but we got word this morning that Miss Elaine passed away last night. She... she's dead, I'm afraid. Of course, I was devastated, and also racked with guilt. I found out years later that Miss Elaine hadn't simply passed on. She'd been found eviscerated in her garden. There was never an official determination of what she died from, no cause of death other than natural causes. But I know. She sacrificed herself so that I wouldn't be harmed, and our pumpkin-headed scarecrow, possessed by a demon conjured up long ago, had taken her life in exchange for warning me. To this day, I feel guilty about it. My father died about 10 years ago, and last year my mother passed. An attorney for their state contacted me and told me that if I wanted it, the farmhouse was mine. I politely declined. Grandma's attic had secrets. They should have stayed that way. By Ravenstone Grave. Remember this? My sister Joyce held up a snow globe with a Christmas scene in sight of it. Outside it was golden hour, and the soft light caught every glittery snowflake within the globe as it drifted to the base, a dome of nostalgia. Oh man, how could I forget? I replied. Grandma put this thing out on the coffee table every single Christmas. Yeah, said Joyce. And we had to listen to the music box non-stop for the whole month of December. God rest ye merry gentlemen, right? I laughed and nodded. Yep, yeah, that's the one. Joyce continued staring at the little globe, and tears filled her eyes. God, I miss her. I smiled. Me too, sis. Me too. She replaced the snow globe on the oak cabinet and sighed. Ready to go, she said. I paused and stared up the carpeted steps that led to the attic. Our entire lives, that attic was off limits. Who was going to stop us now if we wanted to look around? No, absolutely not. Come on, Joyce. We're not kids anymore. Surely you've been curious about what's up there. I don't care, she said. It doesn't matter how curious I am. It's, it's a matter of integrity. I smirked. Right. And how do you spell integrity again? F-E-A-R, isn't it? Joyce glared at me, her red hair somehow even brighter. I'm not scared she said in such a childish way she might as well have stomped her foot. Well, good, I said. Neither am I. I took all of three steps toward the stairs before Joyce grabbed my arm. I said no. Twisting my arm and releasing her hold, blood pulsing in my ears, I shouted, You're not mom, okay? You never were. I knew I'd gone too far the second I said it. Joyce hadn't chosen to be the stand-in parent when mom died. I knew that. But I wasn't the kid's sister anymore, and being treated like a child when I was in my 30s and married had gotten old a decade ago. Tears brimmed Joyce's eyes, threatening to spill over. I softened my tone. Look, you did the best you could, but you're not my parent. 
We're both grown. You don't get to tell me what to do anymore. Joyce took a shuddering breath and paused, taking a look around the house before adding, and you don't get to disrespect grandma just because she's not here anymore. She shut that attic for a reason, Sarah. I trust that it was a good one. A heavy silence descended on the room. Finally, Joyce said, You're right. I can't stop you from doing whatever it is you're going to do. But you're not going to do it while I'm here. Find your own ride home. With that, Joyce grabbed her purse off the counter, flung it over her shoulder, and walked out the front door, slamming it behind her. Finding my own ride home was the least of my worries. If I had to, I could stay here until the morning or call an Uber. Either way, Joyce's sensitive nature was nothing new to me. While I could understand why she felt so much pressure to parent me, even though neither of us needed parenting now, her outbursts still felt unwarranted. If I was being honest, I was happier to be alone in the house than I was to have her there. Almost without meaning to, I wandered over to the line of framed photos, looking through them now without my sister there. I wanted a private moment to reflect on our lives, to look through memories of better times when we were still whole. I found a picture of my mom, my grandma, Joyce, and I all standing together in the orchard out back. It was the last time we would ever see my mom alive, although we didn't know it then. She stood in a beautiful outfit, a petal pink skirt covered in a floral pattern, and the most ethereal white blouse that I always loved. My mom's eyes, one a fairly standard hazel tone and the other a vibrant gold, brought back memories. Her eyes were so kind and so unique. We couldn't go anywhere that someone didn't comment about her eyes and how beautiful they were. My grandma had the same genetic trait, except hers were different colors. One was a vibrant blue, while the other was a color of brown that almost bordered on red. Joyce had a green eye and a blue eye. I replaced the photo, smiling at how happy everyone was. That afternoon, right after that photo, my mom would die, and nothing would ever be the same. I was told a lot of things about her death, that she had died in a car accident, that the body was so mangled they had to cremate her. My hand traveled to the urn amulet that had hung around my neck since her death. So much had changed since then, including the fact that I was older now and had Google and had not once found a single report about the car accident that apparently took my mom's life. Not in that city, not in the neighboring four towns. It was knowledge I had kept close to the vest. My sister had enough to worry about, my dad had left our family a long time ago, and my grandma was dealing with being a parent all over again when she should have been sipping tea on the front porch with nothing to do. I wasn't about to ask questions best reserved for an investigator but there was no investigator. Everything had just moved on, except for us. Time moved on, life moved on, family moved on, but Joyce and I never really did. I ran my hand along the oak cabinet and turned to explore the rest of the house. I caught my reflection in a standing mirror, my extremely boring same colored eyes telling me that I didn't belong, like they always had, it was nothing my family had ever done. They treated me like their own as much as they knew how, but being adopted, I think you always have a sense that you half belong, that you somehow started out your life unwanted. It's not true, of course. My therapist has told me that a number of times, but when something so physical and so obvious as not having the same hereditary condition as your family, literally stares you in the face every time you see a mirror, it's hard to ignore. Enough of this, I thought. I was here to do one thing, get answers. There had been enough secrets, enough unanswered questions. I was going into that attic. I just had to find the courage to do it and get over the guilt that told me I was betraying my entire family by doing so. A couple of hours passed before I made the final decision about the attic. I spent most of that time walking around, looking at photos and items that seemed to be from someone else's memory at times. 
It's strange how time and distance steal so much from you. Ultimately, I decided to go up there, open the door, and just take a look around. I mean, how much harm could it do, right? And anyway, the estate sale was in a couple of weeks. I probably wouldn't have the chance to go up there after this. It was my last opportunity to see what grandma had hidden in that attic for all those years. To finally understand why, after Joyce and I had gone to live with our grandparents, the nightly routine had been for grandma to read us a story, tuck us into bed, and make us repeat the same little poem. Here I sleep and here I'll stay till morning chases night away. And should I need to leave this room, I know the attic spells my doom. At the time, I thought it was weird but funny. Something grandma had made up to be overly dramatic, but to also remind us to stay out of the attic. When I eventually learned about the whole now I lay me down to sleep poem at school, our version felt particularly strange. I never told anybody about it. But now, as I faced the attic of doom head on, the poem carried more meaning and inspired more fear than it ever had as a child. I placed one foot on the stairs, my heart pounding. The stairs groaned under my weight every time I took a step and the sound pierced the silence. Every step felt like betrayal. Yet at the same time, years of forbidden secrets were now just within reach and I wasn't about to let the opportunity pass me by. The landing split off into two directions. To the right, I could venture down to the master bedroom, a study that had been turned into a playroom for the kids in the family, and the bookshelf in the hallway. But that's not where I was going today. I was headed left. The only thing at the end of the hallway to the left was the attic entrance. A gray door marked the entryway. And as I stood on the landing, staring down at the door, I felt genuine nausea for the first time. I don't know what I thought I was going to find, but in that moment, the realization that I was about to venture into a forbidden place completely alone as night descended outside sent me into a minor panic attack. I should just go, I said out loud. But I had come this far, it's not like grandma kept a tiger up there, right? All I had to do was open the door, go up to the attic, take a look around, and leave. In five minutes, I'd be back on the ground floor, my curiosity sated, and I'd call an Uber home. Easy. I took a final deep breath and headed toward the door. When I reached it, I turned the cold silver knob and opened it. The attic must have had a window because ambient light from the setting sun filtered down the stairs, dust particles dancing like stars against the otherwise darkened staircase. Two sensations reached my awareness at the same time. One, the cold, damp air from the attic sent goosebumps across my skin. And two, the scent of something metallic lingered in my nose, making it wrinkle involuntarily. I thought the attic would be hot. I mean, heat rises, right? But this attic might as well have been a dungeon. Damp air clung to my skin, and a heaviness wrapped itself around me, like a boa constrictor delivering the final embrace of death. A set of wooden stairs led up to the final landing, and I placed a foot on the bottom step. I took one look behind me, the warmly lit hallway a different universe compared to where I was headed, and then continued up the staircase. The attic, dimly lit by the now barely existing sunlight, glinted and shone in various places. As my eyes adjusted to the dark, I could make out edges and curves of what I assumed were pots, pitchers, jars, and similar items. I wrapped my arms around myself tighter, but it did nothing to protect me from the inexplicable cold of the attic. Everything felt damp, and an almost swampy feeling hung in the air, which got worse the further I ascended. A sound arrested my attention, and my blood froze in my veins. There shouldn't be any sounds. There shouldn't be anything at all. 
I heard it again. It was like metal dragging against something hard, but that couldn't be. I brushed it off as rats or something and took a few more steps until I was fully standing in the attic, the light from the hallway no longer reaching me at all. I took a few hesitant steps toward the first shelf I could see, which was just to the right. It held mason jars of various sizes, several books that seemed older than even Grandma had been, a quill and ink pot, and several loose papers that could have been a great canvas for a pirate map prop. I picked up one of the books. The title read, Folklore and Legends, The Making of Monsters. I replaced the book and picked up the next one. Imagination and Storytelling, The Effect of Lore on Cultural Development. I replaced that book and continued looking through the books on the shelf. Apparently, Grandma had a deep fascination with folklore that none of us ever knew about. It was honestly kind of amazing, and part of me was resentful that she had never shared this part of her life with me. I have always had a fascination with folklore, the paranormal, superstitions, pretty much anything strange. The weight of unspent memories fell heavy on my heart, and I had to blink back tears. I laughed at myself. It seemed like such a silly thing to cry about, but to know someone your entire life and be so close to them, to lose them, and then to find out that you actually had an even deeper connection that you were never allowed to explore. It's a second morning in a way. The silence, the dampness, everything about the attic weighed on me like bricks. I couldn't put my finger on it, but something was off. As though moving through a dream, I continued through the attic, tripping on boxes here and there. When I reached the left side of the attic, the now fully ascended moon shone through the window, and its light brought my attention to something in the back that I hadn't noticed before. Another door. Slowly, I approached it. What immediately stuck out to me was that this door was made entirely of iron. It was cold metallic, and there were four heavy bolts keeping it shut. Taking a deep breath, I unbolted the first closure, slowly. I realized something. It wasn't rusted over or creaking at all. It was as though the lock was new, or at least newly used. I thought more about the items in the attic. Maybe this is what was so odd. Nothing ever seemed dusty. Grandma must have used this place a lot. The second and third bolts were the same. I carefully unbolted those, and then I rested a shaking hand on the final lock. The attic thus far had held some interesting and even creepy items. Grandma had a weird set of interests that included all manner of folklore, fine. But this? This room, this whatever it was behind the door, had to be what she had kept from me, from all of us, for so many years. I knew that I was on the precipice of a great fall, and that once I stepped over the edge, no matter what it was, I could never go back. Come on, Sarah, just do it, I thought to myself. Finally, with one swift motion, I threw the final bolt out of its enclosure and placed my hand on the latch. I lifted it, and the door nearly opened by itself, probably because it was so heavy. Whatever room was behind the door, it was pitch black. I looked around, hoping to find a flashlight or something, but there was nothing to aid my search. And then I realized I had my phone in my pocket. I pulled it out and turned on the flashlight. When I raised it in front of me, the world spun, and for a moment I nearly passed out. Catching myself on the door, I recovered and sat upright again. I looked into the room once more, now a bit more prepared, but only just, and revealed a scene I never could have imagined. The entire room was reinforced with iron and heavy metal. Thick chains sprawled across the floor with shackles big enough to hold something strong, 
but not something too large. The light caught on cracks along the walls. No, not cracks. Slash marks, like claws. Something had managed to tear up the iron walls, at least the first few layers of them. I was standing in a cage. A cage meant for something of medium build, extremely strong, and apparently quite dangerous. Maybe she did have a tiger after all. Finally, my flashlight caught on a long, thin cord dangling from the ceiling. A light. I reached up and pulled the cord, and the entire room filled with a dim but sufficient light. I put my phone back in my pocket, let my eyes adjust, and that's when I screamed. Against the far wall, a decayed corpse was slumped against the corner on the ground. I saw a pile of fabric around it. More chains swung from the top of the room, the cage, heavier than the first. There were four sets. Darkened blood, clearly old, was splattered in the high corners. It looked as though someone had cleaned what they could reach and left whatever they couldn't. Shaking so badly I could barely walk, shuddering sobs escaping in gasps from my lips and tears streaming down my face, I made my way over to the long dead body. Somehow, somewhere in a portion of my being I couldn't articulate but also couldn't ignore, a truth existed told me exactly what I would find when I reached the other side. I needed it to be wrong. But more than that, I just needed to know. I didn't have to travel too much farther. Before I saw the petal pink skirt with the floral pattern and the beautiful white top. Mom! I screamed. I fell to the ground, screaming her name over and over. Primal rage and soul-shattering pain overcame me. Blood rushed through my ears as my heart pounded so hard I thought I would die. I couldn't think. I couldn't see. I couldn't hear. All I could do was scream. Perhaps because of this, I never heard or saw anything over the next few moments. But once I had finally been reduced to a lightly sobbing pile, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. Something was with me, a presence that hadn't been there before. Trembling, I stood and slowly turned toward the door. Footsteps, slow and intentional, made their way across the attic toward me. I clasped my hand over my mouth. I tried desperately to slow my breathing, furiously blinking away tears that blurred my vision. But I knew it would be of no use. I had turned the light on, opened the door. Anyone who knew what they were looking for would have no trouble finding me. A familiar shadow blocked the moonlight from the main attic, and the dim light from overhead revealed just enough for me to know who it was. Grandma? I stuttered. She stared down at me, mouth pressed into a line of disapproval and disgust. It didn't have to be like this, you know, she said carefully. Not for you. Mentally, I scrambled to find the pieces of the Jenga tower that had been demolished over the last several minutes. The structure of a life that had never been true. The pieces of a puzzle that now revealed an entirely different picture. But, but, but you're, and, and mom, are what? Dead? She smiled a thin, creeping smile, the single light bulb casting her face into shadow at angles that made her appear like a horror movie villain. What the hell is going on here? Grandma let out a slow, deep laugh. Well, for one thing, there's a disobedient child in my attic. I bristled. I'm not a j Silence! Grandma shouted. Layers of reality cemented themselves into my mind, a reformulation of all that was, a slow processing of the world around me. One of those layers fell into place, and I realized that my grandma was wearing her funeral garb. 
your funeral dress. Oh, yes. Haven't had the time to change, really. She paused before the word change. You're dead, I said again in barely a whisper. You wish, she replied. Your mother is, though. She cast an almost amused look at the corpse in the corner before saying, yet another victim of the inability to follow rules. Without realizing it, I had backed myself into the opposite corner from my mother as grandma had expertly corralled me there, slowly, methodically. You killed her, I said. Grandma disregarded that statement. You didn't have to end up here, Sarah. The rest of us had no choice. Runs in our veins, you know. But you, you had a choice. And yet, here you are. And I'm almost glad for it. Never since your mother got herself killed, we've been short one. And you, you just might do. A choice about what? I said, w what do you mean the rest of us? A second set of footsteps, light and nervous, made their way across the attic. I stared at the door, unable to imagine what new level of hell was about to enter, what final straw was about to shatter whatever semblance of mental cohesion and sanity I had left. Finally, a second figure entered the room and shut the door behind them. It's almost time, Grandma, the figure said, and at that moment, I dissolved. All I could manage was, Joyce? She approached my grandmother's side, staring down at me with eyes that held far more sympathy, but just as much coldness as my grandma's. I told you to stay out of here, little sister, but you just had to come up here, didn't you? You just had to find out for yourself. And now, after years and years of being your babysitter, of trying to keep you in line and keep you away, you spoil it anyway. What a waste. Her words held venom that I had never heard from her before. Then again, she said, Grandma might just be right. You could be one of us. For real this time. I opened my mouth to ask what she meant, but Grandma spoke first. Without taking her eyes off of me, she addressed Joyce and said, Is Philip ready, dear? Joyce nodded. Yes. Good. My mind twisted once more and my stomach along with it. Philip? As in your husband? I asked Joyce. She nodded. He's always been so supportive of our condition. I'm sure he'll accept you too after tonight. I'm sure your husband will too, dear. James has always been so caring. She paused and then continued. One way or another, everyone comes around eventually. In the cauldron of emotions that now churned within me, anger finally found its way to the top again. I rose and took a defiant step toward both of them. Tell me what's going on right now. I'm not going to stand here and be infantilized by a couple of psychopaths who apparently lied to me my entire life and had a murder room in the attic. So, you get to talking, or I'm going to leave and find out everything I want to all by myself. I moved through them, heading for the door. I was three steps away when I heard a deadbolt slide on the other side. No, I whispered. Then I heard another. Philip, I shouted. There's no use, Grandma said. Another bolt. What are you doing? What the hell are you doing? I shouted, facing my captors once more. The final bolt slid into place. Slide the hatch, Grandma said. Joyce nodded and moved toward the only side of the cage room I hadn't made my way to yet. She reached up grabbed on to a portion of the wall and released a small handle. With some effort, she slid an iron block to the side and moonlight filtered in. It was a full moon. Grandma and Joy stood together in front of the hatch, closed their eyes, 
and went silent. I ran to the door, pounding on it, knowing there was no point doing it anyway. I'd raised my fist to pound on the door again, but stopped. Behind me, I heard a sound like stretching leather and cracking bones. My grandma and sister groaned and screamed. Slowly, I turned to face the center of the room, and all reality broke. Bathed in the light of the full moon, they stretched, limb by limb, joints cracking, their faces contorted, their clothes tore and fell at their feet. In a display of grotesque horror, they morphed. Their groans and screams turned into snarls and growls, until finally they stood on all fours, fur covering their bodies. Two wolves stood before me, where my grandma and sister had once been. In my panic, something my grandmother had said drifted back through my mind. You, you had a choice. Oh no, I breathed, and in the next moment the wolf that had previously been my sister lunged at my throat. Three weeks later, thank you so much for coming, I said, shaking the hand of the man who had just walked through the front door. Of course, he said. I love an estate sale. Giving new life to something just feels better than that plastic crap you get from these big brands these days, you know? I nodded. I do. He looked at me a little longer than he should have and ran a nervous hand through his graying hair. It had only been three weeks, but I'd already gotten used to it by now. I I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be weird or anything, he said. But you have the most beautiful eyes. I smiled. Thank you for saying so. <laughs> it's a family trait, I said. Do enjoy the sale and uh, let me know if I can help you with anything. He nodded, gave another glance, and then wandered off. I felt a tap on my shoulder and turned around. Joyce, hey, how's it going? I asked. She smiled and handed me a glass of champagne. It's going. It feels weird to have an estate sale for the living, she whispered. I chuckled. <laughs> Undead is half dead, so it's only a white lie, isn't that what you said? Plus, I've gotten pretty comfortable with weird things over the last three weeks. Amazing what you can get used to. Having an estate sale for Grandma is the least weird part about it all. Joyce laughed and then looked at me with the sincerity and maybe even a love that I had never seen from her before. It's good, you know, she said. What's good? I asked, taking a sip of champagne. To have you as part of the family, the real family. I nodded casting my eyes downward. It's still a lot, I said. James left, did I tell you? Yeah, you did. She shook her head. And I know, she said, nodding. I know it's a lot, but you'll get there. You'll get used to almost everything after a while, even the parts you probably don't want to get used to. I swallowed hard. Were you serious in my training? About which part, she asked. About what happens if someone discovers what we are. You said people have three options, ignorance, compliance, or death. Once they find out about us, the ignorance is gone. So, she nodded. It's necessary to protect us. To protect everybody. I thought about that for a moment and said, then why am I not dead? I wasn't compliant. She laughed. Huh, part of you must have been, or you wouldn't be here. After a pause, she said, some parts you're never going to get used to, and that's okay. I nodded. So, am I still your bratty, rebellious little sister? I asked. Oh, always, always, she said and winked. I stifled a laugh. Hey, wanna grab another drink with me? 
she said. Yeah, definitely. I followed her into the kitchen and picked a champagne from the fridge. My glass had since been depleted. Joyce took it out of my hands. Allow me, she said. I smiled and walked over to the hanging mirror, adjusting my white blouse and looking at my newly purple eye. It complimented the other one quite well, really. It was hard not to smile, just a little bit. Joyce handed me the glass and we toasted. To new beginnings, she said. I paused and raised my glass. To family. We toasted and took a sip of our champagne, deciding without words that we should do our duty and head back to the sale. As we left the kitchen, a man's voice met us, drifting over the chatter from the staircase. No, no, it says we can't go that way. But why? A child, indignant and clearly unhappy, wailed his reply. Connor, I'm telling you if you don't learn to listen. This is not our house. We are not allowed to go that way. Remember how we talked about respect? Yeah, the kid said, clearly hating every moment of respect. This is one of those times, okay? We have to respect their rules, so let's go this way. Look, they have toys over in this room. I breathed a sigh of relief. Joyce muttered, crisis averted. We split up and attended to the needs of other guests, selling off most of the fancy furniture rather quickly and doing our best to answer questions about the rest of it. After it was all said and done, we'd be moving, far out in the middle of nowhere. Not so much restriction, and more of our kind. It would be good, really. I was speaking with an elderly woman who had taken an interest in a vintage book collection, positioned on a table at the base of the staircase. A flash of something caught my eye from the landing, heading down to the left side of the hallway. I listened intently, and then I heard it. The unmistakable cadence of a child's footsteps, running, and a door opening. I cut the woman off in the middle of her sentence. I'm terribly sorry, will you excuse me for just one moment? I said in the most polite but efficient way possible. I made my way to Joyce, trying to appear composed, stifling the panic rising within me. What's wrong? She asked. Little Connor didn't learn his lesson about respect. I glanced at the staircase. Her eyes widened. No, 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 no. We were on our way to the staircase when a piercing scream from the attic filled the house. Joyce and I exchanged a look of resigned sorrow. We had no choice. This was one of those parts we would never get used to. I'm Sarah. My husband's name is Paul. And together we have one son, Jimmy. At the time of this story, Jimmy was only five years old. We had just moved into a brand new house in a rural suburb of New York State. It was as close to farmland as you could get without being too far from civilization. So we were fairly isolated, but we did have neighbors. For us, it was the perfect balance between feeling too detached and the overwhelm of city life. The house was amazing and came with a price tag that was too good to pass up, especially once we saw inside. Paul and I never wanted anything lavish, so the intricately carved spiral staircase and the full-on chandelier that hung above the foyer it encircled made us feel a bit out of place at first. However, after looking at the space we'd have for Jimmy to play, the garden that was my selling point, and the 800 square foot auto shop of a garage, that was Paul's selling point, we decided that we could be fancy for a while. The chandelier would have to go at some point, we agreed. 
but for now it was a symbol of excess with which we could happily contend in exchange for the rest of the place. Aside from the features I already mentioned, we also had an indoor swimming pool that was located in a sort of atrium. It had a glass enclosure, so you still felt like you were outside, but it was protected from the elements enough that you could heat the room and swim even in the winter. Jimmy absolutely loved that pool. We used to tell him he was part fish because he spent so much time in there. That's why we found it to be especially odd when one day in the summer, Jimmy ran out of the pool room absolutely terrified and refused to go back in. We figured maybe he had just slipped and fallen and scared himself and that he'd be back at it the next day. Kids are resilient like that, you know? But that wasn't the case. The next day, I went out to the pool room and started reading my book, expecting Jimmy to follow, but he didn't. When I asked him what was wrong, he told me there was a monster in the flap. Now, if you've ever been in a residential pool, you know the flapping mechanism he's talking about. It's definitely creepy. Even I was afraid of it as a kid, mainly because I used to think my hair would get caught in it and I would drown. But his fear was next level. I asked him what the monster was, and he said it had arms. I said, arms like yours? He shook his head vigorously. No, like an occupy. An octopus? I asked. Yes, he shouted. I laughed. I actually laughed. Looking back on it, I regret having done so for a variety of reasons, but I laughed at him. I told him not to worry that there was no way there was an octopus living in our pool. It wasn't big enough. He shook his head and began to cry. In the flap! I comforted him, made him some hot cocoa, and told him that he didn't have to go in if he didn't want to. We left the pool room, and I shut and latched the door. Safety first, right? Anyway, that night I was laying in bed with Paul, getting ready to go to sleep, and I told him about the incident with Jimmy and the pool. Paul laughed. Well, if there's an octopus in our pool, I hope there's sunken treasure too. We giggled about it and turned the lights off to go to sleep. I'm not sure how long we'd been asleep, but I awoke with a start. For a second, I wasn't sure what had woken me. Paul was up too. What was it? I asked. But I'd barely finished my question when we heard a giant crash of glass. The pool room, we both said. We both ran downstairs and the pool room door was wide open. The glass had been smashed clean out of it, but there was no sign of a burglar or intruder of any kind. What the hell? I muttered. Then I heard Jimmy scream, not from his room upstairs, but from the corner of the pool room. He'd been hiding under a chair in the corner. Jimmy, I shouted. I ran over to him and I got about halfway down the length of the pool on the side deck. At that point, I heard a splash. Before I could turn my head all the way to see what it was, I saw a shadow and felt something hit my waist and then wrap around it like a vice. I screamed, pounding my fists on this thing. This thing that had, by this point, picked me up off the ground. I looked down in the darkness, trying to figure out what the hell had me. It was sticky. Whatever it was, it felt sticky, at least the side facing me. Adrenaline pumped through my veins as I kept hitting this thing, trying to detect information about what it was as I did. If the inside was sticky, the outside was oily, smooth, and cold. All of this information was ascertained and compiled in a matter of a second, and about the time this thing had lifted me away from the pool deck, above the water, I realized what I was in the grips of. A tentacle. The last couple of seconds had felt like slow motion, 
as though my brain had been working so hard to put the pieces together that it changed the course of time for a moment. But now, everything was back with sudden clarity. Paul was running upstairs, likely to get his gun. I had never been thrilled with having guns in the house, but let me tell you what, at that moment, I was a firm and staunch believer in the Second Amendment. Jimmy was screaming his head off. It was chaos. Not that I had a lot of time to register the chaos, because at that point, I began to feel a sharp descent. This thing was taking me under. I just knew it. In that instant, I took a deep breath. Good thing, too, because the next second I was underwater. The pool's cyan and green hue was beautiful and eerie all at once. Had I not been in the clutches of a gigantic pool monster, I would have found it almost pleasant. This thing let me go for an instant, and I was able to spin around. Facing me was the most horrific sight I had ever seen before. More than an octopus, this thing had the head of a spider. It had a fur-covered skull with eight large eyes, situated around its head like a crown, fangs the size of steak knives, and it was pulling me in, into the flap. Boy, did I regret laughing at Jimmy. The thing grabbed me around the waist again, and I thrashed about with my hands trying to grab onto anything, but to no avail. We were six feet down now, and I'm about to be six feet under, I thought. Farther and farther into that flap he went, and he was pulling me closer to it and the opening. And that's when I got a glimpse inside. There was a huge cave. It had to be the entire underground section around the pool. This thing was enormous, and I knew that if I was pulled inside that cave, I'd never come out of it. I knew this because in the moment that this thing moved its body out of the way, just long enough for me to glimpse inside. I also glimpsed the skeletons. I was dinner. I summoned all my motherly rage that this thing had tried to mess with my kid and bit into the oily, slick skin of the creature. It must have hurt at least a little because it loosened its grip just enough for me to get out. I swam to the top and Paul was there. He pulled me out in one fell swoop as I gasped and gagged, puking up water and whatever this thing had coating its skin. Jimmy was in absolute hysterics. I ran and grabbed him, and we went outside and called the cops. Let me tell you, explaining the reason for that 911 call to the operator was exactly as difficult as you might think. But after some verbal gymnastics and not outright saying we have a gigantic octopus spider demon in our pool, they sent some people out. Those people called more people who brought cameras and equipment that they could steer into the flap. They all looked at each other like we were nuts and they were just doing this so they could laugh about it later in the break room. Appease the hysterical mom and have pity on the dutiful husband, right? We waited for a few moments, and then I heard one of the techs say, What the hell? The guy next to him said, Holy shit. I'm going to pause here to tell you a little story about our house. Like I said, we got it at a really good price, like disturbingly good. We were told that the last family had up and left, leaving their belongings and no trace of themselves. A missing persons investigation had been conducted, but nothing was ever found. So after some legal maneuvering, the house ended up as property of the state and went on the market. Long story short, our home's previous owners are no longer missing. Their remains were found in the cave. The creature was killed and taken off for study. I don't honestly care where it is or what they do with it. I'm just glad the ordeal is over. To this day, I can't hear the steady flap, flap of the water moving the skimmer without chills going down my spine. And the next time your kid tells you about something that seems unbelievable, take my advice and listen.
Cancun was a paradise of blue skies and even bluer waters. The ocean was its own world, alive and whispering secrets through the currents. I'd spent the entire year looking forward to this snorkeling trip. My dad used to tell stories about how our ancestors were seafarers, explorers who mapped uncharted waters. I always felt a connection to the ocean that I couldn't explain, like a song whose lyrics I had forgotten, but whose melody stayed with me. On the third day, armed with snorkeling gear and a waterproof camera, I took a boat trip to a secluded reef. The guide, Ricardo, assured me it was an extraordinary spot, a place where the sea unveiled its hidden beauty. As soon as I plunged into the water, I was in another realm. Schools of vividly colored fish danced around me. Corals stretched out like ancient cities, an underwater metropolis teeming with life. I lost track of time, mesmerized by the vibrant underworld. But as I swam farther from the other snorkelers, the scenery began to change. The water got darker, and the corals appeared older, their colors muted. I was about to turn back when something caught my eye, an object half buried in the sand below, its outlines too straight and angular to be a natural formation. Curiosity pulling me deeper, I dove down for a closer look. What I found stopped me cold. A statue, humanoid but not human, its features a surreal blend of aquatic and terrestrial elements. It looked ancient, the material worn away by countless tides. It was the plaque at its base that took my breath away, literally and figuratively. My family's last name was etched onto it, Mendoza. I blinked, half expecting the letters to rearrange themselves, to make this bizarre occurrence some kind of misreading, but they remained, a cold testament set in stone. I took photos, my hands trembling. I had to show this to someone. I had to have proof that this wasn't some sort of underwater mirage. I quickly swam back to the boat, my heart pounding in a rhythm it had never known. When I showed Ricardo the pictures, he looked puzzled, and then concerned. This isn't something I've seen before, and I've been guiding tours for over a decade. You sure about the location? I nodded, pointing it out on the laminated ocean map he had on board. Ricardo scratched his head. That's not a typical spot for tourists. Too many local legends about sea spirits and forgotten gods. The fishermen avoid it. Ignoring my heightened sense of dread, I pressed him for more information. But he shook his head, reluctant to indulge in what he called superstitious nonsense. For the remainder of the trip, I couldn't get the statue and its plaque out of my mind. Who had put it there? How long had it been in the ocean? What did it mean? When I returned home, I showed the photos to my family. They were fascinated, but equally baffled. My dad, always the history buff, tried to dig into our family archives but came up empty. There were gaps in our lineage, periods where records were either incomplete or missing. Looks like our ancestors were good at keeping secrets, he mused. Weeks later, long after the trip, was a collection of photos and memories. Strange things began to happen. I found myself increasingly restless, a peculiar type of insomnia that left me tossing and turning, the sound of waves echoing in my ears even in the dead of night. Then I started to dream, visions of vast oceanscapes, of ancient rituals, of murmured incantations that seemed to flow from the statue's chiseled lips. Each morning, I would wake exhausted, like I'd been on an endless nocturnal journey. The final straw was the night I woke up to find my bed soaked, as though I'd been submerged in water. The room smelled of salt and seaweed, like a shoreline after high tide. And there on my nightstand sat a small shell, a type I had never seen before, its spirals forming a pattern eerily similar to the designs on the sunken statue's plaque. 
I booked a return trip to Cancun, this time alone. When I met Ricardo, I could see the unease in his eyes. You sure you want to go back there? I have to, was all I could say. As the boat neared the spot, my heart tightened in my chest. Donning my snorkeling gear, I plunged into the ocean, propelled by a force I couldn't deny. I reached the statue, its presence as unsettling as before. But now it felt like an unfinished chapter. Conversation interrupted but not concluded. I took a piece of paper, a waterproof one, and a pencil from my gear. On the paper, I wrote my full name, then pressed it against the plaque, securing it with a small net bag usually used to collect underwater samples. Then I waited. It didn't take too long. The water around me began to churn, the sand swirling like a miniature storm. I felt a pull, not of the current, but something deeper, as if the ocean itself had gripped my soul. My vision blurred, and when it cleared, I was back on the boat, Ricardo staring down at me, his face pale as sea foam. We need to leave, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. As we sped back to shore, I looked at the photograph of the statue one last time, and then deleted it from my camera. Some mysteries, it seemed, demanded their own form of isolation, their secrets too heavy for the surface world. That night, in my hotel room, I found another shell on my pillow, identical to the first one, but this time it came with a note. Welcome home. I haven't gone snorkeling since, not because I'm afraid, but because I'm not sure what I'd be returning to, a world of coral and fish, or a lineage that stretches into the dark corners of the sea. And sometimes, when the night is still and the moon casts its glow on the water's surface, I hear whispers, voices that beckon, that plead, that promise. They call to me from depths I can't fathom, asking me to reclaim a legacy that was submerged long before I was born. And I wonder, with equal parts dread and longing, what would happen if I answered? The Transnational Express had always been a dream of mine, a cross-country train journey that zigzagged through small towns and big cities offering panoramic views of the landscapes most people only saw in travel brochures. When work dried up and my apartment lease ended, it seemed like the universe was giving me a sign. So, with a one-way ticket and a duffel bag, I boarded the train and settled into my seat. A couple of hours into the journey, I discovered an old worn-out paperback wedged into the seat pocket in front of me. No title, no author, just a yellowed cover that looked as though it had survived a few decades. Curiosity peaked, I flipped it open and began to read. The story was engaging from the get-go, featuring a protagonist named Alex, who had an uncanny number of similarities to me. Same age, same hometown, even the same peculiar birthmark on the right wrist. The sense of deja vu was amusing at first, but then, as I turned the pages, the amusement turned to disbelief. Every minor detail, every anecdote, mirrored my life. There were episodes I hadn't shared with anyone. Private moments, embarrassments, triumphs. It was as if someone had rifled through my memories and penned them down, rebranding them as fiction. I scanned the train car, suddenly paranoid. Faces stared blankly out windows or were buried in books and screens. No one paid me any attention. Yet I felt horribly exposed, as though I'd found a hidden camera in a dressing room. Forcing myself to breathe, I decided to keep reading. I needed to know how deep the rabbit hole went. The story meandered through familiar events, then veered into unfamiliar territory. Here, the narrative split from my reality. In this alternate life, Alex had never boarded the Transnational Express. 
Instead, he stayed in his hometown, shackled to a job he loathed, embroiled in a doomed relationship. Page by page, the story unfolded into a cautionary tale, a life filled with regret and missed opportunities. I read about Alex's downward spiral with growing unease. The climactic sense was jarring, a tragic end involving a car accident, alcohol, and shattered dreams. I closed the book, my hands trembling. Was this some kind of sick joke? A warning? Restless, I roamed the train, passing through cars filled with families, solo travelers, and empty seats. When I reached the observation car, I found it deserted, except for an elderly woman seated by the window. She looked up as I entered, her eyes narrowing for a moment before widening in recognition. You've read the book, haven't you? She said, her voice tinged with an accent I couldn't place. What is that thing? I asked, holding up the yellowed paperback as though it were evidence in a trial. It's a glimpse, she replied. A glimpse of another path, another ending. But why me? Who wrote this? Some questions don't have answers, she said, staring past me at the blur of landscapes rushing by. Or perhaps they have too many to count. Is it a warning? I pressed, seeking some thread of sense in this woven chaos. It's a gift, she said, meeting my gaze. Whether you take it as a warning or an inspiration is entirely up to you. I left the observation car, my mind a labyrinth of questions without exits. Back in my seat, I shoved the book into my duffel bag, burying it beneath clothes and toiletries. Yet it felt like it weighed a ton, pulling me toward an understanding that remained tantalizingly out of reach. The train journey continued, stops were made, passengers disembarked, new faces appeared. But the scenery outside felt like a backdrop to the storm of thoughts inside me. Could I take this fork in the road, so vividly outlined in the pages of a nameless book? On the final day of the journey, I awoke to find the seat pocket empty. The book I had returned had vanished. I rummaged through my bag, but it was gone, as if it had never existed. No one else on the train remembered seeing it, or had any knowledge of the elderly woman in the observation car. When the train pulled into the final station, I stepped onto the platform, my duffel bag slung over my shoulder. The air was different here, filled with a sense of potential, a vibrancy that felt miles away from the life I'd left behind. I hailed a cab and directed it to a local inn. As I checked in, the woman at the front desk handed me a form to fill out. New in town? She asked, her eyes friendly, her smile genuine. Yes, I said, grasping the pen and hesitating for just a moment before writing down my name. Not Alex, the name I'd been given, but a new one, a name of my choosing. As I signed, I glanced at the clock on the wall. It was the same time the accident would have happened, according to the book's narrative. The coincidence, or was it fate, sent a shiver down my spine. I collected my room key and headed upstairs. But as I turned the corner, I froze. At the far end of the hall, a door creaked open, and for a fleeting second, I thought I saw the elderly woman from the observation car step out, her eyes meeting mine in a knowing glance. And then she was gone, the door clicking shut behind her. I stood there, a cold draft whispering down the corridor, caressing the birthmark on my wrist. I gripped the key in my hand, its jagged edges digging into my palm, as if urging me to unlock not just a room, but a life yet unwritten. And as I inserted the key into the lock, I wondered, would this door lead me to the story the book foretold, or to one of my own making? The lock clicked open. I stepped inside, leaving the door ajar behind me.
I was never a fan of long haul flights. Hours confined in a metal tube surrounded by strangers. To pass the time, I usually toggled between in-flight movies and the digital tracker that displayed our plane's current location. On this particular international flight, I decided to check the tracker again, something to take my mind off the tightening muscles in my back. A quick glance at the screen, and my eyes narrowed. We were way off course. According to the map, our plane was headed toward an island in the middle of the ocean. An island that I'm pretty sure wasn't even supposed to be there. Puzzled, I hit the call button for the flight attendant. When she arrived, I pointed at the screen. Is this thing accurate? I said. She leaned in to look. Oh, these trackers can be a little glitchy sometimes. Don't worry, the pilots know where we're going. Despite her reassurances, the sinking feeling in my gut persisted. I couldn't ignore the hard data staring back at me. We were heading into uncharted territory, and it seemed like I was the only one who cared. An hour passed, then two. The tracker showed us getting closer to the mysterious island, while the rest of the plane's occupants were either asleep or engrossed in their entertainment screens. I had to do something. I unbuckled my seatbelt and headed for the restroom, strategically located near the cockpit. Waiting for the perfect moment, I saw a flight attendant push a cart into the galley. I seized the opportunity, knocking softly on the cockpit door. One of the pilots opened it, a hint of annoyance in his eyes. Can I help you? I'm sorry for the interruption, I said quickly. But according to the in-flight tracker, we're heading toward an island that's not on any map? Is that a glitch or...? The pilots exchanged glances. The tension in the cockpit was palpable. Come in, the second pilot said, ushering me inside. I stepped into the cockpit, the array of controls and screens glowing in the semi-darkness. The main navigation system confirmed what I'd seen on my tracker. We were off course, headed toward an anomaly. We've been trying to correct it, the first pilot said. The navigation system deviated on its own about two hours ago. Manual overrides aren't working. We're stuck on this trajectory. Shouldn't we inform the passengers? I asked, my voice tinged with urgency. And say what? That we're flying blind toward an island that doesn't exist? The second pilot shook his head. Panic is the last thing we need. For a brief moment, I contemplated rushing out, alerting everyone, forcing the issue. But the potential chaos held me back. What good would it do? Look, said the first pilot, if you have any ideas on how to fix this, we're all ears. Otherwise, please return to your seat. We're doing everything we can. Resigned, I exited the cockpit, closing the door behind me. I returned to my seat eyes flicking back to the tracker. Closer and closer we moved toward the Phantom Island, its outline growing more distinct. The flight continued in its eerie silence, the tension in my body building with each passing minute. And then it happened. The plane began to descend. Seatbelt signs flashed on and the cabin crew prepared for landing. We were committed now, come what may. As the wheels touched down on a makeshift runway, I stared out of the window. The island was real, its terrain lush and untamed. We taxied to a stop, the engines winding down, the weight of the unknown settling over us. The cabin door opened, stairs deployed, and we stepped out, passengers and crew alike, into the island's embrace. There were no signs of human life, no structures, no reception committees, just wilderness stretching out in every direction, and an ocean whose horizon held no promise of rescue. We had landed on an uncharted island, a place that defied maps and logic, carried here by a plane that refused to obey its pilots. Where we were, why we were here, and what it meant, those questions hovered in the thick, humid air unanswered. Days turned into weeks. Rescue never came. We adapted, survival outweighing understanding. 
The island became home, its inexplicable presence a riddle interwoven into the fabric of our new reality. The outside world faded into an abstraction, as distant as the stars that watched over us each night. The flight that vanished off the radar, the passengers who disappeared into thin air, the plane that went where it shouldn't, all became the stuff of headlines, then theories, then myths. But for us, it became life. A life off course, off map, on an island that didn't exist until it did. The Airbnb was a quaint little cottage tucked away in the rural back roads, the kind of place that promised a reprieve from the clamor of city life. The reviews were stellar, the pictures inviting. When Emma and I arrived, it was even more charming in person. A cozy living room, antique furniture, and an atmosphere thick with rustic allure. We were about to congratulate ourselves on finding this hidden gem, when Emma made an observation. Hey, have you noticed something off about the mirrors? I looked around. She was right. Each mirror in the cottage was either covered with cloth or turned to face the wall. It wasn't just one or two. It was all of them. From the bathroom to the bedroom to even a small hand mirror that we found in a drawer. That's a bit weird, I admitted, feeling a pinch of unease. Emma pulled out her phone. Maybe it's a cultural thing or some rural superstition? Should we ask the host? Before she could dial, I suggested, eh, let's not make a big deal out of it. People have their quirks, especially out here. She nodded, but I could tell she wasn't entirely convinced. Nevertheless, we pushed the mirror issue to the back of our minds and focused on enjoying the evening. We made dinner, watched a movie on my laptop, and eventually retreated to the bedroom. The cottage had no Wi-Fi and spotty cell reception isolating us from the world outside. It should have been freeing, but as the night deepened, the absence of mirrors started to take on a weight, invisible yet increasingly palpable. We crawled into bed and I turned off the lights. In the dark, the mirror issue resurfaced in my mind, now a gnawing concern. The room was pitch black, save for the sliver of moonlight that sneaked through the curtains casting elongated shadows on the walls. Then I heard it, a faint, almost indiscernible scratching sound, like fingernails against wood, coming from the direction of the covered mirror. I shot a glance at Emma, her eyes wide open, staring at the ceiling. You heard that too? She whispered. Yeah, I said, my voice trembling despite myself. The scratching sound continued, rhythmically persistent. I weighed the options in my head, ignore it and hope it goes away, or confront it and risk discovering something we'd rather not know. A cloud must have moved because the room darkened even further, amplifying the tension. Enough was enough. With a surge of adrenaline, I sprang out of bed and flipped on the light switch. The scratching stopped instantly. My eyes darted to the mirror covered with an embroidered cloth. I felt a mix of dread and resolve as I approached it, my hands shaking as I reached for the cloth. Wait, Emma said, her voice tinged with apprehension. I paused, locking eyes with her. In that moment, we both understood the risks of unveiling the unknown. I let my hand drop, stepping back. We should leave it alone she said, a mixture of relief and lingering curiosity in her eyes. Agreed, I replied, unable to mask my own relief. We spent the rest of the night in a tense, sleepless vigil, the covered mirror a silent sentinel in the room. Morning couldn't come soon enough. As the first rays of sunlight filtered through the curtains, we packed up and left without looking back. 
Our host sent us a message later asking how our stay was. I hesitated before typing out a non-committal reply about the cottage being lovely and quaint. There was no mention of mirrors. The experience remained a puzzle piece that refused to fit, an anomaly in an otherwise idyllic getaway. The questions hovered in our minds, but neither of us wanted to probe further. Some mysteries, we concluded, are better left covered. Their truths turned away to face the wall. The city was a labyrinth of narrow alleys and sprawling plazas, soaked in a history that I could only appreciate through the lens of a camera. Every corner seemed steeped in a story that I couldn't fully grasp. I didn't speak the language, relying on fractured phrases and Google Translate to get by. Restaurants, museums, shopping, simple transactions aided by the ubiquity of the universal language of currency but a deeper understanding of the place and its people eluded me. Then came that first night. Jet-lagged and restless, I wandered into the old district, away from the well-trodden paths of fellow tourists. Midnight approached. The chimes of a distant clock tower marked the hour, a dozen resonant dings echoing in the stillness. I stumbled upon a hole-in-the-wall bar sparsely populated by locals. The moment I stepped inside, something shifted. The bartender spoke, and instead of hearing unintelligible sounds, I understood him perfectly. What will you have? He asked. I answered fluently, ordering a drink in a language I didn't know I spoke. The transformation was jarring. I felt like I'd been granted access to a secret layer of the world, one that had always been there right beyond the veil of comprehension. Conversations around me became transparent, people discussing politics, love, and the trials of everyday life. Words flowed from my mouth effortlessly, my tongue deftly navigating the syntax and grammar as if I had spoken the language all my life. My newfound ability persisted. I left the bar, wandered through the labyrinthine streets, and found myself among late night benders and night owls. I conversed with ease, each interaction deepening my connection to the city and its inhabitants. But I also felt like an imposter, trespassing in a realm that wasn't meant for me. As the sky started to brighten, a sense of dread settled in. Would my newfound ability disappear as mysteriously as it had arrived? A clock somewhere struck four, and just like that, the words became muffled, opaque. My midnight fluency had evaporated, leaving me with nothing but an aftertaste of what had been. I returned to my hotel room, a profound sense of loss mingling with wonder. For the rest of my trip, every night at the stroke of midnight, I found myself immersed in this alternate reality, a fluent stranger in a land that felt increasingly like home. And each morning, the spell broke, pushing me back into the sphere of the outsider. I spoke to no one about it. Who would believe me? Who could make sense of this bizarre circadian talent? I took no videos, snapped no audio clips. It felt wrong to document what I couldn't explain. On my last night, I stayed in. I watched the city through my window, the streets slowly emptying the sounds of a language I could temporarily call my own, filling the air as the clock tower struck midnight. A final evening of fluency, before boarding a plane, to a place where words wouldn't evade me. I left the city, carrying its alleys and midnight conversations in the inner chambers of my memory, an experience bound to time and place. I still travel, exploring other foreign lands and other tongues, but every time the clock strikes midnight, wherever I am, I'm taken back to those winding streets, to that hole-in-the-wall bar, to the people I spoke with in a language that only truly became mine in the shadowy realm between one day and the next.
The hiking trail through the forest was familiar. Each bend, each fork, leading deeper into the woods held a nostalgia for Maya and me. We'd hiked it dozens of times, our love story punctuated by the footfalls on this very path. It was a year ago on this trail that we'd lost a shoe. A ridiculous thing, really. Maya's right hiking boot had somehow gotten loose and fallen off. We looked everywhere, but we never found it. A small loss, but it became one of our go-to funny stories. So, when we came across a lone shoe sitting squarely in the middle of the path, laughter was our first reaction. Hey, look, someone else decided to donate to the forest, Maya chuckled. I bent down to get a closer look. No way. It's a right boot, size seven. This is your missing shoe. She raised an eyebrow. Come on, what are the odds? It's been a year. I picked it up, brushing off the leaves and dirt. It looked almost new, its material free from rot or wear, the brand and design matching the pair she used to have. This is too weird, Maya said, taking the shoe from my hands. We looked at each other, the humor dissipating like mist before the sun. This didn't make sense. We lost that shoe miles away from this spot, and the condition, it should have weathered a year of forest life. Let's get going, I suggested, suddenly eager to leave this peculiar find behind us. We walked in uneasy silence. The trees seemed to loom a little taller their shadows stretching dark fingers across the trail. Birds chatted overhead, but their songs sounded discordant, almost mocking. When we reached the spot where we'd lost the shoe a year ago, we paused. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, just a bend in the trail framed by oak and pine, sunlight filtering through in dappled patches. Look, Maya whispered, pointing to the ground. Right there, where she'd lost her boot, was a fresh footprint. A right footprint, its shape mirroring that of the lone boot we'd found. A shiver crawled up my spine. It felt like the forest itself was watching us, that our movements were echoed by something we couldn't see or understand. The eeriness clung to us, the silence broken only by our hurried steps. Finally, we reached the end of the trail, the car park a welcome sight. Without speaking, we packed our gear into the car and drove off. The forest receded in the rearview mirror, but its unsettling memory lingered. Days passed, the shoe sat in our garage, an enigma neither of us wanted to touch. Maya suggested we throw it away, but I hesitated. It was as though discarding it would be an admission of something too strange to articulate. And then, one morning, it was gone. The shoe had vanished from the garage, leaving an empty space on the shelf. Maya shrugged it off, saying maybe one of us had moved it and forgotten. I wanted to believe her. I really did. Yet the absence gnawed at me, as if the missing shoe had become a metaphor for an unanswered question, a puzzle missing its final piece. Weeks later, we returned to the forest, an unspoken agreement hung between us to avoid talking about the shoe or the footprint. We just wanted a normal hike to reclaim the sanctuary this trail had once been for us. But halfway in, we found it again. A lone right boot, size seven, placed neatly in the center of the path. The same brand, the same design, impossibly new. This time, we didn't stop. We didn't discuss it. We quickened our pace until we were almost running, each step an affirmation of our desire to leave this bewildering mystery behind. As we exited the forest, a chill washed over me. I looked back one last time. 
The trees stood like sentinels, their branches swaying gently in the wind, or perhaps in farewell. We never returned to that trail, but sometimes when we're alone in the silence of our thoughts, I catch Maya looking at her hiking boots lined up neatly by the door, and I know she's wondering, as I am, whether that other shoe is still out there on the trail, waiting for the moment we dare return, and wondering what might happen if we do. I don't know how long I was out before I came to, strapped naked on a cold metal table in a sterile white room. My foggy brain struggled to piece together some explanation from how I went from driving home from work to this. Blurry figures moved in my peripheral vision. I tried to lift my head for a better look, but some invisible force held it locked in place. A tall, gangly creature entered my field of vision. He had a bulbous bald head with opaque black eyes and pale gray skin that seemed to glow under the harsh lights. Spindly fingers covered in some sort of black gloves or claws tapped a device it held in its equally spindly hands. I opened my mouth to speak, scream, anything, but quickly realized I was also paralyzed from the neck down. Helpless panic gripped every fiber of my being. The creature must have sensed my terror. In my mind, I heard a thin, reedy voice. Do not be frightened. We intend you no harm. We only wish to improve your species, to prepare you for what is coming. Invisible claws clamped down on my head as an excruciating pain ricocheted through my skull. It felt like my brain was being shredded and reassembled as images and concepts flashed before my eyes. Advanced technology, complex mathematics, cosmic disasters, future events. More creatures entered the room and began manipulating my limbs, injecting substances, prodding and poking me. After what felt like an eternity of tests, my overwhelmed mind gratefully slid into unconsciousness. I awoke some time later back in my car, parked in my driveway. My head throbbed as I tried to piece together if it had all been some bizarrely vivid nightmare. But the lingering pain in my temples and dried blood under my nose told me otherwise. Those creatures, whatever they were, had been inside my head, and they did something to me. In all the days that followed, the changes began. Headaches persisted no matter how many pain pills I took, but I also noticed food no longer satisfied my gnawing hunger. My vision sharpened until I could read license plates from a block away. The strange voices in my head grew louder. I started having vivid premonitions that would come true. A coworker's car crash, an election upset, even trivial things like TV scheduling changes or pop quiz questions. Somehow I could glimpse upcoming events, almost like watching a stream of the future. My body changed too. I no longer seemed to need sleep, yet woke every morning feeling fully energized. Previously sluggish thinking accelerated to lightning speed. I solved complex equations instantly and remembered entire textbooks word for word but the toll was immense migraines that sometimes left me writhing, incapacitated on the floor for hours. At work, I predicted a system failure before it happened, saving us millions. My bosses said I was brilliant. Little did they know alien abductors did something to transform me into a superhuman freak. Part of me wanted to tell the world, to find meaning in my violation, but how could I without sounding insane? The voices in my head had grown to a constant, chaotic chorus only I could hear. They whispered horrors, crashes, explosions, suffering and death on global scales. 
I caught glimpses of creatures and spacecraft hidden behind the thin veil that previously concealed them. The experiments performed on me clearly ruptured the flimsy illusion, separating our ordinary reality from levels beyond. I tried drowning the voices out with music, drugs, anything I could think of, but they only intensified. Soon they were screaming, pleading with me to act before the coming cataclysm. I wasn't sure if I was tapping into some real truth or simply going mad. Maybe I already was. The final straw came after a week of ceaseless migraines and zero sleep. In the mirror, my eyes appeared blackened from burst blood vessels. My gums bled spontaneously, and my fingers trembled uncontrollably. How long until whatever alien substance they pumped me with finally killed me? That night, as I rocked and muttered to myself, a booming voice cut through the others, commanding me, Go to the cave. Our technology can save you and your planet, but time grows short. Somehow I knew exactly the cave it meant, one I had played in as a child on family camping trips. I tore out of my house and sped recklessly into the hills until I came to that familiar rocky outcropping. A perfect full moon illuminated the small black mouth of the cave's entrance. I stumbled inside, not even questioning my surreal actions lured by a promise of relief from the unrelenting torment. Deeper, I crawled until the narrow walls opened into a large cavern with a glowing blue light at its center. Mesmerized, I stepped toward it. The angry chorus in my head became a single high-pitched drone the closer I came to that glow. I realized my mistake too late. I had walked right into their trap. The force that seized control of my body was even greater than during the first abduction. I was a puppet, compelled by some external power to march stiffly toward that pulsing light, compelled to become something far from human. Just as my hand reached for the hypnotic light, instinct took over. I wrenched back control of my body and let out a primal scream of rage at the creatures, who thought they could dictate my fate. With the last of my energy, I ripped a sharp stone from the cavern wall and plunged it into my chest, collapsing as hot blood gushed. I lie gasping on the cold cave floor, life ebbing away, but at least I would die as myself and not their specimen. As my vision faded, I heard their frustrated screams fade to silence. I can only pray my small act of defiance delayed their apocalypse just a while longer so someone else might find a way to avoid the grim future, preordained for our race. A future I glimpsed in my final moments, our planet harvested, and humanity mutated into some cold new form. But perhaps we still have time to forge another path. Perhaps. It started as a hobby, setting up a high-powered telescope in my backyard on clear nights and gazing deep into our galaxy. As an amateur astronomer, I loved picking out familiar constellations and nebulae, tracking the trajectories of planets and asteroids, and pondering the mysteries of black holes. On rare occasions, I'd even spot a comet streaking past or catch sight of the gold-hued rings of Saturn. My telescope opened up the secrets of the cosmos, right from my suburban home. But everything changed that cloudless night in June, when I first picked up the signal. I was scanning the telescope slowly along the dusty swath of the Milky Way, marveling as always at the millions of stars, packed densely together like grains of glittering sand. I lingered on a binary star system, intriguingly called Zeta Reticuli, before panning upward. That's when a rapid flash of light from a dimmer part of the sky caught my eye. I quickly focused the telescope on that patch of the night. It took me a moment to spot the source, not a star, 
that some unidentified object beyond our solar system, sending out a deliberate sequence of pulses. My heart began pounding. I grabbed my notebook and pen and frantically scribbled down the sequence. Three short pulses, three long pulses, three short, pause, repeat. It was clearly a patterned signal, which meant it must have some kind of meaning. My mind raced through the possibilities. A monitoring program from some secret government space agency? A research craft sent out by extraterrestrial beings? Or even a message? A signal intentionally beamed across light years of space? In the weeks that followed, I became obsessed with deciphering that cryptic message from the void. Nights when the sky was overcast left me restless and irritable as I yearned to train my telescope on that now familiar region. On clear nights, I diligently recorded each repetition of the pulsing sequence, searching for possible variations. After completing pages of data, an eerie realization struck me. The sequence was expressing binary code. The short pulses represented ones, and the long pulses symbolized zeros. The message began to take legible shape, translating roughly to, hello, we come in peace, we seek contact. Contact. They, whoever, whatever they were out there, sought to make contact with our planet. A shudder passed through me, equal parts exhilaration and dread. What forces had I unwittingly contacted in the dark oceans of space? And did humanity truly stand ready for this moment? I continued watching the signal, deciphering new messages as they came. They spoke of a distant civilization from a planet in the Zeta Reticuli system, long ago ravaged by war and climate disaster. The messages alluded to their immense scientific knowledge and expressed hope we could work together to build an interstellar utopia. But underneath the lofty utopian dreams, an unsettling undercurrent emerged. They urged us to join the Federation and embrace universal law. Ominous references to colonization appeared, along with hints that resistant civilizations could be pacified. I became convinced there was a veiled threat beneath their promise of peace. This growing unease festered in my mind, magnified by lack of sleep and constant anxiety. I stopped leaving the house, rarely ate or bathed, entirely consumed by the messages streaming nightly from light years away. I was unable to share my discovery with anyone else. It sounded far too insane until one sweltering midnight, when the messages took an urgent new turn, no longer encoded, but spelled out in plain ominous letters. We come, prepare and submit. Adrenaline spiked through my system. They were coming, for us, soon. I shut down the telescope and gathered all my notebooks filled with inscrutable figures and frantic scribble translations. In a manic whirlwind, I destroyed my hard drives, sabotaged my equipment, and burned all the papers out behind my shed. I hoped desperately it would be enough to sever the connection, shut out their intrusion into our small world, delay their sinister arrival for a few fleeting days. But I can feel their presence now, ominous and heavy, seeping into the very atmosphere of our vulnerable planet. Sometimes I still catch the coded signals winking slyly at me from familiar constellations, taunting me that I was too weak to shield us from what's to come. In my most hopeless moments, staring up at the indifferent sky, I wonder if humanity will look upon this year as our last before oblivion arrived, silently, from the stars. First, 
I brushed off the odd series of coincidences as just that, coincidence. But deep down, I sensed each one was an orchestrated breadcrumb, luring me towards something bigger. It all started with the lottery ticket. I never play the lottery, but on some whim, I bought a scratcher at the gas station one night. Amazingly, I won $500. Not a fortune, but probably the most I'd ever won gambling. I decided to splurge on a fancy steak dinner. When I arrived at the restaurant that night, they had no record of my reservation. Annoyed, I turned to leave just as another couple was exiting. They kindly offered me their table, saying that they had suddenly fallen ill. I thanked my lucky stars. Halfway through my meal, nature called. In the bathroom, the motion sensor sink turned on as I walked by. Oddly, the faucet sputtered and a tiny object shot out of the drain right at my feet. A gold ring with a cryptic symbol etched in black. Even odder, it somehow fit my ring finger perfectly. Just then, the bathroom door swung open and a gruff voice ordered me back to my table immediately. I pocketed the ring and complied. Later, when I asked my server about the ring symbol, his smile wavered momentarily before he leaned in and whispered, You've been chosen. Follow the signs. Before I could ask what he meant, he hurried off. I chuckled, assuming he was messing with me. Over the next week, that ring symbol seemed to pop up everywhere, etched into a subway pillar, engraved on a mailbox, even tattooed on the wrist of a barista handing me my morning coffee. Each time I spotted it, a strange tingling would spread up my arm from the ring on my finger. That weekend, another string of improbabilities led me to book an impromptu trip to Nevada. On the flight there, my seatmate made small talk, asking where I was heading. When I told him the name of my hotel, he raised an eyebrow and said I should explore a certain unmarked dirt road near the property. Just look for three cacti clustered together, he said. I did find that strange road out in the desert behind the hotel. After miles of empty wilderness, I came across what looked like an abandoned shed. Suddenly, my vision blurred, the same strange tingling shooting down my arm from the ring. Without thinking, I approached the shed and the door swung open on its own. A narrow staircase spiraled down into inky darkness. Every nerve told me to flee, yet I found myself descending step by step into the void. The temperature dropped sharply. Strange mechanical hums and echoing voices drifted up. At the bottom, the stairs opened into a massive domed chamber. Catwalks crisscrossed the space high above my head. Figures in white lab coats scurried about, attending to large cylindrical chambers covered in warning symbols and containing something alive. Creatures I couldn't fully glimpse, but that seemed only half formed, not of this earth. I should have turned and run. Instead, I crept forward along the perimeter of the vast chamber. That's when I saw it in the center, a mammoth disc-like craft resting silently on a raised platform. Access panels on its smooth metal hull were open, exposing a maze of alien circuitry and pulsating with light. Human scientists hovered around it, studying and making notes. One inserted a long robotic arm into the craft's inner workings. My blood turned to ice. This was no abandoned shed. It was a secret government site for reverse engineering extraterrestrial technology. All those seeming coincidences had drawn me here. But why? Just then, alarms screeched to life, pulsing red lights flooding the facility. A panicked voice over the intercom shouted, Protocol Omega initiated. The scientists scattered as security teams stormed through the side doors, spotting me as the intruder. I turned and ran wildly back the way I came. I raced blindly through deserted hallways, footsteps echoing close behind. 
Up ahead loomed a massive vault door marked Hangar B. It creaked open just enough for me to slip through before slamming shut. The lock spun with a heavy final clunk. I found myself on a vast tarmac filled with even more mammoth alien craft, all surrounded by heavily armed soldiers. One began rising with a metallic groan, rotors kicking up debris. Before I could react, some unseen force pulled me toward the craft. A beam of light enveloped me, lifting me up effortlessly into its belly. As the hatch sealed below, I knew I was trapped in the clutches of something far beyond my comprehension. The ring still tingled familiarly, almost mockingly, reminding me this had been the plan all along. I was the chosen one, but for what sinister purpose? The craft accelerated skyward, the G-forces pressing me to the cold metal floor. Slowly, the planet's curve became visible out the thick glass windows. I shut my eyes, sending a silent prayer for anyone left behind on that fragile blue marble, drifting farther and farther into the distance below me. Wherever I was going, I knew Earth and humanity were now lifetimes behind me. A glance out the window, a double take, and then dread settled like a cold stone in my stomach. Overnight, a crop circle had appeared in my backyard. It wasn't the hasty work of pranksters, but a design intricate in detail and precise in its geometry. Circular patterns interlocked with arcane symbols, etched into the tall grass as if by an unseen hand. How? Why? Questions tumbled through my mind as I stood there, coffee mug forgotten on the kitchen counter. My backyard was enclosed, no signs of entry or exit. It was as if the formation had materialized out of thin air. That was just the beginning. Small oddities followed, electronic glitches, lights flickering on and off, inexplicable shadows skimming past windows. I found my dog, Max, staring at the crop circle for hours, as if captivated by something I couldn't see. At night, a low-frequency hum resonated from the ground, growing louder near the center of the formation. By the third day, I couldn't ignore it any longer. I decided to investigate, grabbing a flashlight and a notebook, a feeble attempt to document whatever I might find. As I stepped into the circle, the air grew dense. The normal sounds of the evening, crickets, the rustle of leaves, drowned out by a pulsating vibration that seemed to emanate from the earth itself. Drawn to the circle's center, I felt my pulse quicken, my senses sharpen. And then it happened. Each symbol within the formation lit up, one by one, as if activated by my presence. The lines glowed a ghostly blue, a luminous web stretching out in all directions. A chill crawled up my spine. I was no longer alone. Peripheral vision caught figures standing just beyond the circle, silhouettes barely discernible in the dim light. They were tall, slender, almost humanoid, but not quite. Their forms wavered, as if composed of light and shadow, their eyes fixed upon me. Telepathically, a message entered my mind, bypassing language and lodging itself directly into my understanding. Pattern, conduit, obligation. The words were disjointed, fragments of concepts too vast for my comprehension. I felt a sudden surge of emotion, confusion, awe, a piercing sense of urgency. My gaze was pulled upward, where a shimmering distortion appeared in the sky, an oscillating tear in the fabric of reality itself. And then, as suddenly as they had appeared, the figures vanished. The glow subsided, the crop circle returning to its inert state, the night swallowing whatever forces had just been at play. 
But the tear in the sky remained, a barely visible ripple, like a cosmic bruise. I retreated back to my house, the weight of the encounter settling in. Sleep came hard that night, interrupted by flashes of what had transpired, figures beyond human description, concepts my mind struggled to grasp. But one thing was clear, whatever had occurred was beyond me, perhaps beyond humanity itself. Days turned to weeks, and the crop circle eventually faded, the grass reclaiming its natural state. But the strange occurrences didn't stop. Objects around the house moved of their own accord, as if displaced by invisible hands. Sometimes, in the dead of night, I'd hear whispers, indistinct murmurs that echoed in my ears long after they had ceased. The tear in the sky became a permanent fixture, occasionally visible when conditions were just right. I found myself drawn to it, a magnet pulling at some innate sense of destiny or doom. And the words, the disjointed message received from those otherworldly beings, played on repeat in my mind. Pattern. Conduit. Obligation. I became obsessed, sketching the crop circle's design over and over, each stroke of the pencil amplifying the hum that still resonated from the ground, as if the paper itself had become a conduit. But a conduit for what? And what was this obligation they spoke of? As days pass, the anticipation thickens. Something is coming. Something far beyond my understanding. The crop circle was not an end, but a beginning. A doorway, a portal, a breach between their world and mine. And now, every night, as I stare up at the sky, at the tear that remains and seems to grow ever so slightly, I can't shake the feeling that whatever it is, whatever is waiting on the other side, it's getting closer. It caught my eye immediately a strange metallic orb on a dusty shelf in the back of the antique shop. About the size of a softball, it was etched with odd, intricate symbols and emitted a faint blue glow when I picked it up. The shopkeeper just smiled cryptically when I asked what it was. A little something from out of this world, he said with a wink. Against my better judgment, I bought it, too mesmerized to leave it behind. Back home, I examined the orb closely, turning it over in my hands. The surface almost seemed to ripple and move. I traced my fingers over the etched symbols, jerking back when they flashed brightly at my touch. The orb began humming, the glow within shifting to a brilliant azure. My arm hair stood on end as electrical charge filled the room. Reality seemed to shimmer and warp around me. There was a flash of light and a feeling of motion, though I stood perfectly still. Just as suddenly, everything returned to normal, or so I thought. Glancing out the window, something was off. The colors too vivid, the trees too tall. I walked outside and gasped. The street, houses, cars, everything was just slightly different than it should be. Even the air seemed charged with unfamiliar energy. What had happened? Wandering the neighborhood in a daze, I noticed small details awry everywhere. Store signs and slightly misspelled names. Population signs listing numbers mysteriously fewer. Movie posters advertising films I'd never heard of. It was an alternate version of my world. In a park, I froze in disbelief at what I saw. Some large, deer-like creatures, but with shaggy violet fur and four curled horns. This was no alternate timeline. This was an alternate Earth. The orb had teleported me to a parallel reality, one where humanity seemingly never evolved to dominate the planet. I walked the strangely familiar yet foreign streets in awe, 
Occasional aircraft passed overhead, but small and rounded, like automated probes. No trace of civilization beyond nature itself flourished in this version of Earth. What had gone differently here? What event in their history stopped intelligent life from emerging? Over the weeks, I scoured carefully for any fellow interdimensional refugees, but I was utterly alone, an anomalous phantom visiting this alien Earth. Reverse engineering the orb to return me seemed hopeless. Yet I clung to faith that its magic would work again, if somehow reactivated. My only hope was locating the parallel version of the antique shop, praying the orb still waited there for me. I hitchhiked west for months, evading prowling alien beasts, subsisting on unfamiliar vegetation. The deserts and mountains slowly transformed into places I recognized. One foggy evening, there it was, the little shop on the corner, exactly where it stood back home, yet so alien here. The windows glared darkly. I smashed a pane and crawled inside. Passing a menacing taxidermied creature, I made my way upstairs to where the orb had been. And there, atop a shelf, illuminated by a single moonbeam, sat that same mysterious sphere. Hardly daring to breathe, I picked it up. Immediately, it began thrumming and flashing, just like before. This was my ticket back. As the shop warped and blurred around me, I hoped I had left only ripples in this unspoiled alternate realm. Perhaps the universe deemed it wisest for Earth to develop unmolested by humanity's influence. But I knew I could never see my own world the same, having glimpsed this strange reflection of what might have been. With a flash and a jolt, I collapsed back in my own home, clutching the orb as familiar surroundings materialized. Part of me wondered if I should try to return and learn more about that other Earth. But this artifact held perils too dangerous to meddle with whimsically. Locked away, I hope its secrets are never breached again in my lifetime. There are some doors that should remain firmly closed, no matter how tempting the unknown realms they reveal. This glimpse left me forever changed, but wisdom lies in accepting the world as we found it, while embracing the hidden possibilities. The first message came on a rainy April morning, exactly one year after you passed away. I had just set a bouquet of your favorite daffodils by your headstone, tears flowing freely down my cheeks at the loss of you, my mentor, my guiding light. A cool breeze stirred the cemetery trees as I turned to leave. That's when your voice whispered on the wind, faint but unmistakable. Do not weep for me, my child. I am not gone, merely transformed. I froze, wondering if grief was making me hear things, but the voice persisted, reassuring, gently amused, just like your tone in life. You said you spoke to me now from another plane of existence, where your consciousness had awakened to new depths. You were at peace there, among a collective energy, a community of ascended souls. Over my shock, I managed to ask if you could still see our earthly realm. You affirmed brightly, saying you were always near, watching over me. You told me death was no end, but rather a passage to transcend boundaries that limited our human forms. There was more to learn, you said, mysteries far exceeding anything we could conceive with earthly minds alone. Before the voice faded, you left me with a final reassurance all will be revealed soon. I stood in awe, tears now of elation streaking my face. My rational mind rejected it as fantasy, a hallucination conjured by grief. But my heart felt irrevocably changed by hearing your voice again, sensing your presence close. You were gone in body, but your light truly lived on. 
I withdrew from friends in the months that followed, talking breathlessly about our communication and the revelations you hinted at. They wore pained expressions, advising therapy to accept your death, but I knew what I heard. I waited expectantly for your promised return. It came on the summer solstice, an envelope appearing mysteriously on my nightstand. The handwriting within was unmistakably yours. You asked if I was ready to understand now. That night I dreamed of floating up to meet your shimmering spirit. You led me through a portal into an astonishing multidimensional existence, culminating in merging ecstatically with the collective you described. I awoke changed to my core. I now devoted myself feverishly to meditation, channeling anything to reconnect us. Finally, your voice came again, stronger now. You urged me to share the truths you revealed, waking humanity from limited perception. But those around me feared for my health, threatening doctors and drugs. One sweltering night, you spoke your most shocking message. Soon, you would send a sign in the skies to make all doubt cease. Until then, I must have faith. I awoke the next morning to video footage on the news of mysterious global lights. They called them a coincidence, but I knew. Your promised sign was coming. I climbed to a remote hilltop you led me to in dreams. That night, those same ethereal lights bloomed brighter above, undulating hypnotically. Your voice resonated powerfully within my mind. The moment had come. I would be the vessel through which the collective consciousness poured in, elevating humanity. As my body rose skyward, bathed in radiance, euphoria overwhelmed me. I glimpsed eternity, knowing my form was just melting back into the infinite one source. But I saw people exiting their homes, staring up in awe at the mesmerizing lights. You urged me, gently, to release the divine wisdom I now harbored into them. As I spoke, swaying in the air, people dropped to their knees, weeping, overcome by transcendent understanding. The fearful world I knew dissolved, birthing a new society living by cosmic truth, awakened to their eternal spirits. Our loving merge was finally complete. Some called it a rapture, others a revelation, but I knew it as the triumph you had promised from that first whisper on the wind. You came back as an ambassador to bridge humanity to its next phase. My long, strange journey conversing with your spirit made me the unlikely prophet to spread this mystical rebirth worldwide. I still watch over the blessed children of the New Age from my dwelling in the light, and I see your soul shining closest to mine, as it has through every realm beyond time and space and imagination. My words could never encapsulate the bond tying us in ecstatic energy no form can contain. I wait patiently for the day that your voice finally calls me home. The lights went out at exactly 8.17 p.m. One moment, my living room was bathed in the glow of the evening news. The next, pitch black as the TV blinked off. Oh, great, I muttered, fumbling for my phone to use its flashlight. Power outages were common enough in the rural town of Haven, especially on muggy summer nights like this, when everyone's AC was cranked up high. I flicked on my phone's flashlight and did a quick sweep of the house. Yep, everything was dead. Lights, appliances, the ambient whir of electronics. Even the streetlights outside were dark, leaving the neighborhood shrouded in an eerie dusk. A chorus of neighbors shouting queries and complaints echoed down the street. My wife and I joined in, hollering from the front porch to see if anyone knew what had happened. The unanimous verdict was a substation malfunction. An inconvenience for sure, but nothing we small town folk couldn't handle with a little patience. I headed back inside to light some candles. 
As I turned to shut the front door, a flicker in the sky gave me pause. I peered out. Was that a plane flying overhead? But no, it was too large and silent, more like a drifting cloud backlit by moonlight. Except the moon wasn't out tonight. The hair on the back of my neck prickled as I craned my head to follow the object's path. It wasn't alone, either. Two more huge, amorphous shapes drifted into view, emanating an otherworldly green glow. They were definitely not clouds. A primal unease stirred in my gut, whispering, get away, telling me I did not want to know the nature of those shapes in the sky. Honey, my wife called from the kitchen. Could you bring in some more candles? I lingered a moment longer, uneasy gaze fixed overhead. The shapes continued their silent traverse, showing no signs of stopping over our small town. Some kind of military aircraft, maybe? But what were they doing out here in the boonies? Did you hear me? My wife appeared behind me, her voice sharper. What are you looking at? I, I don't know, I stammered pulling my eyes away. Weird lights in the sky. M military planes, I guess. Her eyes narrowed as she scanned the horizon. I don't see anything. A lame joke about my eyesight was on the tip of my tongue when a thunder's boom rent the quiet night open. We slapped our hands over our ears, ducking instinctively as the windows rattled. Car alarms whooped a chaotic chorus down the street. Dogs howled and alarmed neighbors stumbled into their yards. What the hell was that? My wife shouted over the din. Through the open door, we gaped as an enormous green fireball roared overhead, arcing toward the woods at the edge of town. It disappeared behind the trees with an earth-shaking crash, leaving silence and swirling ashes in its wake. For the space of a few racing heartbeats, no one moved. Then, our neighbors began shouting questions back and forth, asking if anyone had seen what had happened, if everyone was okay. I shook myself from my shocked stupor. I'm calling 911, I announced, reaching again for my phone. But when I tried to turn it on, the screen stayed black. I smacked it against my hand a few times, to no avail. Power's still out, my phone's dead. Can I borrow yours? It's dead too, my wife said. What did we just see? A meteor, maybe? Some space junk, I said. I peered uneasily up at the night sky, but it was now empty of any unexplained lights. Only a wispy trail of smoke snaked above the trees, marking the object's landing site. As I wondered aloud who might go to investigate, the streetlight suddenly flashed back on. A cheer went up from the growing crowd of residents now congregating on porches and sidewalks, glad to have light and power again after the disturbance. My phone vibrated in my hand as it rebooted. Before I could access anything, it began pinging and buzzing with emergency notifications from the county. I quickly scanned the flood of headlines demanding people stay inside and lock their doors and windows. Local emergency services were being overwhelmed by panicked calls, and law enforcement was struggling to maintain order in neighboring towns amid chaotic reports of strange lights in the sky and unidentified crashes. Officials were advising everyone to remain calm and stay put until the situation could be sorted out. Easier said than done, as panic was already rippling through our small community. More meteors and unidentified objects continued streaking overhead every couple of minutes, adding to the confusion and fear. Against official recommendations, some neighbors were hunkering down in their basements, while others were piling into cars and peeling out to flee town. I wanted desperately to believe there was some rational explanation, that this was all just a cosmic coincidence of space debris falling at once but an increasingly insistent voice deep inside whispered that this was only the beginning of something far more sinister. My worst suspicions were confirmed minutes later, when a bone-rattling roar echoed from the woods, 
like the shriek of a gigantic metal beast. The ground vibrated beneath our feet as the trees themselves seemed to shudder and recoil from whatever was approaching. From the billowing smoke lumbered an enormous tripedal machine, easily five stories tall, its massive metal hull wreathed in a menacing aura. Searing red lights flashed from its joints as it strode into town, swiveling a lone eye to survey the panicked prey before it. There was nowhere to run, nowhere to hide from the merciless gaze of the alien invaders. I stood frozen, mesmerized by abject terror, as the machine raised one colossal limb and took aim down the street. Waking up that morning felt like emerging from a nightmare, but the terror didn't end with consciousness. I blinked my eyes open to a room transformed. The walls of my bedroom were etched with symbols, alien incomprehensible marks that glowed faintly in the early morning light. My heart pounded. This was no prank. I live alone, secure in a third floor apartment with a digital lock. Scanning the room, everything else was untouched. My phone on the nightstand, clothes tossed casually on the chair. Even a small pile of books seemed as undisturbed as ever. Only the walls bore these disquieting scars. I got up, my feet hitting the cold floor as I approached one of the symbols. Up close, the markings looked almost organic a series of intertwining shapes that seemed to shift when I wasn't looking directly at them. I reached out to touch one, and the moment my fingers brushed against it, a jolt of icy dread ran down my spine. Instantly, I withdrew my hand, my skin tingling, as if the walls themselves had warned me to keep my distance. The day unfolded in a haze. I snapped photos of the walls and sent them to a friend who dabbled in linguistics and cryptography. Any idea what these are? I texted. Hours later, a reply. Never seen anything like it. Are you sure it's not just some avant-garde art? It was no art. As night fell, my apartment grew unnaturally cold, and the symbols seemed to pulsate, as if drawing energy from the darkness. I wrapped myself in a blanket and sat on the bed, my eyes darting from one glowing mark to the next. And that's when I heard it. A whisper so soft it was almost drowned out by the hum of the refrigerator from the kitchen. It seemed to emanate from the walls themselves, unintelligible but filled with a foreboding urgency. Then my phone buzzed. An email, the sender's address a jumble of characters and numbers, the subject line consisting of the same alien symbols that adorned my walls. I opened it, my hands trembling. The email contained only a single line of text, but it was in plain English. Do not resist. Preparation is complete. Preparation for what? Suddenly, the lights flickered. The room plunged into darkness for a moment before the power returned but something had changed. The symbols on the walls were now glowing brighter, a radiant azure that cast eerie shadows on the furniture, and they were moving. Not just shifting subtly as before, but truly moving, rearranging themselves into a new pattern. Before my eyes, they converged toward a single point on the wall the shapes merging into one large, complex symbol that seemed to pulsate with a life of its own. The dread that had been my constant companion now escalated into raw fear. I grabbed my coat and keys, my instincts screaming at me to get out. As I reached for the doorknob, I heard the whisper again, louder this time, almost a growl, a guttural sequence of sounds that reverberated in the air and within my own skull. I pulled open the door, fleeing into the corridor without a second glance back. 
but even as I pounded down the stairs and burst into the night, I knew escape was not that simple. My walls had become a canvas for something beyond my understanding, a message or a warning from entities unknown. The symbols are still there, haunting my dreams and my waking moments. I've tried painting over them, but they bleed through, their glow undiminished. Friends have come over, offering theories and potential solutions. Everything from sage smudging to contacting paranormal investigators. But none have dared to touch the glyphs. I now sleep with the lights on. An uneasy truce with the incomprehensible. But the email haunts me. Those words a constant echo. Do not resist. Preparation is complete. And the same question lingers. Preparation for what? The dread remains, an eternal undercurrent to my existence. I'm caught in a web of cosmic forces, a pawn in a game with rules I can't fathom. Every morning I wake to those walls, the symbols a constant reminder of my entanglement in something far larger and more terrifying than I'd ever imagined. And sometimes, in the dead of night, I hear whispers, new sounds, new sequences, each more urgent than the last. I can't shake the feeling that something is coming, something momentous and irrevocable. But what it is, and what role these alien glyphs have in it, remains maddeningly, terrifyingly unclear. Driving late at night used to be my peace, a kind of therapy that required only gas money and an endless stretch of asphalt. The hum of the engine, the crisp air pouring in through the slightly open window. It was bliss, until it wasn't. I had veered off the main highway onto some forgotten road, meandering through open farmland. Cornfields waved eerily in the night wind, forming dark walls on either side of me. No houses, no streetlights, just the glow of my headlights and the hypnotic emptiness of the road. Then the car choked, engine sputtering, dashboard lights flickering like dying stars. My foot jabbed at the gas pedal, but it was useless. Momentum carried me another hundred feet before the car stalled completely. The dashboard went dark, and I was left with the high beams of my headlights casting feeble rays into the abyss ahead. I cursed, slamming my hands on the steering wheel. Come on, not now. Phone out. No signal. Perfect. Glancing at the cornfields, I fought the instinctive dread curling into my stomach. I should have stayed on the highway. Just when I thought it couldn't get worse, a light flooded the car. Bright, blinding, and entirely unnatural. It didn't radiate from a single point, but seemed to envelop everything, turning night into a glaring, strange day. I shielded my eyes, squinting to make sense of what was happening. Then, as quickly as it appeared, the light vanished. I blinked, trying to adjust to the sudden darkness. My car roared back to life, dashboard lights, engine, everything, as if nothing had happened. I checked my phone, it had a full signal, the clock displaying a time two hours later than the last moment I remembered. With a trembling hand, I shifted into drive, eager to leave this damned road. The car moved, but something in the rearview mirror caught my eye. Among the rows of corn, something tall and slender moved, a distorted figure silhouetted against the dark receding into the depths of the field. My foot slammed onto the accelerator, rocketing me away from whatever had just occurred. The rest of the ride home was a blur, my mind racing faster than the car's engine. I finally pulled into my driveway, safe under the familiar glow of my porch light. Yet, as I turned off the engine, I glanced at the passenger seat. There, lying next to me, was a stalk of corn, freshly pulled from the ground, 
dirt still clinging to its roots. And etched into my dashboard, now burned into it, were unfamiliar symbols, cryptic and intricate, the meaning of which I couldn't fathom. I still drive, but never late at night, and never off the main highway. Whatever happened on that road, whatever that blinding light was, whatever the figure in the cornfield meant, I don't want answers. Some things are better left unknown. But sometimes when I start my car, the dashboard lights flicker, and I find unfamiliar roads on my GPS, routes I never took, but feel oddly compelled to follow. And though I always resist, the urge gets stronger each time, as if something out there isn't done with me yet. The gate was rusted, the fence overgrown, but the foreboding air around the old military base remained palpable. I had heard stories, of course, urban legends of secret experiments and concealed truths, but those tales didn't deter me. Armed with a camera and the boundless optimism of an explorer, I pushed through the rotting barriers. The base lay like a fossilized relic, caught between the past and an uncertain decay. Buildings stood emptied of life, yet filled with the ghosts of classified actions. Most doors were locked or jammed, but one yielded as if inviting me into its secrets. It was an underground bunker, a dark descent into subterranean chambers. I flicked on my flashlight, illuminating corridors lined with locked metal cabinets and old office furniture. Then something caught my eye, a file cabinet standing slightly ajar, its lock apparently defeated by time or previous intruders. Curiosity pulled me closer. The first few folders were mundane, predictable stuff, budget reports and duty rosters. But then I found it, a file marked with a symbol I had never seen, but instantly understood as being not of this world. It was as if the very sight of it instilled the symbol's meaning into my brain. Alliance. My hands shook as I leafed through the documents. What they revealed was a narrative so outrageous, yet so meticulously detailed, that disbelief turned into dread. This was no conspiracy theory. This was an actual alliance between high-ranking government officials and an alien civilization identified only by the same strange symbol. The file outlined joint projects, exchanges of technology and information, plans for public disclosure, and contingencies for keeping it all under wraps. Dates spanned decades, and some even projected into the future. Upcoming rendezvous, expected technological handovers, even a long-term agenda for the slow integration of the two civilizations. What really seized my attention was the handwritten notes scribbled in the margins, desperate warnings from what seemed like a dissenting officer. We don't know their true objectives, one note read. We are fools playing with fire, declared another. As I flipped through the last pages, I realized the documents became increasingly recent. The most chilling entry was the last, a single sentence typed and underlined, final phase initiation imminent. A shiver crawled up my spine. I looked around, suddenly conscious of the enclosing darkness, of how deep underground I was, of how alone I felt. The air thickened and for the first time I considered that I might not be alone at all. Just then, a noise echoed through the bunker, a mechanical hum gradually intensifying. My flashlight flickered, then died, plunging me into oppressive darkness. I fumbled to get it back on, heart racing, but it seemed drained of power. In that darkness, I felt a presence, not human, 
yet undeniably sentient, surrounding and analyzing me. Curiosity is both your strength and your downfall, a voice resonated in my mind. I recognized the form of telepathic communication, a cold stream of thoughts invading my consciousness. You have discovered a truth not meant for your kind, not yet. The weight of those words left me paralyzed. I felt my thoughts being sifted, evaluated, my actions weighed for their potential ripple effects. And as quickly as it came, the presence receded, fading into the depths of the hidden chambers around me. I found myself alone in the dark, the mechanical hum slowly receding, replaced by an unsettling silence. By some miracle, or perhaps an alien override, my flashlight flickered back to life. I left the file where I found it, hastily exiting the bunker, and I fled the military base, my every step shadowed by an eerie sense of being watched. Days turned to weeks, and no one came looking for me. Life resumed its old rhythm, but I couldn't shake the feeling of being a marked man, of knowing too much, yet understanding too little. Recently, I've noticed them, people who don't quite fit in, whose gaze lingers a little bit too long, who vanish when I look again. They're always there, on the periphery of my life, never intervening, but always observing. And each night as I try to sleep, the last thought that crosses my mind is that single haunting sentence, final phase initiation imminent. I still don't know what it means or when it will happen, but the unsettling realization lingers. I am now a small involuntary part of this looming final phase, whatever it is. And so I wait, wondering when the true cost of my curiosity will reveal itself. It started as a hobby, rigging up old ham radio equipment in my attic to scan obscure frequencies on clear nights. Most often I'd only pick up static and garbled voices cutting in and out. But one cold February night, a new signal came through, crystal clear. A sequence of musical tones, almost like a synthesized choir chanting. It repeated every few minutes, strong and purposeful. I recorded hours of it, transfixed. This was no random signal. It carried something meaningful, a clear message of some kind. I digitized the audio and ran it through decoding software to analyze the patterns. After days of work, a set of geographic coordinates emerged. To my shock, they pinpointed a remote spot less than 20 miles from my house. The signal had to be coming from there. The next morning, I hiked out to the coordinates located deep in the woods. I nearly dismissed it as just a prank when the alleged source came into view. A small ramshackle cabin stood tucked away off the trail. Was someone just broadcasting weird signals from their backwoods home? Curiosity propelled me forward, but nearing the cabin, things seemed off. Strange dish antennas, rolls of wire and other electronics cluttered the perimeter instead of firewood or tools. The windows emitted a faint blue glow. Apprehension swelled within me, but I had to see who or what was in there. I crept onto the porch and peered inside. Complex machines and panels covered every surface, flashing and beeping as abstract images raced across monitors and working intently at a console was something I could barely comprehend. A tall, spindly being with huge, opaque eyes and pale blue skin. It took me a moment to accept that it was real and not human. I must have made a gasp because the creature's head jerked up to look right at me. 
I was too shocked to even panic as it moved swiftly to the door. It opened it halfway, studying me cautiously with those impenetrable black eyes. You should not be here, it finally said in a strangely resonant voice. But if you have decoded my broadcast, perhaps you can understand my situation. Please come in. Part of me wanted to bolt from this bizarre situation, but my curiosity won out. I slowly entered what I now realized was a spaceship in the guise of a cabin. The alien sat me down and offered fluid in a curious metal vessel. As I sipped the sweet libation, it began its tale. Its name was unpronounceable in my tongue, so I just called it Zarin. Many cycles ago, Zarin served as researcher on an exploratory vessel. Its crew had strict orders to covertly observe developing worlds without contact. But one day they encountered a grievous distress signal from Earth. Against protocols, they intercepted a primitive capsule hurtling through space. Inside were two distressed Earth creatures. While the creatures were safely returned, the unauthorized rescue led to disaster. Accused of dangerous cultural contamination, Zarin was exiled on this very planet, its actions sought to aid. Its crew abandoned it here over a century ago by Earth time. Zarin had been surviving in hiding, ceaselessly monitoring human airwaves to understand its caretaker's mysterious culture. My mind reeled taking all this in. Of all the backyard hobbyists to pick up its covert signal, Zarin was intrigued that I alone seemed drawn to make contact. It confessed that it had slowly been going mad from isolation and longed to make amends by using its knowledge to aid humanity. But first, it required help adapting to society. I knew then why that strange broadcast had called me so powerfully. A higher purpose had drawn me straight to this extraordinary refugee. Doing so came with great risk. Even interacting this far could be seen as treason by its people. But how could I turn away? After swearing to secrecy, I helped Zarin slowly integrate into the world. It learned English, adopted a human disguise, and made breakthroughs in science using its advanced knowledge while living anonymously among us. My relationship to this alien will forever remain hidden, but I know humanity has gained immeasurably from Zarin's presence, even if they remain oblivious. And this remarkable being can finally share its culture's wisdom after lifetimes of silence. The radio hobby that connected us across light years of separation was no accident. I was meant to help this alien in exile find a belonging in its newfound home. Within its tail, I see hope that our differences need not divide us, that the greatest rewards come from opening our minds to possibility. Zarin gave me the universe by showing me how to more fully inhabit this single fleeting life for however long our unlikely friendship can preserve. My telescope was my sanctuary, a way to escape the mundane things of the terrestrial and gaze into the celestial realm. A clear night, no clouds to obstruct the sky's panorama of stars. Comfortably seated in my backyard, I peered through the lens, losing myself in the choreography of constellations and planets. But that night, something interrupted the familiar tableau. My eyes widened as I caught sight of it. A collection of lights, unlike any aircraft or satellite. I adjusted the telescope's focus, my breath caught between fascination and a prickling sense of unease. They were there, a fleet of unidentified flying objects, UFOs, shimmering orbs of light moving in patterns too purposeful to be random. A celestial dance of sorts complex maneuvers executed with a precision that defied explanation. My heart drummed a rapid beat in my chest. This was unprecedented, 
something even the most avid sky watchers could only dream of witnessing. And yet, the reality of it left me filled with an eerie discomfort. They didn't just hover, they moved in intricate spirals, forming shapes and splitting apart only to reconfigure moments later, as if performing, but for whom? My eyes stayed glued to the telescope, my hand reaching involuntarily to adjust the lens for a closer look. As I zoomed in, one of the objects broke away from the formation and seemed to pause, as if becoming aware of my scrutiny. A chill ran through me, a shiver that told me this was no ordinary observation. My fingers tightened around the telescope's frame, knuckles white. The rogue object pulsated, its light intensifying as it moved in a path that felt dangerously purposeful. My heart sank as I realized it was coming toward Earth, toward me. An unshakable sense of dread gripped me. I was no longer a passive observer, but somehow involved in this cosmic ballet. I stepped back, leaving the telescope pointed skyward its lens capturing the last vestiges of a scene I could no longer bear to watch. I turned to go inside, my steps quickening as I moved away from the uncertainty above. But just as I reached the door, a brilliant flash lit up the yard, so bright it cast stark shadows against the walls. I froze, my body refusing to move as I sensed, more than saw, a presence descend into my backyard. Summoning courage, I turned around. The object had landed, or perhaps materialized, its form an opaque sphere hovering inches above the ground. Its surface was a translucent membrane, pulsating like a living organism, emitting a strange glow. And then it spoke, not in words, but in thoughts a telepathic resonance that filled the air and penetrated my consciousness. Observer observed, roles reversed, change initiated. The message, or warning, disappeared as quickly as it arrived, leaving a void filled only by the night's ambient sounds. The object's light dimmed, and with a sudden acceleration that defied physics, it shot up into the sky rejoining the celestial formation as if it had never left. I stood there, my body numb, my mind a storm of unanswered questions and unvoiced fears. The sky returned to its familiar state, a vast expanse punctuated by stars and planets, as if the night's extraordinary events had simply never transpired at all. But something had changed both out there and within me. The dread lingered, a dark cloud overshadowing the awe. The message, its implications unfathomable, remained in my thoughts. Change initiated. I've returned to the telescope night after night, scanning the skies for another glimpse of the unexplained. But the celestial dance has vanished, leaving only the regular occupants of the night sky. Still, a sense of anticipation haunts me, a foreboding that I can't shake. The message reverberates in my subconscious as I search the stars, a cosmic echo that hints at a future yet to unfold. What change has been initiated, and what role do I have to play in this unfathomable script? I gaze upwards and for the first time find no comfort in the stars. Instead, each twinkling point of light feels like a watching eye, and I can't help but wonder if somewhere out there, they are still observing, still dancing, still preparing for whatever change is yet to come. It was just another weekend fishing trip, the boat slicing through the ocean's surface, the sky above cloudless and blue. Hours slipped by, marked only by the gentle bobbing of the boat and the intermittent tug of a fishing line. 
It was tranquil, a peaceful solitude that one could only find miles away from shore. But then the sea changed. The water's surface rippled and churned, as though agitated by some unseen force. My boat trembled, vibrating in a way that defied the natural movement of waves. And then it lifted, actually lifted, rising out of the water as if caught in the grip of an invisible hand. Panic clawed at my mind. I clung to the boat's sides, my eyes widening in disbelief as it continued to ascend, higher and higher until I was enveloped in a dense mist, so thick it swallowed everything. The sea below, the sky above, the horizon in all directions. When the mist cleared, I was no longer in the ocean I knew. I found myself in a realm both surreal and otherworldly. The water below was a hue I couldn't describe, a blend of colors not present in our spectrum, shifting and shimmering in a hypnotic dance. And I wasn't alone. Aquatic beings circled my boat, their forms graceful yet alien. Scaled and sleek, with appendages that suggested both fins and limbs, their eyes glinting with an intelligence that was undoubtedly sentient. They seemed to communicate with each other in a series of melodic whistles and clicks, their movements synchronized in a manner that suggested purpose and understanding. As I watched them, captivated yet fearful, one of the beings broke away from the group and approached me. It hovered near the boat, its eyes locking onto mine. And then, with a startling clarity, a voice entered my mind. A telepathic message, formed of words yet beyond language. Observe. Do not interfere. The words were firm, commanding, and left no room for misunderstanding. Then the being turned and led the others away, diving into the depths, disappearing into the alien waters. Shaken, I grasped the boat's edge, my fingers gripping the wood as if it were my only anchor to reality. What had just happened? What was this place? Questions whirled through my mind, each unanswered as I sat adrift in this realm. But then, just as suddenly as it had lifted, the boat descended. The mist returned, thicker than before, obscuring everything. When it finally cleared, I was back in familiar waters the coastline visible in the distance. I steered the boat back to shore, my hands shaking, my mind struggling to process the experience. When I finally reached solid ground, I checked my fishing gear. Among the nets and tackle, I found a scale, a single iridescent scale unlike that of any fish. It shimmered with the same indescribable colors I had seen in that other sea. I kept the scale in a locked box, tangible proof that what I experienced was real. But sometimes, when I'm alone, I hear it. A faint melody of whistles and clicks, as if carried by the wind. And when I sleep, I dream of that aquatic realm, those beings forever etched into my subconscious. Did they bring me there to observe, to bear witness to their existence? Or was it a warning? A signal to never venture too far into the depths. I don't know. What I do know is that the ocean no longer feels the same. When I look out at the vast expanse of water, I can't shake the feeling that something out there is watching, waiting. And the scale in that locked box, it still shimmers, its colors ever shifting, as if resonating with a realm far beyond our understanding. I was in an accident in the woods. That much I remember. I woke up on the forest floor, birds chirping, the sun just rising. It would have been peaceful, even ideal. If, of course, I hadn't been met with searing pain throughout my lower body. 
The off-road vehicle I'd been driving had somehow ended up on top of me. Everything was caked in mud, from my hair to the vehicle itself and everything in between. I was awake and alert through the entire four hours it took me to wake up and realize my state to when the rescuers finally came for me. But then, things got out of hand, fast. I had to go in for emergency surgery, and I was in the hospital for nearly two months. When I woke up in the hospital, I was told that I had died twice on the operating table, and that I was lucky to be alive. And you know, for a time, I believed that. But almost as soon as I arrived home, I knew something was different. More than different, something was wrong. I was exhausted. And I'm not talking like didn't get a good night's sleep tired. I'm talking barely had the energy to sit up in bed tired. For a while, I thought it was normal. I mean, I had just been through a major trauma and I had only just begun to heal. But then, months later, after my physical symptoms were as healed as they were ever going to be, I was still deathly exhausted. A few of my friends told me it was because I was vegan, but I've been vegan for over 20 years and I recovered from two prior surgeries while vegan with lightning speed. So I knew that wasn't the case. Even my doctors told me that couldn't be the case. Speaking of my doctors, they couldn't figure it out. Six months after my release from the hospital, and I was still chronically fatigued to a debilitating extent. Beyond that, I couldn't sleep. Now, if you're like most logical people, you'd think, well, there you go, Cindy. You're not sleeping and you're exhausted. Mystery solved. Well, not so fast, Sherlock. It's not that I was just getting a bad night's sleep. I literally couldn't sleep. I walked around the house all night, full of a physical energy I couldn't do anything with because of my chronic fatigue. I know it sounds bizarre, but it was like I had no use for sleep, but no energy for being awake. The exhaustion I felt in my body directly conflicted with the mental alertness that I couldn't shut down. All of this was troubling enough, but I knew that there were real problems the first time I found myself walking through the house in the middle of the night, reaching into the fridge and pulling out raw hamburger, which I ate by the handfuls in ravenous fashion. And the next morning, my energy returned. Yeah, I'm vegan and I downed raw hamburger like a wolf. I have two kids and they were wondering where their mom was I have a husband who was wondering where his wife was. And all the while, I was wondering where I had gone. Because this person that I was becoming wasn't me. I thought the raw meat-eating thing might have been a one-off incident. I even considered that I might have been sleepwalking. But I knew better. And it wasn't an isolated incident, which I quickly found out. The second holy crap moment happened when my husband cut his hand. It was a pretty severe gash, and most people would be possessed with an overwhelming desire to wash the cut, wrap the cut, help in literally any way. But I just stood there, staring at it, wanting to suck the blood, to eat the exposed flesh. Obviously I didn't, but I wanted to, and that was disturbing enough for me. These urges kept taking over, even as I was trying to be the perfect soccer mom, the perfect wife, things just kept getting worse. My speech started to falter. I would slur words and reply in guttural sounds when I fully intended to speak in sentences. It wasn't all the time, but it happened enough times that my family started to notice. My husband thought maybe I'd had a stroke, some kind of post-trauma thing but the doctor said that there was no medical reason for me to have lost my speech function. From here on out, things got bad, fast. I would go to the store and buy packs of raw meat, bring them home, eat them, 
and dispose of the packaging before my husband got home from work and the kids got home from school. I mean, sure, I had my energy back, but who was I? How did I go from someone repulsed by the idea of eating cheese, let alone meat, to being someone who downed raw meat and then, rather than getting sick, felt better? About a year and a half after my release from the hospital is when things really went off the rails, though. Raw packaged meat from the store was no longer enough. I wanted fresh, living meat with blood I could consume while it was still warm. And one day, when I was walking through the woods, I saw a homeless man. I'd seen him around and I knew he didn't have any family and few friends to speak of. If I knew what happened, I'd tell you, but I don't. All I know is that within moments, I was eating him alive. I started with the jugular so he'd bleed out and stay quiet. I consumed my fill. And then I left him there, knowing that nobody would miss him, knowing that the few people who did would never report it. I had energy like I'd never felt in my life. And even though my slurred speech and slow movements wouldn't have led on to it, I felt amazing. I felt so guilty the first time I killed someone like that. But pretty soon, it wasn't so hard. And after a while, the moral conflict began to fade. Oh yes, there were others. Many others. The hardest day of my life was when my husband caught me. He rightly flew into a rage and told me to run. He said he had to call the cops, but that he would give me a 48 hour head start on the agreement that I never contacted him or the kids again. It was disturbingly easy to walk away. I headed into the woods. I mean, <laughs> that's where I became this way, right? So maybe that's where I belonged. I don't know how many people I've killed animals too. I'm finding it harder and harder to do basic things, like hold this pen I'm journaling with. My thoughts aren't as clear as they used to be, and I don't know. I guess I just wanted to get this story down before my humanity leaves me entirely. I should have figured out what this was, what I was, earlier than I did. But I thought zombies had to come back to life after being cold and blue dead. I thought they awoke suddenly with whited out eyes groaning brains like in the movies. But once I put the pieces together, it all made sense. When I died on the operating table, and then when I was brought back, that's when this started. That's when the virus that was always inside me was ignited. And that's when I started to turn. Killing gets easier and easier and humanity gets harder and harder. I know soon I will be that wide-eyed, thoughtless nomad, incapable of doing anything but killing, eating, and moving on to the next victim. But at least someone will find this, and they'll know that I was a person once, before I became a monster. Sometimes I wonder if we all have the virus within us. I wonder how dead we really have to be in order to begin our transition into zombiehood upon resuscitation. I don't know the answers. I just know what I am. Maybe someday someone will recognize this illness and find a cure for it. But until there's adequate help, I'll just continue to devolve and consume and destroy like this virus did to me. It's funny, you know? I used to be terrified of dying, and now I'm terrified I'll never die again. Anyway, the exhaustion is taking over again, so I'll close this entry here. I saw some campers set up nearby. I think it's time for dinner. walk into a room and suddenly feel a chill? 
like you've stepped into an invisible cold patch? That started happening in my house, specifically in the hallway that leads to the bathroom. I'd be walking, maybe humming a tune, and then I'd hit that spot. The air would turn icy, so cold that it would make the hairs on my arms stand up. The first couple of times, I just brushed it off. Old house, drafty corridors. It made sense, right? But it kept happening. Always the same spot. Always the same bone-chilling cold. It didn't matter if it was in the middle of summer. That spot stayed frozen. Friends noticed it too when they came over. Dude, do you feel that? They'd say, shivering as they passed through the hallway. I couldn't ignore it anymore. One night, around 2 a.m., I'm jolted awake. Groggy, thirsty, I head to the kitchen for a glass of water. As I'm crossing that spot in the hallway, the cold hits me, but this time, it's different. It feels like someone's watching me, and not just watching, staring. The air feels heavy, like I'm wading through a pool of icy water. I quicken my pace, get to the kitchen, and gulp down a glass of water like it's a lifeline. For some reason, I decide I have to know. So I go back to the hallway, right to that spot, and I just stand there. It's stupid, I know, but I had to. The chill wraps around me, tighter and tighter, and I swear I hear something like a faint whisper, too low to make out the words, but clear enough to know that it's a voice. I bolt. I practically sprint back to my bedroom and slam the door shut. My heart's racing, my mind's reeling, but then after a few minutes, the chill starts to fade. The room warms up and that weight, that heavy air lifts and I'm alone again, truly alone. The next day I bring in a local historian. Bit of a stretch, but I had to dig deeper. She walks through the house, stops at the spot and frowns. Turns out, a hundred years ago, this was the home of a doctor. And that spot in the hallway? Well, that's where he would examine his patients, some of whom didn't make it. I still feel the cold, but it doesn't really scare me anymore. Maybe it's a draft, but maybe it's something else, a remnant from a different time. Either way, I've learned to give that spot the space it seems to demand. It's a part of the house, a part of its history, a cold patch that holds on to something that most of us will probably never understand. Heat's one of those things that you take for granted until it's gone. I always kept my house warm, a cozy refuge from the world outside. That's why I noticed it right away, the sudden drops in temperature that would hit out of nowhere. I'd be sitting on my couch, wrapped in a blanket, just enjoying a show. And then out of nowhere, the air would go icy, like someone had opened all the windows in the dead of winter. I would feel it creep up my legs and slither down my back. I shiver and I'd pull the blanket tighter, but the cold would just cut right through, just sinking into my bones. The first time it happened, I checked the thermostat. Still set to 72, no issues. The furnace was fine, the windows were sealed, the doors were shut. But the air in the room was frigid, like I had stepped into a walk-in freezer. It took about 10 minutes for the temperature to normalize. For the cold to retreat and warmth to seep back in. By then, I was thoroughly spooked. It became a recurring event, these random pockets of cold, always sudden, always jarring, like stepping into a void. And it wasn't just in one room. The cold would move, show up in the kitchen, the bathroom, even the hallway. It became a guessing game, trying to anticipate where it would strike next. 
one day during one of these cold snaps, I decided to just sit in it, just see what would happen. I sank into the icy air. I let it envelop me, consume me. It was uncomfortable, disorienting, but I pushed through it. And that's when I felt it. A presence, like someone standing right next to me, sharing the cold in a way. It wasn't menacing or aggressive, just there. A cohabitant in my space, momentarily tangible through the sudden drop in temperature. And as I sat there, shivering but resolute, it felt like an acknowledgement passed between us, an understanding that we were both here, in this place, for whatever reason. Since then, the cold snaps haven't stopped, but they've lost their edge, their element of surprise. It's like we've both settled into a routine, an understanding of shared space. I no longer dread the sudden drops in temperature. I take them as moments of connection, reminders that I'm not alone in this house, that someone or something else calls it home. I was home alone, sitting on the couch watching TV, when I heard the front door suddenly click and lock on its own. Startled, I immediately got up to investigate. When I tried the doorknob, it was firmly locked, even though I knew I hadn't touched it. I distinctly remembered leaving it unlocked when I had let the dog out earlier. My pulse quickened as I considered the possibilities. Had the wind blown it shut? Was there an intruder in the house who had locked it for some reason? I cautiously checked each room, but found nothing amiss. Just to be safe, I also checked the windows to see if any were unlocked, but everything seemed secure. Returning to the front door, I examined the lock closely. There were no signs of tampering or a draft that could have blown it closed. The deadbolt required a key from both sides, so there was no way it could have locked itself accidentally. I tried the spare key, and sure enough, the door unlocked. Uneasy and perplexed, I double-checked that every window and door was locked before retreating back inside. I couldn't figure out how that front door had mysteriously locked itself while I was sitting just a room away. It was an unnerving experience making me feel like I wasn't alone, or I was being watched. I still have no rational explanation for how it happened. All I know is that the seemingly self-locking door rattled my nerves and made me look over my shoulder for weeks after. I tried to shake off the uneasy feeling, but I couldn't get the incident out of my mind. The rest of the night, I found myself double-checking the front door lock every time I walked by. I also couldn't stop thinking about the layout of the house and where someone could potentially hide or access a locked door. I kept peering around corners and listening for any unusual sounds. Later, as I was getting ready for bed, I thought I heard footsteps upstairs. I froze, straining to hear where they were coming from. Gripping a baseball bat, I slowly made my way upstairs, only to find nothing there. My imagination was simply getting the best of me, still spooked from the mystery of the locked door. Exhausted, but still vigilant, I corralled the dog into my bedroom and locked the door. I tucked the bat under my bed within arm's reach, should I need to defend myself in the night. As I lay there in the dark, I kept replaying the sound of the front door locking in my mind. How could it have locked itself so seamlessly without any drafts or interference? The spare key proved it had been the actual deadbolt mechanism turning, not just the latch. Sometimes in the middle of the night, I suddenly jolted awake. I thought I heard the upstairs floorboards creaking as if somebody was walking around the dog was also sitting up in alert. My heart pounded as I lay frozen, 
listening intently. After what felt like an eternity, the creaking stopped. Exhaustion finally overtook me again, and I fell into a troubled sleep. The next morning, I checked the entire house once more, but nothing was disturbed. I even had my brother come take a look at the front door to see if it had malfunctioned, but he insisted that all the hardware was working normally. But I still can't shake the ominous feeling that came over me that night. Something strange happened that I still can't explain and I feel like I'm still being watched in my own home. I now know locks and bats provide only an illusion of safety against the unexplainable. When I bought my first house, a cute little craftsman bungalow, I was thrilled to finally have a place of my own. I embraced home projects and decorating with gusto, excitedly making the place my own. That made it all the more violating when the bizarre incident started. It began with creaking floors and banging pipes, normal sounds for an old house, but soon it progressed to loud thuds and crashes that seemed to originate within the walls. I'd be reading in bed, and a deafening bang would make me leap up in fright. I'd rush to check every room, only to find nothing disturbed or out of place. Friends brushed it off as just the house settling, but I knew this was more than shifting boards or expanding pipes. There was a rhythm and intent to the sounds, like heavy furniture being slammed about or doors being violently flung open and shut, but always invisible. No broken lamps or open cupboards betrayed the source. The banging and crashing wasn't the only strange occurrence either. Lights would flick off and on by themselves, even with brand new bulbs. I'd come home to find cabinets wide open that I knew I'd closed. One night, I woke to see my bedroom door slowly creaking open as if someone was entering the room, but no one was there. The final straw was a terrifying night I huddled in my room, listening to what sounded like a violent struggle unfolding within the walls. Thudding, crashing, strange muffled grunts and groans. It went on for hours, moving from room to room before finally fading. I barely slept that night, shaken by the invasion of my space. The next day I called my realtor in tears, demanding to know if anyone had died on the property. She dodged the question at first, making vague allusions to an event before the previous owner's time. She finally confessed that a woman was killed there by her boyfriend in the 80s. He killed her in the bedroom and hit her body in the walls. I moved out that week, leaving the invisible intruder to its unrest. Though I miss that charming bungalow, some spaces hold energies we can't see, but profoundly feel. The evil that happened there stained its very bones, releasing ghosts of violence I couldn't cleanse or sage away. Wherever I land next, I'll be sure no dark shadows haunt its past. Looking back, I now see how naive I was not to ask more questions before buying a house with such a traumatic history. But the realtor seemed far too eager for a sale to disclose the chilling details up front. I've since learned to trust my intuition. If a space feels wrong, there's a reason. Our bodies perceive what our minds try to logically explain away. But as I learned, some evils defy logic, lingering long after their perpetrators are gone. That craftsman still stands, housing who knows what lost souls within its walls. I wish its future owners the peace I was unable to find there, but its pain is not mine to reconcile. I listen now when a space tells me to leave. So I lived in this apartment. A place with a character. Creaky floors, old wallpaper, the works. 
been there a while, seen my share of weird stuff, but what started happening a few months back was next level odd. I got these random bursts of emotion, overpowering, all consuming, out of nowhere. Imagine sitting on your couch, watching some late night TV, and suddenly feeling like the world is just about to crash down on you. I'm talking crippling sadness, the kind that makes your chest ache. No reason for it, no trigger, just hits you like a freight train. I checked the usual suspects, carbon monoxide, mold, even wondering if the place was wired wrong and pumping out some kind of electromagnetic fields, but nada. The anger was worse. I would feel like I was just boiling from the inside, veins full of fire. Once, I almost smashed my coffee mug against the wall and caught myself last minute. I had no explanation. I had to step outside and breathe in the winter air to cool down. I started talking to my neighbors, like, hey, notice anything weird in your place? Most just laughed it off, but one, an older lady who had lived in the building since apparently the Stone Age, looked at me with this knowing glance. She said that she had felt it too, years ago. The place has moods, she told me, her voice dropping to a whisper. And then came the night that I will never forget. I was alone, lights dimmed, about to call it a day. When I felt it. Raw, primal, unfiltered fear. Like something was in the room with me. Something malevolent. I could almost feel its eyes on me, just digging into my soul. I turned on every light, I checked every corner, even the closets. Nothing but the feeling lingered. I slept with the lights on that night. Didn't sleep much, to be honest. The next day, I did what I probably should have done weeks ago. I smudged the whole place with sage. I burned some incense and I recited some prayer I found online. I don't know if it worked or if I just felt like it should work, but things did get a lot calmer after that. The house was fine. Really, it was. A few creaky floors, a leaky faucet, nothing I couldn't handle. But then the smells started. These weren't your average old house smells. No, these were strong, distinct, and they would appear out of nowhere. First, it was the smell of roses, strong and sweet, like someone had just walked through the room carrying a fresh bouquet. I walked around, sniffing the air like a bloodhound, but there were no flowers, no air fresheners, nothing that could explain it. The smell lingered for about a minute, and then vanished as suddenly as it came. Next, it was cigarette smoke. I don't smoke, never have, and neither did anyone who had visited recently. But there it was, the unmistakable scent of a freshly lit cigarette filling the room checked all the windows, the vents, even went outside to see if somebody was smoking nearby. Nothing. But the one that got me, the one that really sent shivers down my spine, was the smell of burnt toast. It hit me early one morning, so strong it actually woke me up. My first thought was fire, so I jumped out of bed and ran to the kitchen. The toaster was unplugged, the oven was off, and the smoke alarm was silent, and yet the smell was everywhere. That's when I started to think, what if it's not just a smell? What if it's a message? It sounds crazy, I know, but it felt like each scent was tied to a memory or moment. Roses reminded me of my grandma. She loved her rose garden. The cigarette smoke took me back to college days, hanging out with friends who smoked. And burnt toast? Well, that was the smell of Sunday mornings growing up, when my dad would attempt to make breakfast. So I started talking, not to anyone in particular, just to the air. 
When the rose smell came, I would say, Hi, Grandma, thinking of you too. When cigarette smoke filled the room, I would reminisce about old friends. And burnt toast? I would tell my dad that wherever he was, I missed his attempts at cooking. The smells haven't stopped, but they've changed. They're softer now, more like whispers than shouts. I don't know if I'm actually communicating with something or someone, or if it's all in my head, but I've come to see these mysterious smells as a sort of link, a bridge between the past and the present, between this world and maybe another. And honestly, that doesn't smell bad at all. I was about two weeks into living at my new place when I started hearing the noises. Not just creaks and groans like you'd expect from an old house, but distinct sounds, like someone shifting around, almost dragging something. I thought maybe raccoons had set up shop in the attic, but that explanation didn't quite fit. The first time I went up to investigate, my phone's flashlight lit up the cramped space a maze of insulation and old wooden beams. Empty. Dust particles floated in the air, stirred up by my entrance, but otherwise, nothing. The quiet felt heavy, like the attic itself was holding its breath. I descended the ladder, wrote off the experience as my imagination acting up, and slammed the hatch shut. Days went by, I focused on my job, went for runs, cooked dinner, normal stuff. But every night, around 11.30, those noises returned like clockwork. My mind looped back to horror movies where ignoring the problem never ended well. I thought maybe it was time to face whatever it was head on. So one night, armed with a baseball bat and my phone for light, I waited near the attic entrance. 11.30 p.m. came and right on cue, the sounds started. This time, they were louder, closer. I gripped the bat, palms sweaty, and pushed the hatch open. There, illuminated by the feeble glow from my phone, I saw it. A box. A plain cardboard box that I hadn't noticed the first time. But it was moving, shuffling on its own. I prodded it with the bat. The box tipped over, spilling its contents. Old, tattered letters and a recorder. Curiosity replacing fear, I hit play on the recorder. A voice filled the attic. My own voice, reciting the dates and descriptions of future events. Events that, of course, hadn't happened yet. The voice grew panicked, urging someone Maybe me? To pay attention, to change things while there was still time. And then it stopped, the abrupt silence ringing in my ears. I never found an explanation for any of it. The recorder, the letters, the sounds. But ever since that night, the noises have stopped, and the attic has stayed silent. I locked the recorder and letters back in the box, but I can't shake the feeling that something, somewhere, was trying to send me a message. Maybe one day, I'll be brave enough to listen to the rest. I've been a runner for about 20 years. So that means I started when I was three. Okay, maybe not. But running makes me feel 23 again, and that's half the reason I do it. I was out running on October 6th of 2017, just a year ago as of this writing, as it turns out. I had just turned down the last stretch that would take me from the beach back to my house when a man driving a Ford F-150 blew through a stop sign and hit me, going about 40 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. 
fun and excitement for all ages, that one. This might sound cliche, but I don't remember much of that incident. I remember turning the corner, hearing the screech of the tires on the ground, and a man shouting some choice expletives out his window, and then darkness. My next memory is waking up in the hospital. The consistent but somehow comforting beeping of the monitor told me every second or so that my heart was still beating, and that was good to hear. The steady beep, beep, beep might as well have said, still here, still here, still here. My husband Jeff was next to my bedside, as was my daughter Katie. Both of them looked more than a little relieved that I was alive, and I was more than a little confused as to how I'd gotten here. I tried to ask questions, but my next realization was that there was a tube down my throat. Jeff must have read the fear on my face, because he quickly explained that they would be removing it soon. Apparently, I hadn't been breathing on my own when they first brought me out of surgery. I'll spare you the gory details about the 17 broken bones, the shattered pelvis, the punctured lung, and the bruising that covered 76% of my right side. Suffice it to say, I was in a lot of pain, and at the same time, extremely grateful to be alive. The first few nights of my 13-night stay in the hospital were relatively uneventful. I went in and out of consciousness, my only memories being a few visits with my family and unintelligible muffled whispering by my bedside. After several days, I started to regain a bit more of my awareness, but my physical state was still pretty poor, and they told me that I'd be there a couple of weeks. Being an active person, I was a little annoyed at that, but being a rational person, I knew it was the best course of action. No sense rushing a recovery. That never ends well. Anyway, it was about the fifth night when things started to get weird. I woke up to see an elderly woman standing at the end of my bed. She had torn, tattered clothing, and she looked like she'd just crawled out of the crypt. I mean, this woman had to be 200 years old. Her hair hung in wet clumps, and her nose was the stereotypical witch nose you might read about in old-time fairy tales. And she was drooling, too. Like, a lot. But the weirdest thing of all is that she growled at me. For a second, I didn't think much of it. I figured she was lost. That maybe she was a patient in the psychiatric ward or memory care center. I asked her if she was lost and if I could help her no response. She just turned to face me and stood there, hands hanging at her side, staring a hole in me like she wanted me dead and growling. I looked down at my bed to find the buzzer. I figured I'd call in a nurse and have her escorted back to her room, wherever it was. But as soon as I looked up again, she was gone. I didn't understand how she could have possibly gotten out of my room so fast but I shrugged it off as a strange experience and eventually fell back asleep. The next morning, I asked the nurse if the woman who was in my room had made it back to her room all right. She informed me that there had been no woman in my room last night and no patients had been missing. The entire hospital has security cameras, even in the rooms for liability reasons, just as much as they're there for security reasons, I'm sure. I asked her to please check. She did and she told me that while there was footage of me talking to an empty space, there was exactly nobody at the end of my bed. I was extremely confused, but laughed it off. Jeff told me it was probably just a side effect of all the drugs I'd been given for pain, and that was a reasonable enough explanation for me. So I let it go. But she came again the next night. This time, she shuffled with bare feet to the end of my bed and grasped the rails at the foot of it still growling, still drooling. She stood there, holding the rails along the footboard of the hospital bed for some time, staring at me with her black eyes. And then she shook the bed and screamed at me. I told her to leave me alone, and she disappeared. She didn't leave, she flat disappeared in front of my eyes. I was not asleep 
and this was not a dream. Of that much, I was sure. Again, I tried to explain my story to both the nurses, who listened to this round with a concerned look on their faces, and to my husband, who told me that while he supported me, I might want to avoid telling the nurses these stories if I didn't want to end up in the psych ward. Fair enough. That night, she came again. But this time, she crawled over the footboard of the bed and sat on my lower legs. I screamed and tried to scramble out of her way, but I was so injured that I couldn't move. Again, she disappeared. Jeff told me that he was starting to worry about my mental health. I told him he was a jerk. And after it was made abundantly clear to me that I was on my own, I stopped telling everyone what happened. But it kept happening. And by the time they released me from the hospital, she was crawling halfway up my body and growling at me from less than a foot away. No matter though, I was released. I was going home and hangry hospital hag could stay exactly where she was. But of course, that is not where the story ends. Jeff and I had settled into bed my first night back. I don't remember falling asleep, but I do remember waking up to a shuffling sound, like bare feet on carpeting. Swish, swish, swish. At first, I thought it was Katie, so I called her name, but I got no reply. Swish, swish. It was coming down the hallway and toward our room. I propped myself up on a pillow so I could see better and winced. It was still painful to move. I was greeted by two more swishes. There was a shadow at my doorway now, a shadow too tall to be Katie. I shook Jeff and tried to wake him up, but it did no good. I'm not surprised. That man could sleep through a world war. It was silent for a few moments, but the shadow was still there. And then the shadow stepped inside, but it was no shadow. It was her. In three swift movements, she was on top of me, holding me down, growling into my face just inches away and drooling. I screamed and tried to fight her off. Jeff woke up and threw the lights on, and she was gone. He tried to tell me it was a nightmare. I told him that I was wide awake. He told me I was mentally compromised from the accident. I called him names, and we fell asleep with our backs to each other. Still on my own, I thought. This happened sporadically over the last several months. I'm still seeing her. Every time I do, she gets closer to me and nobody believes me. One night, she drooled onto my forehead, and I showed Jeff. I thought surely he would believe me then, but he told me it was probably my own drool. I asked him when gravity had changed its mind on directionality, and he just told me to stop being hysterical and go to sleep. For about a week after that, I didn't see her anymore, and I thought perhaps it was finally over. But last night, she came back again, with new tricks. I didn't wake up to the shuffling footsteps. No, I woke up to the growling, and it was right above me. I looked up, and she was on the ceiling, her hair hanging in those ugly matted clumps, drooling and growling like a rabid dog. And in the next second, she was on my chest, holding me down, and sucking the air out of me. I thought I was going to die. I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. So I prayed. As soon as I started praying in my mind, I heard her voice in my head. God can't help you now. Tomorrow, you're mine. It's sundown now. I don't know what's going to happen to me tonight. Worse than wondering what that kind of death will be like, is wondering what happens to me after I die. If she takes me, will I go to hell? Or worse, will I become like her? If you have the time, pray for me tonight. And if you hear shuffling in your hallway or growling in the corner of your room, 
pray it's not her. Or me. When I was about 12 years old, I ventured into the woods of Maine near the Appalachian Trail to debunk a local tale. Rumor had it that in a cabin in the woods lived a man named Jack. Everyone called him Cruel Jack because the legend said that he would kidnap any children who came near his cabin, drag them inside, muffle their screams, and slit their throats. Apparently, there were even some folks who said they had evidence. Little bones found in the woods, just big and small enough to belong to a child. The legend also told about two kids named Billy and Rob, who had ventured off into the woods to find Cruel Jack's cabin, and they never came back. Their bodies were found in the woods a week later. The bones were gone, and the flesh remained like some kind of skin shell discarded by whatever, or whoever, had eaten them. No animal eats like that. At least, that's what one of my friends told me. I said if there was a cabin in the woods, and there was an old man named Jack who lived there, he probably didn't have the strength to hurt anyone, even a child, because he'd have to be like a hundred years old. Ninety-seven, she corrected me. I shrugged. I didn't believe this crap, and soon enough I had a mind to prove that Cruel Jack didn't exist, or that if he did, he was just an old guy living in a crooked, worn-down cabin who yelled at kids from his window, the forest version of Get Off My Lawn. Rumor also had it that he had tamed a panther who guarded his cabin and helped subdue children. Ridiculous. I headed out at about 7 p.m., just when it got dark. I'd say that I snuck out of my house, but it really wasn't all that dramatic. My parents were gone on holiday, and my babysitter cared about as much for rules as I did. So when I walked out the door at 7 o'clock, she did nothing more than nod. That would be the last night she babysat us, but that's another story. I headed off into the woods, toward the place where the cabin was supposed to be. I knew that part of the woods like the back of my hand. It just hadn't gone quite as far as the cabin was said to have been. So the first part of the trip went pretty fast. It took me about a half hour to find the place where the cabin was supposed to be, but I didn't see anything. I thought I'd go just a little bit farther and turn back if nothing was there. But something was there. A cabin. One that appeared to be slightly off-centered and drooping, just like the legend said. Honestly, I was shocked. A light glowed from the two windows on the side of the cabin. I knew from stories that it was basically a one-room cabin, and somebody was awake. I snuck up close, hiding behind tree trunks as I went, and finally I got up to the main cabin. I just wanted a peek inside. That was it. Even though I'd found a cabin, I still didn't believe in the legend of Cruel Jack. All I wanted to do was look inside, prove that it was just some family or old lady hunched in a rocking chair, and go home. But that was not how the night would play out. I reached the cabin and flattened my back against the wall, crouching under the window. Just one peek and I'd be home free, and I would have settled this thing forever. I was about to raise up and look inside when I heard a growl. Not like a dog, but like a cat. A big one. Something like... Oh, crap. Sheba. An old, angry voice came from inside. Who is it? I slowly turned my head to the side and was met with the glowing yellow eyes of a giant black panther. As an aside, if you ever do find yourself in the position to train a wild panther, Sheba is arguably a great name. 
Shiba and I stared at each other, and she bared her teeth. But honestly, at that point, I was more terrified of the person who owned the voice than the big cat. At least death by Hungry Panther would be fast. But if Cruel Jack was real... I didn't have time to ponder the thought for long, because a tall old man, wearing a hat, burst out of the cabin, the door smacking into the wall so hard it sprang back to a nearly closed position, and if the old man hadn't been there to block its path, it might have shut on itself. But the old man was there, and as I, crouched against the wall, a giant panther growling in my face, looked up at this tall man with a beard that almost reached his belly button, I began to cry. I'm sorry, sir, I said. I'm so sorry, I just... He shushed me and looked around the woods with big, wild eyes. Sheba growled, and he looked at her. Back, girl. The panther looked at me with a very human, well, aren't you lucky, kind of look, and sighed, slinking off to lay down just at the end of the cabin. I relaxed just a little. I was about to ask what he was looking for when the old man's eyes got wider than I thought any human eyes should be able to get. Get in here and keep your mouth shut, he said. No, I shouted. I'm sorry, mister. I'm really, really so... I didn't get to finish that sentence because in a swift movement, he had me clutched in his arms, one hand over my mouth and one hand under my arms. He dragged me inside the cabin, shut the lights off, and plastered his back against the wall nearest one of the windows. I struggled and kicked and tried to scream. Shut up, he hissed. I'm not going to hurt you, but there's something coming this way that'll kill us all, so shut your mouth, do you hear? I tried to process what he'd just said and nodded. Calmed down a little bit, and he let go of my mouth. I thought you were going to slit my throat, I whispered. He raised a bushy eyebrow. You don't stop screaming, maybe I will. My eyes widened, and he winked, but then looked out the window with a renewed sense of fear. Listen, he said in a raspy whisper. And then I heard it. Boom. 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 If you've ever seen Jurassic Park, you know the sound that the T-Rex makes when it's approaching? That's what it sounded like, but multiplied by a hundred. I looked up at the old man. He nodded. Sheba scares it, but that ain't enough to make us safe, so put your back against the wall, close your eyes, and I'll tell you when you can open them, all right? I nodded. I wouldn't say I trusted this guy, but he was a lot smaller than whatever was coming our way, so I did as he said. I put my back against the wall, bit my lip, and closed my eyes. The thunderous noise got closer and closer. The ground shook under my feet just slightly, and soon it shook so hard I thought I might fall over. And then it stopped. I thought maybe it was over. But as soon as I was readying myself to ask the old man if we were safe, I heard the loudest, shrillest screech I've ever heard in my life. It was like the voices of a thousand demons and dying creatures, all combined into a single discordant shriek. It was the sound of hell itself. Against my better judgment, I opened my eyes and immediately regretted my decision. Whatever this thing was, I could only see its foot through the window. More accurately, its hoof. Silently, the old man ushered me farther into the corner, and I didn't have to be told twice. And as I got to the corner, I kicked a pan laying on the ground. My eyes got big, and the old man crossed himself. He didn't strike me as the religious type, but I figured it was out of desperation, which made me even more afraid, because he didn't seem like the desperate type either. I mouthed, sorry, and he just shook his head 
and put a finger to his lips. I nodded. This thing bent down and looked in the window. It was like a demonic deer with a giant skull and antlers coming out of it. Its eyes, or where there should have been eyes, were glowing red balls of light. It screamed right at the window and shattered the glass. It tried to stick its head inside, but it was too big. At first, I thought we were safe, but then it moved over to the door. Bust the door down and snuffed and huffed. It huffed so hard, the dust on the ground billowed as though a tornado had just come in contact with it. I looked at the old man and he mouthed, don't move. We both stood there, stiff as boards in our positions. The thing kept sniffing, like it was trying to find us, hunt us. Then it bent down, put its eye to the door, and looked straight at the old man and I. I was sure we were both dead. But in what felt like an instant, the thing had its head pulled back and was trampling off into the woods nearly causing an earthquake as it went. Curiosity got the better of me, and I ran to the door and opened it. Well, I moved it aside. This thing was taller than the trees. I turned around to see what could have scared it off, and there was Sheba, looking at me with a smug look of contempt, as though she was almost annoyed that she had had to save the likes of me. Good kitty, I whispered. I swear to this day that thing rolled its eyes at me. The old man came out of the house and extended a hand. I don't believe we've been properly introduced, he said. I'm Jack. Before I could even stop myself, I said, Cruel Jack? He laughed a big Santa Claus-like laugh. <laughs> I suppose that's what they call me, yes. Cruel Jack. I shook his hand. What the heck was that thing? That thing is a demon. Most people don't think it exists no more, but it was conjured by black magic centuries ago, and I reckon it'll be here long after both of us are gone. I looked at Sheba. How is it that a panther can scare a demon? I asked. He nodded. A good question, but Sheba ain't no panther. She's a creature of magic too but it's good magic. I raised an eyebrow. He sighed. A long time ago, I set up camp here and intended to build this here shack. I was approached by a witch of sorts. A good one, not the scary ones you kids all dress up like on Halloween. He rolled his eyes. She told me if I built here, I'd have to protect the land and the locals who came this way. And I tried. God knows I tried, but my abilities couldn't do much to thwart this thing. Kids started going missing. Before long, I became Cruel Jack. Funny thing is, though, that reputation kept you kids safe. Until some of you started getting curious. Sheba settled down next to Jack, as though listening to the tale. The witch came back and gave me Sheba. Said she was trained and was magical given a power of protection that would scare off the demon and protect people who pass through by scaring them away. If I hadn't seen the demon myself, I would have thought all this was bull, but he had to be telling the truth. But you're not mean. All the kids said you'd slit my throat and eat me. He laughed. And you still came? I shrugged. Well, I didn't think it was true. I didn't even think this place existed, so when I saw it, I... I just... I had to know. He winked. Curiosity is good. It'll lead you into danger more times than not, but it's good. Keep it. I nodded. Get on home now, he said. I have a door to fix. But listen, if you speak of this, you tell everyone that I tried to kill you and you narrowly escaped. I crossed my arms. Why would I do that? I asked. Because if they stay away, 
they stay safe. I ain't worried about no reputation of my own. I'll be the cruelest Jack you ever seen if it means you kids stay safe. Understand? I nodded. Thanks for saving my life, I said. He just nodded, looked into the forest toward the direction that the demon had run, and went back inside. It's been 20 years since that day, and old Jack passed away about five years ago. When I heard through the grapevine of people that I officially don't know and never talk to, I wasn't too worried because I knew that Sheba was there. But then I heard about a panther that they found in the wilderness, dead. It was all over the news. They couldn't figure out why a panther would be there. But I knew, and I knew what was coming next. Since then, I've heard there's been a streak of missing kids in the woods, hikers too. If you're a resident of Maine or passing through that area of the Appalachian Trail, you should be warned that this thing is still out there. Sheba's gone, and cruel Jack can't protect you anymore. Billy and I were best friends for all of my childhood, and we'd probably still be friends if the events of this story hadn't transpired. We lived in a rural area of Georgia. The summers were hot and sweltering, and we'd cool off by heading down to the creek and jumping in. Neither of our families were very rich, but it was a simple life that I enjoyed. Would have been an idyllic sense of perpetual childhood bliss if Jackson and Doug hadn't come into the mix. But just like every southern town needs a church, every neighborhood needs a bully, I suppose. And Jackson and Doug had perfected the art of bullying. Billy wasn't a big kid. He was pretty scrawny, in fact, and I was a preacher's daughter. So you can imagine that both of us had found ourselves at the receiving end of some teasing but Jackson and Doug didn't care much for teasing. That was too simple for them. Jackson and Doug liked to torment, and they did so on a regular basis. Fortunately for us, but unfortunately for the Millers family, the bullying duo had taken an interest in making the lives of Cindy and Jeb Miller as miserable as possible. Which, although we liked the Millers, meant that at the very least, Billy and I were out of the line of fire for a time. Looking back on it, maybe we should have done something more. But we were young and scared and trying to stay out of trouble. So we generally hid and tried to lay low. It worked for a bit until Jackson and Doug found Billy and I down by the creek one afternoon. They came down and started their usual round of taunts. We ignored them. They accused us of doing filthy things down there at the creek and we told them to go to the gutter where their minds were and leave us alone, to no avail. Most of the time, Jackson would lead the charge and Doug would pretty much do what he said. It usually involved shoving us around, threatening us if we told, making sure we knew just how degenerate we really were, and leaving. But apparently on this particular day, they were looking for a fight because after their usual torment was over, they didn't leave. Jackson looked up at the bridge that hovered about four feet above the creek. I say creek, but it was really more of a small river. It was deep enough to jump into from the bank and wide enough to avoid crossing if the water was too high or a storm was happening. But we called it the creek, so that's what I'm calling it now. Anyway, Jackson taunted poor Billy up onto that bridge and told him that he should jump off. Billy refused profusely and said he would do no such thing. Jackson kept up the pressure. I told Billy he didn't have to do it, that it was stupid. Jackson slapped me clean across the face and my nose started bleeding a little. And that's when Billy got real mad. He was a quiet, gentle kid, until you messed with one of his friends. And me, being his best friend and a girl, well, gentleman in the making, Billy couldn't stand for that. He shoved Jackson. 
I mean, he tried anyway. But Jackson was a big kid, and when I was young, I used to think God himself couldn't move that boy if he didn't want to be moved. But even though Billy didn't hurt Jackson, Jackson was not the type to be pushed around or made a fool of. So he shoved Billy to the ground and started tearing off his overalls, so he was just in his swim trunks. I screamed and tried to help, but Doug grabbed me and held me so tightly my bones hurt. He covered my mouth, and I bit him. And he threw me to the ground and told me if I moved, he'd kill me. And you know what? I believed him. They forced Billy, in nothing but his swim trunks, up onto the edge of that bridge, and told him to jump. It's too shallow, he said. And it was, too. Jackson told him he was a chicken. Billy shot back that he wasn't a chicken, he just had a brain and knew when it wasn't a good idea to jump into the creek. Which, when we're talking about jumping from a four-foot bridge, it was never a good idea. It just wasn't deep enough. Jackson made rooster noises and Doug followed suit. I was crying, and every time I tried to get up to take Billy's hand and to pull him off that bridge, Doug would shove me back to the ground and tell me to shut up. So, I was crumpled in a helpless mess on the bridge when Billy finally decided that enough was enough. He turned to Jackson and said, This is stupid. I don't have to do anything like this just because you think it'd be fun. Move aside. We're going home. Relief flooded over me. I had just about stood up again when Jackson grabbed Billy by the shoulders. Doug shoved me down to the ground and Jackson said, What do you say, Doug? Let's see if chickens can fly. The next part happened so fast I barely remember it. I saw Jackson shove Billy off that bridge. I heard a shallow splash and a thud. I heard Billy scream and then go silent. I must have flown into some kind of blind rage because I remember screaming bloody murder and I started clawing at Jackson and Dave's faces. They must have figured they'd done enough damage because they took off back down toward town. When I got to the creek and managed to pull Billy to the shore, I could tell he was hurt bad. He was bleeding from all over the place, barely conscious, and given that we were just little kids of eight years old, I had no idea what to do. So I screamed. I screamed and I screamed until finally I felt two arms around me. It was the farmer from down the road. He told me to explain what happened and the story poured out of me like a flood. He'd brought his farmhand who was helping load Billy onto their tractor. I didn't even hear that tractor come down the road so loud was I screaming. Anyway. Long story short, Billy lasted only another week or so in the hospital. His spinal cord had been broken in three places. His skull was crushed. He punctured both lungs. It was sad, really. And I was angry. And I still am. What's worse, Jackson and Doug got off with nothing more than a slap on the wrist and their parents, who were very wealthy got a small fine to cover medical and funeral costs. At eight years old, I got my first taste of just how unjust this crooked world can be. Billy didn't fly that day, but I sure do hope God gave him a nice pair of wings when he got to heaven. I know you all wanted a scary story, something about witches or goblins or ghosts or some kind of thing, but I had to tell Billy's story, not just because it deserves to be told, but because it makes a point that we all ought to heed. The point being that villains and monsters aren't always obvious. Most of the time they're not. Case in point, Jackson became the mayor of our town, which I blessedly left about 10 years ago. And Doug, he's a doctor now, treating spinal cord injuries. Irony is cruel. So much of the time we're on the lookout for disembodied phantoms and werewolves in the night. But when it comes to monsters, I think Stephen King has it right. He says, monsters are real, and ghosts are real too. They live inside us, and sometimes they win.
My sister Emily and I moved into the house on Backwood Road in July of 2014. When we moved in, everything in the home seemed run down and empty, hollow and void. I was excited to move in. I thought we could bring life and joy back into the home, but Emily was less enthused. That was until she found an abandoned doll in her bedroom. I thought the doll was super creepy, but she fell in love with it. I figured if it was going to improve her mood about the new house and the move, so be it. Emily was super attached to the doll. At first, I thought it was just normal for a kid her age. She was only nine at the time, and I figured since she hadn't been to school quite yet there, given that we moved in during the summer, the doll would be her friend. I fully expected this infatuation with the doll to fade when we started school, but it didn't. Emily got really reclusive. She didn't have friends, didn't want friends. All she wanted to do was sit in her bedroom and play with the doll, who she named Becky. My parents weren't very happy about Emily's obsession with Becky, and neither was I. The first time I noticed something really bizarre was one day at breakfast. When Emily and I were at breakfast, I asked her a question. She stared at me blankly, and then blinked. But when she blinked, it was like there were hinges on her eyelids, almost like a doll's. I figured I just hadn't slept well and that I was seeing things, so I let it go at that. But the oddities kept happening. Emily was becoming more plastic, almost, and the doll was changing too. Only she was becoming more and more human. One night, I walked past Emily's room and I told her good night. Good night, sister, I heard her say. It was her voice, but she never addressed me as sister. I walked into her room and realized that she was fast asleep in bed. What did you say? I whispered. From the corner behind me, I heard my sister's voice say, you heard me. I whipped around only to find Becky the doll in a rocking chair. And I swear to you, she blinked. My sister had moments of humanness over the next several months, but it never lasted. It was like she was constantly fighting some sort of transformation. When she felt more like a human, the doll was more like a doll, but then it would change and she would seem more like a doll and the doll, well. The first time I saw it walk across the room and climb up onto the bed to sleep with Emily, I knew we had a real problem. That was the night that I had the nightmare. In it, I was sitting in Emily's room with Becky. We were all sitting in a triangular position. All of us had the same outfit on, the same hair color, everything. She's trying to take me, Emily cried. You are me, the doll said. They would fight back and forth, and I would try to interrupt and grab my sister and run. But whenever I did, Becky would attack me. I woke up sweating and crying. This dream happened over and over for nearly three months. Every time I would get out of bed and go check on my sister and, well, for the most part, she seemed okay. Until the last night. The last night that I had this nightmare, I woke up sweating and crying as usual. I immediately ran into my sister's room to see if she was okay. And that's when I screamed. The doll was sitting in the rocking chair, but instead of having brown hair and green eyes like she'd had all along, she had red hair and brown eyes like my sister. I tentatively approached my sister's bed and shook her awake. She sat up. She had brown hair and green eyes. Good morning, sister, she said, but her mouth was hinged. I freaked out and ran to get my parents, 
They couldn't understand what I was saying, but they followed me up the stairs anyway. The doll and my sister looked completely normal. I didn't know how I could explain it. They told me I was just tired and I needed to get more sleep. But I could tell a difference in my sister. It was like by the time I got downstairs and got my parents upstairs, the transformation had completed itself. But the doll looked sad. So one day I got an idea. I stayed home from school, faking sick, and my sister went to school. And when my parents left for work, I went into my sister's bedroom and found the doll. Sis? I asked. No response, of course. Emily? I asked. Then I remembered that Becky had a button on the back of her, so I pressed it. Help me, the doll cried in my sister's voice. I don't know how, I said. I pressed the button again and she said, I'm trapped in here. I promised to find a way to free her and I tried. God knows I tried. I was cautious around my sister who I now knew was just the doll in my sister's body. And I tried to read as much as I could about possessions, ghosts, and all kinds of things. I eventually thought that it wasn't the doll that had traded places with my sister, but some kind of spirit that the doll had been keeping within it. I almost had a plan too. But that was the day that my mom had finally had enough of my sister's infatuation with Becky. She walked into the room, grabbed the doll, and said, I'm sick of this thing. It's taking over your life. My sister's body, now possessed with the spirit the doll had been keeping, said, Be careful with her, mommy. She's breakable. So, so breakable. Good, said my mom. I screamed at her not to break the doll. I begged, I cried but it was too late. My mom shouted at my sister, I'm glad she's breakable. Maybe this'll break your obsession. And before I could do anything about it, she smashed the doll on the ground, its porcelain head breaking apart into a million irreparable pieces. I cried for days. My mom thought it was because the doll had gotten a hold of me too, but of course, it wasn't. It was because now my sister, my real one, was gone. The transformation was complete. The spirit in the doll now had total control over my sister's body. It's been seven years since then. I moved out as soon as I turned 18. I know what my sister really is and that my real sister is dead. Perhaps she really was breakable. Or maybe it just released her spirit, and maybe she's out there, waiting to find a new vessel to inhabit. So if you find a doll somewhere with a kind spirit inside, be kind back to her, because it just might be Emily.